The Jell-O Program, starring Jack Benny with Phil Harris and his orchestra. The orchestra opens a program with Here's Love in Your Eye from Jack's own picture, the big broadcast of 1937. Hang out the welcome sign, strike up the band, Jack Benny's back with us again. Tonight marks the beginning of Jackson and Mary's third year on the air for Jell-O, and they're raring to go. And judging from all the letters we've had, you're raring to listen. So everybody's happy, and lots of the credit for that goes to you, our audience. Because your enthusiastic support of Jell-O makes it possible for us to continue these programs. The makers of Jell-O have asked me to thank you for your encouragement. And they've also asked me, as official Jell-O spokesman, to thank Jack and Mary for all their grand work in the past, and to wish them great good luck on the new series they begin tonight. So let's give six delicious cheers for the one and only genuine Jell-O, and for Jell-O's one and only Jack Benny. Ladies and gentlemen, after four months' vacation, we present to you the man the whole world is waiting to hear. New York, New York. Who's on the air tonight, dear? Jack Benny. Oh, let's go to a movie. Denver, Colorado. Oh, Daddy, let's go see a picture show tonight. Jack Benny is on the air. I want to see Shirley Temple. Glasgow, Indiana. Heather, who's on the radio tonight? Jack Benny. Well, it'll cost me money, but let's go to the movies. So now, ladies and gentlemen, we bring to you the man who has done more for moving pictures than any other comedian, Jack Benny. Oh, so Don, Don, would you mind trying one more town? Uh, which one? Oh, anyone. Say, uh, Waukegan, Illinois. Okay. Waukegan, Illinois. Who's on the air tonight, Mr. Benny? My son, Jack. What a boy. <laughs> oh, then you're not going to the movies tonight. No, I saw the picture. <laughs> uh, do you want me to tune in any other time? No, Don, that's enough. Huh? Well, Jello again. This is Jack Benny, who has just returned from his vacation. And I want to tell you, it's great to be back again. Back with his old gang of mine. You mean me, Jack? I sure do. Let's give Wilson a nice big hand. Yes, sir. <laughs> but no kidding, Don, you look swell. Fit as a bass fiddle. <laughs> I don't know, you're so tan and rugged. Oh, thanks, Jack. You look tan and rugged, too. Uh, where did you so. spend your vacation? Well, Don, <laughs> I worked uh, most of the summer at the Paramount Studio, but I did manage to get a couple of weeks off. So I went to uh, Saratoga Springs to the races. I wasn't very lucky, though. Oh, Saratoga Springs. Oh, yes, I lost an uncle there once. Hmm. Well, I had to put up cash. Oh. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> and then I spent a couple of weeks camping up in the Adirondacks. Oh, that's right. Uh, you told me you were going to do that. Yeah, and by the way, Don, I want to thank you for lending me your shirt. Oh, that's all right. It was swell. I had the only tent with a soft collar. <laughs> 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 I told you that would go over, didn't I? Thing, I like that a lot. Uh, what have you been doing the last few months, Don? <laughs> well, uh, I had your job. I was master of ceremonies on the Jell-O Summer Show. Oh, sure, sure. Uh, you know, Jack, uh, the Jell-O sales increased tremendously. They did, huh? Yes, sir. And, and that means that while I was telling jokes, more people than ever before went out and bought Jell-O. While you were telling jokes. <laughs> well, that's a boost for the product only, you know. Come in. <laughs> Uh, pardon me. Uh, Lewis is my name. I'm a reporter on the Radio Guide. Oh, yes, yes. I'm here to get an interview. Oh, of course. Certainly. Uh, pardon me, Don. Right. Has Kenny Baker arrived yet? Not yet. Uh, thanks. I'll wait. <laughs> hey, you know, uh, I'm uh, Jack Benny. Yes, I know. 
Uh, what were we talking about, Don? Oh, you were saying how tan and rugged I look. Oh, yeah, I thought we went further than that. Uh, oh, Don, look who's here. Hello, Don. Hello, Jack. Hello, everybody. Hello, Hello Mary. Hello, Mary. <laughs> Mary, it's good to see you. You're looking great. You haven't changed a bit. You look good, too, Jack. Gee, you're so tan and ragged. <laughs> Mary, it's not ragged. It's rugged. I know, but who can get a laugh? Oh, Mary, always thinking of the program. Well, honey, have you had any fun? Did you have a nice vacation? I did until I had to go to the hospital. Oh, I didn't know that. Oh, I didn't either, Mary. Yeah, and you know, Jack... I had the cutest doctor you ever met. Yeah? You ought to see him. Blue eyes and a little mustache. Mm, what a doll. A doll, huh? Yeah. Last week, he took my tonsils out. Gee, am I excited. Why are you excited now? Next week, he's taking me out. <laughs> oh. oh, boy, is he handsome. Yeah, yeah. Say, Jack. What? How do you get more tonsils? You can't get any more. I wish I had something else I didn't need. <laughs> Mary, cut it out, will you? Uh, pardon me, has Kenny Baker arrived yet? No, Mr. Lewis, but if there's any information you want, I'm always glad to talk to a reporter. No, thanks, I'll wait. <laughs> Who is that, Jack? Oh, some fellow. Well, Mary, didn't you take a vacation at all last summer? Oh, sure, Jack. I went to Coronado Beach for three weeks. You did, huh? Yeah, and I brought you a little present. Here. Oh, Mary, my, what a pretty seashell. <laughs> My goodness, huh? See, just what I needed. <laughs> well, let's see what it says on it. Oh, souvenir of Coronado Beach. Oh, gee. And you know, Jack, if you put it up to your ear, you can hear music. No kidding, I'll try it. Mary, I don't hear any music. You don't? No. Oh, I forgot to tell you, you got to put your other ear up to a radio. <laughs> Oh, I see. Oh, Jack. Yes, Don? Uh, Phil Harris is here. You haven't forgotten about him, have you? Oh, Phil, of course. Gee, I'm sorry. Ladies and gentlemen, I want you to meet a new addition to our little group, that famous orchestra leader, Phil Harris. <laughs> yes, Phil. Thank you. And thank you, Jack. I want to apologize, Phil, for not introducing you sooner. Oh, that's all right. You know how it is, the opening program and all the nervousness and excitement and that reporter bothering me all the time, you know. <laughs> but Jack, uh, he didn't ask you for an interview. That's what bothers him. <laughs> Does not. Oh, Mary, this is Phil Harris. Phil, this is Mary Livingston. Hello, Mary. I've always wanted to meet you, and I'm very happy that we're going to be together. Oh, thank you. I'll be glad to have dinner with you tonight. <laughs> Mary, he didn't ask you to go to dinner. What a cheap guy. Don't mind her. One thing I want to tell you, Phil, you're going to enjoy being with us. I never interfere with anything. You can always pick out your own music. In fact, you can be your own boss. And not only that, I'll always see that you get the best joke. What joke? The one about being your own boss. Quiet. Well, Phil, how about a little number? Let's hear the new orchestra. Eh? All right, Jack. For the first number, we'll play Bye Bye Baby. Well, uh, pardon me, Mr. Benny. Has Kenny Baker arrived yet? No, but I'll be glad never to... Never mind. I'll wait. Mm. <laughs> Play, Don, or John. Or what's your first name, Phil? Steve. Oh, yes, play, Frank. <laughs> Reporter.
was uh, Bye Bye Baby, played by Phil Harris and his orchestra, with Johnny Green at the piano on another program. <laughs> <laughs> and I want to tell you, Phil, as one musician to another, that excellent music. Thanks, Jack. Say, Phil, you don't mind if I describe you to our listeners, do you? After all, they will be interested. In no, it. but, uh, well, don't build me up too much. I won't. <laughs> 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 you don't know nothing yet. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, folks, in describing Phil, I might say he's tall, rather good-looking, the ladies like him, but still, he's the kind of a guy you can trust with your best girl, if you can trust your best girl. Ah, <laughs> oh, Jack, why don't you quit ribbing? Me? I'm not ribbing you, Phil. I just happened to run across a joke. Well, you're about due. <laughs> First time your orchestra laughed at anything, you know? <laughs> first program. Well, anyway, folks, I said before, Phil is the romantic tri type. <laughs> Thank you, Phil. I, mean, I didn't mean that. Well, that was really, that was really a slip. I didn't mean that. Anyway, uh, Phil is the romantic type. Yes, sir. He's got fire in his eyes, a wave in his hair, a smile on his face. And rhythm on the range. <laughs> Quiet, Irene. Okay, Tim. You know, Jack, mm -hmm. Phil Harris is cute, isn't he? Yeah. He looks just like my doctor. Mary, forget that doctor, will you? Gee, I can't get him off my mind. <gasps> oh, doctor. I wish you'd have stayed home till you came out of the ether. <laughs> I suppose I'm going to hear about that guy all season, huh? Uh, pardon me, are you sure Kenny Baker hasn't arrived yet? No, Mr. Lewis, I know he hasn't. Then you, Mr. Benny, tell me. Do you think radio is here to stay? Yes, sir. Well, I'm not. Goodbye. <laughs> I knew I'd get an interview. <clears throat> Say, Don. Yes, Jack? Uh, open the closet and let Kenny out. Okay. Here he is. <laughs> Hiya, Kenny. Hello. Oh, Kenny, you're not sore because I locked you in the closet, are you? No, but you didn't have to hang me on a hook. <laughs> well, I'm always neat. <laughs> hey, I was saving you for that big entrance. You heard that applause, didn't you? Oh, sure. Thanks, Jack. Certainly. Hello, Kenny. Hello, Mary. Hiya, Don. Hello, Kenny. Say, Kenny, have you noticed uh, Don's put on a lot of weight? Yeah, he looks so ton and rugged. <laughs> I think we've carried that joke far enough. And, Kenny, I want you to shake hands with our new orchestra leader, Mr. Harris. Glad to know you, Kenny. Gee, it's a Phil. <laughs> I knew he was going to say that. And why didn't you stop him? Oh, I took your line. I'm sorry, man. Well, tell me, uh... <laughs> tell me, Kenny... <laughs> tell me, Kenny, what kind of a vacation did you have? <laughs> huh? Huh? Oh, pretty fair. It was all right, I guess. Uh, where were you? Well, I spent two months in Catalina, four weeks in New York... And a half hour in the closet. Well, it wasn't his fault. Boy, is he dumb. He is not. He is, too. He didn't even notice I had my tonsils out. <laughs> yeah, go ahead, Mary. Why don't you tell him about that doctor you're so crazy about? He's crazy about me, too. Yeah. Well, Kenny, it's been a long time since we heard you sing. How about a little number right now? All right, Jack. I'll sing The Way You Look Tonight. Oh, your voice is better than that, Kenny, huh? <laughs> Uh, <laughs> hey, I didn't think that was going to go over that big, did it? Well, uh, go ahead. Oh, the phone. Wait a minute. Hello? Yes? Oh, it's for you, Mary. Uh, hello? Yes? Oh, hello, doctor. It's my doctor, Jack. All right, stop trembling. <laughs> How are my tonsils? <laughs> That's good. <laughs> hmm. What's that? You have... Well, I've been thinking of you, too. I wish she'd leave her romance out of this program. Shh. What? <laughs> oh, doctor. No. No, doc, you'll have to coax me. No. Mm. No, you'll have to coax me. You'll have to coax me. Fine. Oh, doctor, this oh. is so sudden. What does he want, Mary? A check for the operation. <laughs> Oh. Some nerve. I'm glad I met Phil Harris. Yeah, sing, Kenny. Oh, 
Kenny Baker singing The Way You Look Tonight, written by Jerome Kern for the picture Swing Time. Well, Kenny, your vacation must have done you a lot of good because you're singing better than ever. I mean, your voice has a better quality. It's clearer and sweeter. Thanks, kid. <laughs> kid, well, time marches backward. <laughs> Say, Jack, uh, will you do me a favor? What is it? Hmm? I brought my girl over to our first broadcast, and she's dying to meet you. She just wants to say hello. Oh, I didn't know you had a girl. Sure. I met her this summer over at Catalina. <laughs> Boy, she thinks I'm pretty hot. <laughs> <laughs> Bring her in, Kenny. I'll be glad to meet her. All right. She's kind of dopey, though. <laughs> <laughs> I figured that, yeah. Now bring her in, huh? Come here, honey. I want you to meet Jack Benny. <laughs> oh. <laughs> mm -hmm. Hello. Hello yourself and see how you like it. <laughs> well, well, so you're the little girl from Catalina. Yeah. What's your name? Lena Cat. Oh, <laughs> uh, go on. Who told you to say that? Kenny, ain't he screwy? <laughs> well, Kenny, you sure know how to pick him. You got a nice little girl there. Yes, but she's fickle. She likes Fred McMurray, too. Oh, Fred McMurray, the movie star? Yeah, he's my dream man. She's smarter than I thought she was. Mary. <laughs> so you like uh, Fred McMurray, huh? I'll say. Gee, I'd go to see him even if it wasn't bank night. <laughs> well, I don't blame you. <laughs> oh, Mr. Benny, I hope you don't think I'm too fresh, but, uh, well, um... What is it? Come on, don't be bashful. Would you give me a lock of your hair for a souvenir? <laughs> ah, you are pickled. But isn't that cute, Mary? She wants a lock of my hair. Why don't you give her the whole wig? <laughs> what, and catch a cold? Some other time, Lena. Say, your girl's all right, Kenny. She's talented, too. I wish you could use her on the program sometime. Oh, yeah? What's she got that I haven't got? Tom <laughs> Hey, that's good, you know. Well, Jack, Jack. What is it, Don? Uh, your guest star's just arrived. Oh, did he get here? Gee, I was worried there for a minute. Keep him in the entrance till I introduce him. Okay. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I know that all of you have heard and read about that hazardous transatlantic flight made by Harry Richmond and Dick Merrow, one of the greatest achievements of mechanical skill and human daring the world has ever known. 
This round trip flight was made in exactly 39 hours and 17 minutes. What courage, what stamina to endure the rigors of such a flight. So now, ladies and gentlemen, it is with great honor and distinction that I present to you the man who drove the truck that carried the gas that filled the tank of Harry Richmond's plane. <laughs> None other than Mr. Samuel T. Butchvener. <laughs> Mr. Butchman, I cannot tell you how grateful I am for your appearance on our program this evening. Thank you. Now, how did you feel when you were given this assignment to deliver the gas to Mr. Richmond? Well, I was a little nervous at first, but I knew I could do it. I see. <laughs> well, uh, tell us about your trip. Well, after a light breakfast consisting of a New England boiled dinner, mm -hmm. I took on a big cargo of gasoline. Uh, how much? Oh, just oodles of it. <laughs> Oodles of gasoline, I think. Yes, well, anyway, I swung into my truck and took off at exactly 3.10 a.m. From the gas station? Uh-huh. Oh. <laughs> I made moderate speed through 59th Street until I reached the Queensboro Bridge, and then I let her out. How thrilling. <laughs> From then on, it was smooth driving until I reached Flushing Boulevard. Oh, Flushing, is that that winding street? No, it's a straight flush. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Now, tell me, on your trip to the airport, did you encounter any headwinds? Yes, but it was all right. For buoyancy, I'd filled my truck with 40,000 cannonballs. Hmm. <laughs> now, what kind of a reception did you receive on your arrival at the airport? It was sensational. And what did Mr. Richmond say to you when you delivered the gas? I'll pay you later. I see. <laughs> now, Mr. Bortzman, before I lose my temper entirely... Uh, besides driving a truck, what other notable contribution to aviation have you made? Well, during the World War, I took up flying. Oh, you did, uh? Were you a promising student? Oh, yes. My instructor told me that in no time, I'd make an ace of myself. <laughs> uh, getting back to your journey... Did you have any trouble on your return trip? Yes, I hit a road pocket and was thrown out of my truck into an open manhole. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Mary, what are you laughing at? An ace in the hole. <laughs> okay, now just uh, one more question. Did you make this trip alone? No, I had my assistant driver with me, Mr. Borscht. Well, I, uh, I don't want to appear personal, but there has been a report that you and your co-driver have been on rather unfriendly terms. Especially on this last trip. Is there any truth to that? Definitely no. <laughs> well, I'm glad to hear that. In fact, there's never been any jealous flow. See? I get it. So do I, and thank you. <laughs> Is Mr. Borch here with you? Yes, he's sitting right in the audience. Well, put him on a plate and bring him up. <laughs> uh, Mr. Borch, will you come up here, please? Um, I wish I had known this sooner. So you also made this trip, huh? Yes, sir. <laughs> Well, tell me, when you get behind the wheel of a truck, what road do you like to travel best? You mean my favorite highway? Yes. Oh, Jack, give me the road, the white winding highway. Then let me know the unbeaten byway and I'll travel along.
baby sings and the motion picture of the same name. And now, ladies and gentlemen, our first program is nearly over, and I'd like to announce our feature attraction for next Sunday night. Most of you have read that outstanding novel by Hervey Allen called Anthony Adverse. Mm -hmm. And many of you have already seen Warner Brothers' great production. If you haven't, see it this week. Because next Sunday night, we are going to present our version of that famous classic, our own super, gigantic, stupid, uh, stupendous, <laughs> colossal presentation, Anthony Adverse. Don't miss it, folks. Next Sunday night, you'll cheer. Hooray! You'll laugh. <laughs> you'll cry. Hooray! You'll sneeze. Gesundheit. Next Sunday night, folks, when we bring you Anthony Adver Adverse, in addition to the regular newsreel, <laughs> short subject and bank night, bring your own bank. What thrills, what chills, what glamour. What are you talking about? I don't know. Next Sunday night, Anthony Adverse. <laughs> I have a real piece of news for you tonight, grand good news. The makers of Jell-O now present you with a brand new product, Jell-O chocolate pudding, the best tasting chocolate pudding that's ever come your way. It's smoother, it's creamier, it's more chocolatey. Jell-O chocolate pudding has that swell homemade flavor, the same goodness you used to enjoy when your grandmother made chocolate pudding. And Jell-O chocolate pudding is so easy to make, just mix the contents of the package with some milk in the top of your double boiler and let it cook until it becomes thick and satin smooth. Then when the mixture's cooled, pour it into the sherbet glasses and you're ready to surprise your friends and family with a fine, rich, thoroughly delicious chocolate pudding. Each package gives you six servings and sells for the same low price as Jell-O. Ask your grocer for Jell-O chocolate pudding in the morning. Remember the name, Jell-O chocolate pudding. last number of the first program in the third Jell-O series, and we'll be with you again next Sunday night at the same time. Meanwhile, I'd like to announce that the chap who played the part of the truck driver on tonight's program was Benny Baker of Paramount Pictures. <laughs> and Benny, you... Benny, you certainly played the part of that truck driver very, very well. Well, that's what I used to be before I went into pictures. Don't sell your truck. Quiet. <laughs> Mary, isn't he nice looking? Nah, he looks like my doctor. Oh, good night, folks. <laughs> The Jell-O program starring Jack Benny has originated in the NBC studios in Hollywood over the Red Network. This is the national broadcasting company. From the NBC University Theater, a first radio production of the most challenging novel of 1949, George Orwell's 1984. Our star, Mr. David Niven. Here with a disturbing broadcast. A dramatization by Milton Wayne of George Orwell's 1984. In his current and very widely discussed novel, Mr. Orwell has projected the totalitarian techniques abroad in the world today to their terrible extreme. The plight of the individual in this world, we leave you to assess for yourselves as you listen to the story of Mr. Winston Smith, portrayed today by the internationally known British actor David Niven. At intermission, we will bring you a commentary on Mr. Orwell's writing by another distinguished author, Mr. James Hilton. Here, then, is David Niven in George Orwell's 1984. The clocks of London are striking 13 on this cold April day 
You hurry to escape the vile wind. You slip quickly through the glass doors of Victory Mansions, though not quickly enough to prevent a swirl of gritty dust from entering along with you. The hallway smells of boiled cabbage and old rag mats. At one end of it, an enormous colored poster with a man's face more than three feet wide. The face, a ruggedly handsome 45 with a heavy black mustache. Big Brother is watching you. What's that? Oh, no need to jump like that, Mr. Smith. I, I was just reading off what it says on that poster. Oh, of course. It's seven flights up to your flat. It's slow going for you, Winston Smith. Frail and underweight and 39 and tormented by a varicose ulcer above your right ankle. You have to rest several times on the way. On each landing, the poster with the enormous face looks down on you. And the eyes follow you. Big Brother is watching you. Everywhere, from every wall, from every building. Big Brother is watching you. You're in your flat, but you are not alone. You are never alone. Thus, the total production of pig iron is 58,328,912 tons. The voice comes from an oblong metal plaque like a dull mirror which forms part of the surface of the right-hand wall. You turn a switch and the voice sinks somewhat. But there is no way of shutting it off completely. The telescreen receives and transmits simultaneously. So long as you remain in its field of vision, you can be seen as well as heard. And there is no way of knowing when the thought police might plug in on your wire. There is no way of knowing. You move over to the window. War is peace. Freedom is slavery. Ignorance is strength. stand at your window and you look down. You think with a vague distaste. This is London. This, the chief city of Airstrip One. The third most populous of the provinces of Oceania. Was it always like this? Always these rotting houses, their windows patched with cardboard, their roofs with corrugated iron, their crazy garden walls sagging in all directions? Was it always? When I was a child... I can't remember. I can't remember. I never can. You turn quickly from the window, and you go to the table in the small alcove where you are cut off from... from being seen by the telescreen. Quickly, you take the secretly bought notebook, the archaic pen point and holder out of the drawer. What you are about to do can mean death. It's not illegal to keep a diary. Nothing is illegal since there are no more laws. But if the thought police find out, it's death. Or at least 25 years in a forced labor camp. You ink the pen, and you falter for just a second. A tremor goes through you. I must start. I must mark the paper. April 4th, 1984. But how do I know? How can I be certain that that is 1984? No, it must be. I'm fairly sure that I'm 39. I believe I was born in 1944 or 45. But it's never possible nowadays to pin down any date within a year or two. But what difference does it make? How can I speak to the future? If it's like the present, no one will listen. If it's different, how will they understand the things happening now? I mustn't think about it. I must begin now. April 4th. Last night to the flicks, all war films, one of a ship full of refugees being bombed somewhere in the Mediterranean. Audience, much amused by a shot of a helicopter firing at a man swimming away. He was full of holes. The sea around him turned pink. Audience shouting with laughter when he sank. And then you saw a lifeboat full of children with a helicopter over it. You write on, wildly ridding your mind of painful memory. But as you write, another memory comes clear in your mind. It happened during the two minutes hate period at the ministry that very morning. After the chant of loyalty to Big Brother, Winston Smith noticed O'Brien, the big man wearing glasses and the black overalls of the powerful inner party. That morning, O'Brien had turned and his eyes had met Winston's. And Winston knew that O'Brien was thinking the same thing as himself. It was as if O'Brien was saying, I am with you. I know all about your contempt, your hatred, your disgust. But don't worry. 
I'm on your side. Ben O'Brien's face was as inscrutable as everybody else's. But even that was a memorable event in the locked loneliness in which one had to live. Down with Big Brother. Down with Big Brother. I'll fill the page with it or the whole book. Makes no difference now. The thought police will get me just the same. Even if I never put the pen to paper, I have committed thought crime. And for that, they're bound to get you. Sooner or later, but they'll get you. Always during the night, you simply disappear. Your name removed from the registers. Every record of you wiped out. You were abolished, annihilated, vaporized. They'll shoot me in the back. I don't care. Down with Big Brother. They always shoot you in the back of the neck. I don't care. Down with Big Brother. Already? You sit still. Maybe they'll go away. The worst thing would be to delay. You get up and you move heavily toward the door. Oh, comrade. Do you think you could come across and have a look at our kitchen sink? It's got blocked up and... I'll... I'll see what I can do, Mrs. Parsons. I'm sorry to bother you. Of course, it's it's only because Tom isn't home. Amid the clutter of the flat, you notice the banners of the Youth League and the spies on the wall. And a full-size poster of Big Brother. Don't mind the looks of the place. It's the children. They haven't been out today. Have you got a spanner? A spanner? I, I don't know. Perhaps the children... Up with your hands! The tough-looking boy springs at you with a pointed toy automatic pistol. He is dressed in the uniform of the spies. Higher! Get them up higher! Is this high enough? You're a traitor! You're a thought criminal! Freddy, please let Mr. Smith fix the sink. He's a traitor, a thought criminal. Oh, he and his sister are disappointed because they couldn't go to the park to see the hanging of the Eurasian war prisoners. Why can't we go? All the other children are going. Ah, take you next time. Oh, that won't be for another month. There, Mrs. Parsons, I think that does it. Thank you, comrade. Say thank you, Freddy. I will not. He's a traitor. He's a father of Goldstein. You go to the window. Down in the street, the wind flaps a torn poster with the word Ing Sock. You stand watching it. The three sacred principles of Ingsoc. New speak, double think, the mutability of the past. What past? The past is dead. The future is unimaginable. I am alone, lost in a monstrous world. What living human creature is on my side? How do I know that the power of the party won't endure forever? Like an answer, the three slogans on the white face of the Ministry of Truth come back to you. War is peace. Freedom is slavery. England's the strength. The telescreen strikes. You have to leave in ten minutes to be back at your work at 14.30. You see the diary on the table. Who am I writing it for? Only the thought police will read it before they wipe it out of existence and out of memory. But there are things I must say or I can't stay sane. You go back to the table, dip your pen, and write. To the future or to the past. To a time when thought is free, when men are different one from another and do not live alone. To a time when truth exists and what is done cannot be undone. From the age of uniformity, from the age of solitude, from the age of big brother, from the age of double think, greetings. I am already dead, for I am committing thought crime, and thought crime is death. You're just the man I was looking for. Well, what can I do for you, Simon? Tell me, have you got any razor blades? Not one. I've been using the same for six weeks. Keep the line moving. Next, please. Uh, did you go and see the prisoners hanged yesterday? I was working. I'll see it on the flicks, I suppose. A very inadequate substitute. It was a good hanging, Smith. I think it spoils it when they tie their feet together. Next, please. Oh, there's a table over there under the telescreen. Let's pick up a gin on the way. Time, 
how's that dictionary of new speak getting on? Slowly. I'm on the adjectives. It's fascinating. Oh, it's quite a job inventing new words. Oh, that's not our chief job at all. We're destroying words. What sense is there in having a whole string of useless, vague words like excellent and splendid and all the rest of them? Plus good covers the meaning. Or double plus good if you want something stronger still. Don't you see the beauty of that, Winston? It was B.B.'s idea originally, of course. Well, I know that's I'm one of Big Brother's most revolutionary ideas. Oh, it's not just words. In the end, we shall make thought crime impossible because there will be no words in which to express it. Has it ever occurred to you, Winston, that by the year 2050, not a single human will be alive who could understand such a conversation as we're now having? Oh, except the proletarians, of course. Oh, the proletarians are not human beings. Proles and animals are free. The whole literature of the past would have been destroyed. Chaucer, Shakespeare, Milton, Byron, they'll exist only in new speak versions. Then they'll be changed into something different? Even the slogans of the party will change. How can you have a slogan like, freedom is slavery, when the concept of freedom has been abolished? The whole climate of thought will be different. In fact, there will be no thought as we understand it now. Hello, 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 hello. Mind if I sit down? Not at all, uh, Parsons. Uh, by the way, old boy, I hear a little beggar of mine gave you a rough time yesterday. I think he was a little upset at not going to the execution. <laughs> oh, well... Shows the right spirit, doesn't it? Oh, by the way, would you know what that little girl of mine did last Saturday when her troop was in a hike out Berkhamsted Way? She got two other girls to go with her and spent the whole afternoon following a strange man. And then, when they got to Amersham, handed him over to the patrols. What did they do that for? Ah! My kid made sure he was some enemy agent. Well, might have been dropped by parachute. Pretty smart for a nipper of seven, eh? <laughs> what happened to the man? Uh, well, uh, that I couldn't say, of course, but I wouldn't be surprised if he was now an unperson. Oh, good. Of course, we can't afford to take chances. Oh, what I mean to say is, there's a war on. Oh, uh, I suppose you don't have any razor blades you can let me have? Hmm? Not one. Hmm. Just thought I'd ask you, old boy. I'm uh, sorry. Well, it's back to work, old boy. You sit in your flat, listening to the telescreen voice. The diary is open before you, but you're not writing. Once again, you feel the protest in your stomach, in your skin... The feeling that you've been cheated of something that you had a right to. You try, but you can't remember anything different. You turn to writing in your diary. How can I know what used to be? There is the party slogan. Who controls the past controls the future. Who controls the present controls the past. The party can thrust its hand into the past and say of this or that event, it never happened. And this is more terrifying than mere torture and death. The party says... Reject the evidence of your eyes and ears. It is the final, most essential command. Maybe, maybe I'm a lunatic. Perhaps a lunatic is simply a, a minority of one. But the obvious, the silly, the true, has got to be defended. The solid world exists. Stones are hard. Water is wet. Objects unsupported fall towards the Earth's center. Freedom is the freedom to say that two plus two... Make four. If that is granted, all else follows. It's a dangerous thing you're doing now. You've walked for several miles through the proletarian section where the thought police would have many questions to ask if they found you. Now you find yourself inside the junk store where you had bought the diary. I recognized you on the pavement. You're the gentleman that bought the keepsake album. I was passing. I just looked in. I don't want anything in particular, Mr. Charrington. Ah, it's just as well, because I don't suppose I could have satisfied you. Between you and me, the antique trade's just about finished. Now, there's another room upstairs that you might care to see. You lived here at one time? Until my wife died. Now, don't you think this is a quiet, cozy room? There's no telescreen. Uh, I never had one of those things. Now, if you happen to be interested in old prints... Uh, here, sir. The frame's fixed to the wall, but I could unscrew it for you, I dare say. I know that building, Mr. Charrington. It's a ruin now, it's... It's in the middle of the street outside the Palace of Justice. That's right, sir. It was a church at one time. St. Clement's Dane, its name was. Oranges and lemons, say the bells of St. Clement's. What's that? Oh, uh, that was a rhyme we had when I was a little boy. 
a full 60 years ago. How does it go on? I don't remember, but I do know how it ended up. Here comes a candle to light you to bed. Here comes a chopper to chop off your head. It, it was a kind of dance. And when they came to, uh, here comes a chopper to chop off your head, they brought their arms down and caught you. It was just the names of churches. All the London churches were in it. All the principal ones, that is. I never knew it had been a church. Oh, there's lots of them left, really. Though they've been put to other uses. How did the rhyme go? Ah, I've got it. You owe me three farthings, say the bells of St. Martin's. There now. That's as far as I can get. A farthing. That was a small copper coin. Looked something like a cent. Where was St. Martin's? Mm. That's still standing in Victoria Square. It's the building where they have the models of the rock bonnets and the floating fortresses and, and the pictures of enemy atrocities. St. Martin's in the fields, it used to be called. You leave, Mr. Charrington. You should never have come back here without knowing if the old man could be trusted. You start down the street. You'll come back to buy the engraving of St. Clement's Dane and carry it home, hidden under the jacket of your overalls. And you'll even drag the rest of the poem out of Mr. Charrington's memory. Oranges and lemons, say the bells of St. Clement. You owe me three farthings, say the... Suddenly, your heart turns to ice. A figure in blue overalls is coming toward you. A dark-haired girl in her twenties... The narrow scarlet sash of the junior anti-sex league is wound around her waist. You know her, but you've never spoken to her. She looks straight into your face, and then walks on quickly as though she hadn't seen you. For a few seconds, you're, you're too paralyzed to move. Then you turn and walk heavily away. It's at night they come for you. Always at night. The proper thing is to kill yourself before they get you. And they'll get you. Once you've succumbed to thought crime, you're dead. From Hollywood, the NBC University Theater is bringing you David Niven in a radio version of George Orwell's 1984. And now, our intermission commentator, the distinguished author, Mr. James Hilton. George Orwell is a distinguished English writer who is desperately concerned, as many others of us are today, with the shape of things to come. And he is also aware that such earlier prophecies as those of Mr. Wells and Mr. Aldous Huxley were not so much incorrect as incomplete, and are now in need of restatement and revision before a modern audience. Thus, Mr. Wells forecasts the engulfment of modern civilization in total war. But war, says Mr. Orwell, is not all, nor is it quite the worst imaginable thing. And as long ago as 1932, Mr. Huxley satirized the regimented state in his book called Brave New World. But some people in those days probably missed the satire and thought that with all its mass production techniques and scientific management, Mr. Huxley's new world might even be worth looking forward to. But today, no one is so naive as that. Indeed, the crisis of our civilization is in some danger of becoming a cliché for after-dinner speakers. Mr. Orwell, however, is the first writer to warn us in the form of fictional satire what might conceivably happen if all the worst features that exist anywhere in our modern world were to prevail over all the others, and if, in addition, all these worst features were to spread all over the earth. Since the story is told with nightmarish detail and inexorable logic, the commentator can perhaps serve best by a few mild warnings of his own. First, that despite any easy assumptions that might readily and even excusably occur to both listener and reader, Mr. Orwell's satire does not bear exclusively against any one country. Certain early symptoms of that breakdown of the human soul which he forecasts are diagnosable in all countries today. And most of us also, to a greater or less extent, are already victims of certain types of doublethink. And it would be a useful private exercise to examine near home for such instances as well as to recognize them more spectacularly in other parts of the world. Personally, I find Mr. Orwell's picture horrible and timely and fascinating. 
it will probably take its place among the memorable works of its kind, both for its technical virtuosity and for a sort of intellectual passion that pervades it throughout. Mr. Orwell is, as we say, burned up about the state of the world, but the fuel of that fire is not only in the world but in his own mind. This is what makes the satirist at all times and in all ages, and it's why, having read Mr. Orwell's 1984, you may not feel you'd like to meet any of its characters, but you do feel you'd like to meet Mr. Orwell, if only for an argument. Outside of literature, however, it might be said that 1984 suffers from a philosophic flaw inherent in all such prophetic fiction. It does not allow for the fact that history is not an exact science, perhaps not even a science at all, and that any equation of the future is bound to contain many variables. And yet, with all the reservations some of us might make, this book that Mr. Orwell has written deserves our serious attention. It is not a likable story, and one may hope and even believe that it is not a likely story either. But when we think of all that has happened throughout the world during our own lifetimes, it does not seem quite an impossible story. Thank you, Mr. Hilton. It's the middle of the morning, and you've left the work cubicle to go to the lavatory. A solitary figure comes toward you from the other end of the long, brightly lit corridor. It's the girl with the dark hair. Four days ago, you ran into her outside the junk shop. She's about ten feet from you. Oh, are you hurt? Nothing. My arm, I'll be all right in a second. You haven't broken anything? No, no, I'm all right. It just hurt for a moment, that's all. Here, let me help you up. Thanks. I'll be all right. I only gave my wrist a bit of a bang. Thanks, comrade. She walks off briskly. While you were helping her up, she slipped something into your hand. A scrap of paper folded into a square. You will open it when you are away from the telescreens in the corridor and in the lavatory. Whatever's on the paper, it must have some kind of political meaning. She's an agent of the Thought Police. They have reasons for the message. Maybe a threat, a summons, an order to commit suicide, a trap. Maybe not that at all. Maybe a note from an underground organization. Perhaps the Brotherhood exists after all. No, absurd. The message means only one thing. Dead. Ten minutes later, in your cubicle, you open it. In a large, unformed handwriting... I love you. It's hard to conceal your agitation from the telescreen. I've got to get in touch with her. Arrange a meeting somewhere. But I don't know her name or where she lives. I can't follow her home. That would mean loitering outside the ministry, bound to be noticed. There, there's one place. The canteen. At a table by herself, not too near the telescreen. With a chatter of conversation all around. For only 30 seconds. For only a few words. A week goes by. At last it happens. You both sit eating the watery stew. You continue eating and you don't look up. What time do you leave work? 18.30. Where can we meet? Victory Square. Near the monument full of telescreens. It doesn't matter if there's a crowd. Any signal? No. Don't come up until you see me among a lot of people. And don't look at me. Just keep somewhere near me. What time? Nineteen hours. All right. Paddington Station. Take train 14 to Fenchurch. Turn left outside the station and you'll come to a gate with a top bar missing. Go across that field to a track between bushes. Stay on that until you come to a dead tree with moss on it. Can you remember that? Yes. You turn left, then right, then left again, and the gate's got no top bar. Yes, what time? About 15. You may have to wait. I'll get there by another way. Are you sure you remember everything? Yes. Then get away from me as quick as you can. Here we are. I do 
didn't want to say anything in the lane in case there was a mic hidden there. We're all right here, though. I didn't meet any patrols. I watched for them all the way from the station. Oh, we're safe here. What are you grinning at? <laughs> Would you believe that till this moment, I didn't know the color of your eyes. Now that you've seen what I'm really like, can you still bear to look at me? Mm, yes, easily. I'm 39 years old. I've got a wife I can't get rid of. I've got varicose veins and I've got five false teeth. I couldn't care less. <laughs> darling. Oh, darling. Precious. Oh, my dearest, dearest love. Oh, we've got the whole afternoon. Isn't this... What's your name? Julia. I know yours. It's Winston. Winston Smith. How did you find that out? <laughs> I expect I'm better at finding out things than you are, dear. Tell me, what did you think of me before that day I gave you the note? I hated the sight of you. I wanted to hurt you, murder you. If you really want to know, I imagine that you had something to do with the thought police. Oh, no. Not the thought police. Well, perhaps not exactly that, but from your general appearance, merely because you're young and fresh and healthy, I thought that probably... You thought I was a good party member. And you also thought that if I had a quarter of a chance, I'd denounce you as a thought criminal and get you killed off. Yes, something of that kind. Well, a great many young girls are like that, you know. It's bloody sash that does it. Wait, I'll rip the thing off. There. Have a piece of chocolate. Where did you get this? Black market. You're very young. Ten years younger than I am. What could attract you in a man like me? As soon as I saw you, I knew you were against them. Against the party. Against the bloody rotten swine in the inner party. Julia, listen. I'm against the purity the party preaches and the goodness. I don't want any virtue to exist anywhere. I want everyone to be corrupt to the bones. Well, then, I ought to suit you, dear. I'm corrupt to the very bones. You never go back to the clearing in the wood. You and Julia can meet only in the streets in a different place every evening, and never for more than a half hour at a time. You don't even discuss the possibility of getting married. No committee would sanction it, even if Catherine could somehow be gotten rid of. It's hopeless, even as a daydream. What was she like, your wife? She was, uh, you know, the newspeak word, good, thinkful, meaning naturally orthodox, incapable of thinking of bad thoughts. I know the kind of person right enough. Everything is always... Our duty to the party. How do you know that? I've been at school too, dear. Why didn't you shove her off the cliff? I would have. Perhaps if I'd been the same person I am now. Are you sorry you didn't? Yes. Uh, Are you sorry you didn't? Yes. On the whole, I'm sorry I didn't. But it doesn't really matter. In this game we're playing, we can't win. We are the dead. We're not dead yet. Not physically. Six months, a year, five years conceivably. I'm afraid of death. You're young, so you're more afraid of it. We put it off as long as we can, but it makes very little difference. Oh, rubbish. Don't you enjoy being alive? Look, darling. I'm real. I'm solid. Alive. Don't you like that? Yes, I <laughs> like that. Stop talking about dying, then. Where shall we meet next time? Julia, I've rented the room for Mr. Charrington. Sooner or later we'll be caught. I know. It's madness. Yes. Wait for me there. Day after tomorrow. Wait. Just let me show you what I've brought. Look here. Go on. Go on, open it. Sugar. Real, not saccharine. And here, a loaf of white bread. But look, this is the one I'm really proud of. Coffee. <laughs> real coffee. <laughs> There's a whole kilo here. Well, how'd you manage to get hold of all these things? Oh, it's all in a party stuff. And look, I've got a little packet of tea, too. Real tea. Not blackberry leaves. Been a lot of tea about lately. They captured India or something. But listen, dear, I want you to turn your back on me for a bit. And don't turn around till I tell you. You can turn around now. 
Well? Beautiful. I've never seen a woman of the party with cosmetics on her face. And scent, too. Yes, dear. And scent, too. And do you know what I'm going to do next? I'm going to get hold of a real woman's frock and silk stockings and high heels. Oh, darling, in this room, I'm going to be a woman. Not a party comrade. A woman. I'll make some coffee in another moment. We've still got an hour. What time do they cut the lights off at your flats? 23, 30. It's 23 at the hostel. Hi! Get out of there, you filthy brute! What was it? A rat. I saw his beastly nose. Oh, there's a hole down there. Rats? In this room? Ah, oh, they're all over. Some parts of London are just swarming with them. A woman daren't leave a baby alone for two minutes. It's the great huge brown ones that do it, and the brutes always Don't come Don't go on! Darling, what's the matter? Oh, of all the horrors in the world, a rat! Oh, no, darling, no. Now, don't worry. We're not going to have the filthy brutes in here. I'll stuff the hole before we go. Oh, come on. Help me make the coffee. Darling, I've been meaning to ask you. That picture over there on the wall, would that be about 100 years old? More. 200, I dare say. One can't tell. It's impossible to discover the age of anything nowadays. What is that place? I've seen it before somewhere. It's a church, or at least it used to be. St. Clement's Dane, its name was. Oranges and lemons, oh. say the bells of St. Clement's. You owe me three farthings, say the bells of St. Martin's. Oh, I can't remember how it goes after that. But anyway, I remember it ends up. Here comes a candle to light you to bed. Here comes a chopper to chop off your head. <laughs> Who taught you that? <laughs> My grandfather. He was vaporized when I was eight. I wonder what a lemon was. Oh, I can remember lemons. They were quite common in the 50s. They were so sour, it set your teeth on edge even to smell them. <laughs> oh, dear. I suppose it's almost time we were leaving. I should start washing this paint off. I'll get the lipstick off your face afterwards. It happens at last. The expected message comes. We're walking down the long corridor of the ministry. <clears throat> you turn around. It's O'Brien. I was reading one of your Newspeak articles the other day. You take a scholarly interest in Newspeak, I believe. Well, hardly scholarly. I'm only an amateur. I've never had anything to do with the construction of the language. But you write it very elegantly. Have you seen the 10th edition of the Newspeak Dictionary? No, I didn't think it had been issued yet. A few advanced copies have been circulated. I have one myself. It might interest you to uh, look at it, perhaps. Yes, very much so. Some of the new developments are most ingenious. Let me see. Uh, perhaps you could pick it up uh, at my flat sometime that suited you. Uh, wait. Let me give you my address. <laughs> Julia, darling, it was like a message, as if O'Brien was saying, if you ever want to see me, this is where I can be found. But he's an important member of the Inham Party, dear. If it's a trap... Darling, this is part of something that happened years ago. First, it was a secret involuntary thought. Then I started a diary. I'd moved from thoughts to words. And now, from words to action. Where will it end? In the Ministry of Love. I've accepted that. The end was contained in the beginning. Has it ever occurred to you that the best thing for us to do would be simply to walk out of here before it's too late and never see each other again? Yes, dear. It's occurred to me several times. But I'm not going to do it all the same. We've been lucky. It can't last much longer. What you do, I'm going to do. We may be together for another six months, a year. There's no knowing. At the end, we're certain to be apart. Do you realize how utterly alone we shall be? When once they get hold of us, there's nothing... Nothing either of us can do for the other. If I confess, they'll shoot you. If I don't, they'll shoot you just the same. Neither of us will even know whether the other is alive or dead. The one thing that matters is that we shouldn't betray one another. Although, even that can't make the slightest difference. Everybody always confesses. You can't help it. They torture you. Well, I don't mean confessing. Confession is not betrayal. What you say or do doesn't matter. Only feelings matter. If they could mean you... That would be the real betrayal. They can't do that. 
They can make you say anything, anything, but they can't make you believe it. They can't get inside of you. No, that's quite true. They can't get inside you. If you can feel that staying human is worthwhile, even when it can't have any result whatever, then you've beaten them. Darling, whenever it is you go to O'Brien, I'm going with you. You can turn it off. Yes, Winston. We have that privilege. Well, uh, shall I say it or will you? I'll say it. That thing is really turned off? Yes. Everything is turned off. We're alone. All right. We have come here because we believe that there is some kind of secret conspiracy, some kind of secret organization working against the party and that you are involved in it. We want to join it and work for it. We are enemies of the party. We disbelieve in the principles of Ingsoc. We are thought criminals. We are also adulterers. I tell you this because we want to put ourselves at your mercy. Yes. First, let us all take a drink. I think it's fitting that we should begin by drinking a health. To our leader. To Emmanuel Goldstein. Then there is such a person as Goldstein. Yes, and he's alive. Where, I don't know. And the conspiracy, the organization, it is real? It's not simply an invention of the thought police? No, it's real. The Brotherhood, we call it. You'll never know much more about it than that it exists and that you belong to it. I'll come back to that presently. Now to the matter. What are you prepared to do? Anything we are capable of. You are prepared to give your lives? Yes. To commit murder? Yes. To commit acts of sabotage which may cost the death of hundreds of innocent people? Yes. To cheat? To forge, to blackmail, to corrupt the minds of children, to distribute habit-forming drugs, to do anything which is likely to weaken the power of the party? Yes. You are prepared to commit suicide if and when we order it? Yes. You are prepared, the two of you, to separate and never see one another again? No. No. You did well to tell me. You understand that you'll be fighting in the dark. Later, I shall send you a book from which you will learn the true nature of the society we live in. And the strategy by which we shall destroy it. We are the dead. Our only true life is in the future. Do you carry a briefcase to work? As a rule, yes. What is it like? Oh, black, very shabby, two straps. Good. One day soon in the street, a man will touch you on the arm and say... I think you've dropped your briefcase. The one he gives you will contain a copy of Goldstein's book. You'll return it within 14 days. Mm, uh, You must leave in a couple of minutes. We shall meet again. If we do meet again. In the place where there is no darkness? In the place where there is no darkness. In the meantime, is there anything you wish to say before you leave? Any question? Yes. Did you ever hear an old rhyme that begins, Oranges and lemons, say the bells of St. Clement. Yes, Winston. Oranges and lemons, say the bells of St. Clement's. You owe me three farthings, say the bells of St. Martin's. When will you pay me, say the bells of Old Bailey. When I get rich, say the bells of Shoreditch. You knew the last line. Yes, I knew the last line. And now I'm afraid it's time for you to go. I've got the book. We must read it. You two, all members of the Brotherhood, have to read it. You read it aloud. That's the best way. Then you can explain it to me as you go. The new movements which appeared in the middle years of the century, Ingsoc in Oceania, Neo-Bolshevism in Eurasia, death, worship in East Asia, had the conscious aim of perpetuating unfreedom and inequality. The new movements grew out of the old ones. Even the names of the four ministries exhibit an impotence in their deliberate reversal of the facts. The Ministry of Peace concerns itself with war. The Ministry of Truth, with lies. The Ministry of Love, with torture. The Ministry of Plenty, with starvation. These contradictions are not accidental. They are deliberate exercises in double think. For it is only by reconciling contradictions that power... Oh, Oh, 
I'm hungry. Oh, darling, the stove's gone out. And there's no oil. Oh, we can get some from old Charrington, I expect. Oh, gosh, but it's cold in here. Do you remember the thrush that sang to us that first day mm-hmm. at the edge of the wood? He wasn't singing to us. He was just singing. No, not to us. We are the dead. We are the dead. You are the dead! <laughs> you are the dead! Behind the picture. Remain exactly where you are. Make no movement until you are ordered. Now we can see you. Now we can see you. Stand out in the middle of the room. Stand back to back. Clasp your hands behind your head. Do not touch one another. The house is surrounded. I suppose that we may as well say goodbye. You may as well say goodbye. And by the way. On the subject, here comes a candle to light you to bed. Here comes a chopper to chop off your head. You don't know where you are. The windowless cell with white porcelain walls might be in the Ministry of Love. Concealed lamps flooded with a cold light. There's a low, steady humming sound. It is the place where there is no darkness. Smith! 6079, Smith W. Hands out of the pocket in the cell. There is a telescreen on each wall. You started to reach into your overalls for stray breadcrumbs. You haven't eaten since you were arrested. Ampleforth. Smith, you too? What are you in for? There is only one offense, is there not? Crime thought. And you have committed it, apparently. We were producing a definitive edition of Kipling. I allowed the word God to remain at the end of a line. I couldn't help it. The rhyme was Rod. There are only 12 rhymes to Rod in the language. There was no other rhyme. Do you know what time it is? No, I don't. There's no difference between night and day in this place. Don't talk in the cells. Ampleforth, room 101. Time passes. Your hunger grows. Prisoners, men and women, are brought into your cell and are taken out. To room 101. Then the cell door opens once again. O'Brien and a guard come in. You start to your feet. You forget the telescreen. They've got you too. They got me a long time ago. You knew this, Winston. You've always known it. Guard... Oh! With that blow, the nightmare starts, and you confess to anything and everything. The confessions are a formality. The torture is real. And it goes on and on and on and on. Now you're lying strapped to a table can't move. There's a strong light falling in your face. O'Brien is standing at your side. On the other side, a man in a white coat holding a hypodermic syringe. I told you that we met here again. Yes, would Oh! Be. That's only a sample of what I can do by turning this dial. Remember that. If you lie to me, you will cry out of pain instantly. Do you understand that? Yes. I'm taking trouble with you, Winston. Because you are worth trouble. You suffer from a defective memory. Fortunately, it is curable. There's a party slogan dealing with the control of the past. Repeat it, if you please. Who controls the past controls the future. Who controls the present controls the past. Good. Is it your opinion, Winston, that the past has any real existence? No. Then where does the past exist, if at all? In records, it's written down in the mind, in human memories. But we, the party, control all records, and we control all memories. Then we control the past, do we not? But how can you stop people remembering things? How can you control memory? You've not controlled mine. On the contrary, you have not controlled it. That is what has brought you here. Do you remember writing in your diary, freedom is the freedom to say that two plus two make four? How many fingers am I holding up, Winston? Four. And if the party says that it's not four, but five, then how many? 
Four. How many fingers, Winston? Four. How many fingers, Winston? Four. Four. What else can I say? Four. How many fingers, Winston? Four. Stop it. Stop it. Four. Four. How many fingers, Winston? Five. 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 You're lying. You still think there are four. How many, please? Four. Five. Four. Anything you like. Stop it. Stop the pain. Stop. <sighs> You're a slow learner, Winston. How can I help it? How can I help seeing what's in front of my eyes? Two and two are four. Sometimes, Winston. Sometimes they are five or three or all of them at once. You must try harder. It's not easy to become sane. It's not easy. It goes on endlessly. The questions, the drugs, the questions, the torture machines. And... Do you know where you are, Winston? I don't know. I can guess. In the Ministry of Love. Do you know how long you've been here? I don't know. I think it's months. And why do you imagine we bring people to this place? To make them confess? No. That's not the reason. Try again. To punish them? No. To cure you. To make you sane. The party is not interested in the overt act. The thought is all we care about. We do not merely destroy our enemies. We change them. What happens to you here is forever. Even if we choose to let you live out the natural term of your life, you can never escape from us. Bolton, set the machine for 2,000. Yes, comrade. This time it won't hurt you, Winston. Keep your eyes fixed on mine. Now, how many fingers am I holding? Five. Do you see five? Yes. You see now uh, that it's at any rate possible. Yes. Before we bring the session to an end, you can ask me a few questions if you choose. The machine is switched off. What is your first question? What have you done with Julia? She betrayed you, Winston. All her rebelliousness, her deceit, her folly, her dirty-mindedness. Everything has been burnt out of her. It was a perfect conversion. You tortured her? Next question. Does Big Brother exist? Of course he exists. The party exists. Big Brother is the embodiment of the party. Will Big Brother ever die? Of course not. How could he die? Next question. What is in room 101? You know that, Winston. Everyone knows what's in room 101. Holton, the hypodermic. We have beaten you, Winston. We have broken you. Can you think of any single degradation that has not happened to you? I have not betrayed Julia. No. That is perfectly true. You have not betrayed Julia. Tell me, how soon will they shoot me? It might be a long time. You're a difficult case. But don't give up hope. Everyone is cured sooner or later. In the end, we shall shoot you. You're much better now. Weeks or months have passed, but you have no way of knowing. And one day, O'Brien is in your cell, and with him are the guards. Get up, Winston. Come here. You've had thoughts of deceiving me. Stand up straighter. Look me in the face. Tell me, Winston. And remember, no lies. Tell me, what are your true feelings toward Big Brother? I hate him. You hate him? Good. Then the time has come for you to take the last step. You must love Big Brother. It is not enough to obey him. You must love him. God, take him... Room 101. You're strapped upright in a chair, so tightly that you can move nothing, not even your head. There are two small tables in front of you, and for a moment you're alone. Then O'Brien comes in. Winston, you asked me once what was in room 101. 
Everyone knows the answer. The thing that is in room 101 is the worst thing in the world. The worst thing in the world varies from individual to individual. It may be death by fire, by drowning, by impalement, or 50 other deaths. In your case, it happens to be rats. Here. I place the cage on the table so you can see them. Well, you, you can't do that. You couldn't. It's impossible, O'Brien. You, you know this isn't necessary. What do you want me to do? For everyone, there is something unendurable. Courage and cowardice are not involved. For you, the unendurable is rats. They're a form of pressure you cannot withstand. You will do what is required of you. But what is it? What is it? How can I do it if I don't know what it is? No, don't bring them any closer. Do you want to understand the construction of this cage? This mask will fit over your head, leaving no other exit. When I press this lever, these starving brutes will leap at your face. Sometimes they attack the eyes. No, no, don't put them closer. No, no, no. Do it to Julia. Do it to Julia, not to me. I don't care what you do to her. Tell her, don't strip her the nose. Not me, Julia. Not me. the lonely hour of 15. Café is almost empty. You sit at your usual place, drinking victory gin and studying the chess problems in the Times. Nobody pays any attention to you. You've even seen Julia again. There was no danger in it. On a cold, biting March day, you would come across her in the park. I betrayed you. I betrayed you. Sometimes they threaten you with something. Something you can't even think about. Then you don't care. You want it to happen to the other person. And that's what you keep shouting. All you care about is yourself. All you care about is yourself. You don't feel the same toward the other person any longer. No, you don't feel the same. What happens to you there is forever. Something is burned out. We must meet again. Yes, we must meet again. Now in the dust on the cafe table, your finger traces unconsciously. Two plus two equals five. And on the wall, Big Brother gazes down at you from a poster. You gaze up at the enormous face. Forty years it has taken you to learn what kind of smile is hidden beneath the dark moustache. Oh, cruel, needless misunderstanding. Oh, stubborn, self-willed exile from the loving breast. <laughs> Two gin-soaked tears trickle down the sides of your nose. It's all right. Everything is all right. The struggle is finished. You have won the victory over yourself. I... I love you, big brother. been listening to 1984, an NBC University Theater production of the novel by George Orwell, starring David Niven.
This is the BBC Home Service and the British Forces Broadcasting Service. Saturday Night Theatre. We present David March, Rona Anderson and Gudrun Yor in Shadow of Murder, adapted from her novel by Charity Blackstock. Shadow of Murder. my little daughter how nice it would be to have someone to talk to, wasn't that, Keith? Yes. Oh, I assure you, I wouldn't dream of disturbing you. I expect there are empty cats. There's a corner seat for you. I shall be getting off at Balahoonish. Ah, you'll be staying at the station hotel, then. I know. I'll pass the Glencoe and the police sisters. Oh, damn. You'll have to dry your paper out before you can read it. Oh, I see. Do you mind if I smoke? Uh, of course not. Uh, perhaps uh, your daughter... Oh, would... no, no, thank oh, you. Kate never smokes, do you, darling? Such a dangerous habit. Besides, I think it's a wee bit unfeminine. So you're staying at the Three Sisters. That means we are practically neighbours. I'm Mrs. Stewart of Etty Farm, and this is my bad little daughter, Kate. She looks such a cross patch, but I think she's rather nice, though maybe I'm prejudiced. Oh, it's going to be marvellous having you so near. You must, of course, come to see us, Mr... Mr... Such a bleak place you've chosen for your holiday. But Mrs. Forbes is a nice little buddy, and I'm sure she'll do her best for you. There are only two other guests at the moment. You will be an artist, of course. Uh, no. If you insist on knowing, I'm a writer. Oh, but how thrilling. Kate, do you hear that? Yes, ma'am. Oh, she's such a reader, you know. Are you writing about the massacre? Oh, Mummy, you should... Uh, no, I'm not writing anything. I have just divorced my wife, Mrs. Stewart. I've heard if it interests you one hell of a time. And the reason I've chosen so bleak a place is that I don't want to see anyone or talk to anyone. Oh, you poor man. In that case, Mr... Oh, I'm afraid I didn't quite catch your name. I didn't give it to you. Shawfield's the name. John Shawfield. Oh. Why, of course I remember now. You were married to Sylvia Court, the actress. It was in the papers, wasn't it? It was. Well, we'll just have to try and cheer you up, won't we, Katie? Well, you're being very quiet, darling. Oh, she never talks much, Mr. Shawfield, but I know she's as sorry for you as I am. Oh, Mummy, really? It's all right, Miss Stewart. I don't need anyone's pity. That's probably just as well, Mr. Shawfield. Now what? I understand exactly how you feel, you see. I was divorced, too. Oh, such terrible tricks life plays in one. And Sylvia Court's the loveliest girl. I adored her last film. No one could deny her. She was a good actress. Now, we're not going to let you brood. The past is so isolated. But I'm sure the McDonald boy will be only too delighted to meet a fellow's cry. Uh, who's McDonald? Oh, he's at the hotel, too, the dearest boy. He's doing a book on the massacre, getting the local colour. He says he wants it to soak in. <laughs> that should be easy enough in this climate. <laughs> his ancestor was in it, you know. Alexander McDonald of Achtriochen, who was carried to the hills by his nurse in that terrible night. Young Ian is his descendant. Oh, he's a fanatical Jacobite, though actually he's lived all his life in the South. You said your name was Shawfield. I did. Oh, I should have recognized it, of course. Campbell of Shawfield. Oh, young MacDonald will have his knife into you, you know. I assure you, my name... The word is... Kruachan will naturally be familiar to you. Why on earth should it be? It's the Campbell battle cry. It's a word that has the bitterest significance in Glencoe. But... <laughs> I'm afraid I fail to see why this is amusing. Oh, Mummy, he can't help his name. Thank you, Kate. I'm quite capable of seeing that for myself. I'm not blaming you, Mr. Shawfield. There are good Campbells as well as bad. Well, that's fair enough. Uh, who, by the way, is my other fellow guest? You did say there were two of them. Oh, Mr. Curtis. Such a dear wee man. Uh, is he a clansman, too? Oh, dear me, no. He's very English. A retired bank manager. I believe he's had a nervous breakdown and is here on doctor's orders. Oh, he's very quiet. Only goes out occasionally for a wee spin in his car. He's so devoted to Huey, it's quite touching. So devoted to Huey? Oh, yes. He even buys apples for him. Huey is a horse, Mr. Shawfield. Oh, a Jacobite horse, I presume. Oh, that's just silly. <laughs> no sillier than the rest of it. Oh, Huey's a darling. Mrs. Forbes adores him. We call him the Lord Provost of Glencoe. Well, now, we've told him everything, haven't we, Kate? 
I do hope you'll not be bored with us, Mr. Shawfield. I don't see how I could possibly be. Well, if you are, you must come and see us. But don't walk alone in the pass at night, will you? Not with that murderer around. Murderer? What murderer? Oh, Mummy, please do. Oh, don't be so silly, darling. You're not a baby. Of course Mr. Shawfield must be told about it. Didn't you read about that dreadful man who killed his wife and buried her under the floorboard? Oh, now you come to mention it, I did. We shared headlines, as it were. But I'd no idea we were also sharing a holiday. It was really shocking. Of course, Kate is so sensitive, she takes after me, and I don't want to frighten her, but... He cut her up into little bits, Mr. Shawfield, and they seemed such a devoted couple. Nobody knew about it at first. He said she'd gone away to stay with her sister, and then he went away himself, but of course... Well, I mean, he put disinfectant down, but anyway, they dug her up in pieces. In tiny pieces, Mr. Shawfield. Can you imagine it? Yes, better than you might credit. The things people do. And the police think he's somewhere around here. The local people are convinced he's actually hiding in Ossian's cave on the cliffs of Hanukdu. <laughs> Though how he could ever climb up there. We're all so scared we might suddenly meet him. He cut her up into little bits. His own wife. What gets into people, Mr. Shawfield, that they do such awful things? Uh, perhaps you can only take so much for so long. It might happen to any of us, Mrs. Stewart. It might so easily have happened to me. To you? But you're not a murderer. Well, aren't we all? <laughs> but you've no need to be afraid of him. His state is far worse than yours could ever be. If you met him, he'd do the running away. I'm oh, sure... Oh, he... we're here. There's a halt here and we can get a lift the whole way home. Oh, if you'd just help me down with my baggage. Oh, yes, uh, of course. That's it. Thank you. Oh, goodbye, uh, Mr. Campbell. We'll be seeing each other very soon, and then you can tell me all about your book. Oh, Kate, hold this for goodness yes, sake. You know they don't stop here for more than a minute. Mummy, his name is not... Don't forget to call on us. Goodbye just now. Will you be Mr. Shawfield? That's correct. Uh, the car's here for you, sir, from the three sisters. I'll be taking you up the path. How far is the hotel now? Oh, it'll be half a mile. Uh, a mile, perhaps. Then stop, please. I'm going to walk it. Walk? It's a terrible night. Well, never mind. It suits my mood. But uh, you'd better take my case on for me. It'd be easier if I took you on as well. Mistress Forbes will think it's strange if I arrive without you. Look, surely there's no law against my walking if I want to. Do you think the murderer will get me? They say he's a little man and I'm six foot odd. Uh, I expect he's asleep now anyway. Tucked up cosily in Ossian's cave. Poor devil. I hope he's got a hot water bottle. I don't know what Mistress Forbes will say. After all, I was supposed to fetch you, and she'll not be too pleased to think I've left you in the middle of the pass. It seems daft to me. Are you sure you'll not change your mind, sir? No, I need to stretch my legs and breathe a little honest-to-God fresh air. Uh, tell Mrs. Forbes I won't be long. I'll be as hungry as a hunter and needing a nice stiff drink. Uh, I'll be on my way, then. What a night for a massacre. What the devil's that? Who's there? Are you by any chance a Campbell? Kruachan! Oh, why? It's... it's Huey! Oh, my boy, Huey. Oh, I'm afraid I've nothing for you, old boy. Hey, leave my raincoat alone, will you, you fat clot? You're bulging it up without my buttons. Oh, off you go, friend. It's too damn cold to stay gossiping here. And I haven't got as much flesh on me as you have. Next time, Huey, I'll have an apple for you. Good night, old boy. I've no doubt we'll be seeing a lot of each other. Oh, hello, Mrs. Forbes. Oh, there you are. I hope I haven't kept you waiting. It's a brute of a night. Oh, that dinner smells good. Well, I've kept it hot for you, Mr. Shopping. Oh. oh, this is one of your fellow guests, Mr. Curtis. How'd you do? Pleased to meet you. And this mm -hmm. is Mr. MacDonald. How do you do? Uh, well, there are just the three of you. We are never full in the winter. Now, would you like a drink? Oh, very much indeed. Yeah. Large whiskey, please. Uh, perhaps you two gentlemen care to join me. Oh, that's most kind. I don't usually indulge just after a meal, but a small port would be very enjoyable. Good. And you, sir? I haven't got the money to drink. 
I understand you write books, too. How does she do it? Oh, thank you, Mrs. Forbes. I need that. Cheers. Yes, Mr. MacDonald, I, uh, I write books, too. I gather you're writing on the massacre. It's only fair to tell you my book has been commissioned and is due to come out soon. You have no need to worry. I'm no more interested in massacres than I am in murderers. I'm here for arrest. Not interested. But of course you would say that with your ancestry. <clears throat> Such a nice port. I do like a sweet port. Your very good health, Mr. Shawfield. Shawfield. As you say, Shawfield. Cheers, Mr. Curtis. You. Are you sure you won't drink, Mr. MacDonald? I do not drink with Campbell's. Oh, one should drink with everyone, even if one dirks them afterwards. Well, I gather my dinner's ready, and after that I'm going straight to bed. Uh, should I perhaps say good night to the murderer? Why do you say that? Well, isn't the poor beggar supposed to be hiding out there? I don't envy him. I think I'd rather be in prison. Do we have to endure this gale? We'll all get our death of cold. There are worse deaths. And it's he who's cold. Fancy lying out there with a ghost of a disintegrated wife. Oh, do please shut that window. My chest oh, is not... I'm sorry, a... Mr. Curtis. I'm a selfish devil. There are no ghosts. Only the old mate Hewitt patrolling the old military roads. There. Well, I'll be off to my dinner now. Good night. I'll see you in the morning. Good morning. Oh, I uh, see where to sit at the same table. I think Mrs. Forbes felt it was a bit silly to sit at different corners of the room, as there are just three of us. Uh, may I pass you the condiments? Oh, my God! Do you have to use that word? You'll be crooking your little finger next. I fear I do not have the advantages of your education, Mr. MacDonald. I'm sorry if my way of expressing myself displeases you. I'm afraid Mr. MacDonald's education doesn't extend to his manners. Pay no attention, Mr. Curtis, and uh, I should like the condiments very much. This angry young man simply showing off. I'm not staying here to be insulted. Well, well. So silly to sit at different corners of the room. Or is it? Oh, dear me. Dear me. I'm afraid we'll have to ask his parents to remove that boy. We've had a lot of this. Well, he, he's an artist, of course. I believe all artists are a little nervous. Now, forgive me, but that's just baloney. Why do you put up with it? I endeavor not to judge my fellow men. Only I do think animals are more agreeable than humans. Uh, by the way, Mr... Uh, uh, Shawfield. Of course. My memory. I was just going to say that you can always use my car when you need it. You... Need never hesitate to ask. Oh, how kind of you. I'll probably take advantage of that one day. Well, you're very welcome. I always say it would be a sad world if we didn't help each other. Yes, I suppose it would. I gather you're a great friend of Huey's. Oh, we're the greatest, greatest friends. Such a human animal. And I fear he's a little greedy. The local farmers have to lock their guests against him at night. Unfortunately, once Mrs. Stewart... She owns the Etiff farm near Dalness. I know. And a very sweet lady. She, she locked her gates once, only she made a mistake. She didn't lock Huey out, she locked him in. Oh. And he ate a whole sack of oats. Oh, good heavens. But it was serious, you see, because if he'd drunk water after that, he'd have burst. <laughs> oh, it wasn't funny, I assure you. Fortunately, the dear old chap couldn't find anything to drink. Oh. Well, well, why does Mrs. Forbes let him wander about like that? Oh, he likes his freedom. You know, Mr. Shawfield, I sometimes wonder if the soul of the MacDonald chieftain, McEarn, inhabits dear Huey's body. There's <laughs> certainly plenty of room. Well, when one watches him walking the pass night after night, one really gets the impression he's still brooding on the massacre. If one only knew the sorts in his wise old head. Oh, apples, biscuits, oats, I should imagine. Oh, no. No, no, no you don't understand. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to make fun of him. Oh, I... I, I think I'll take my little constitutional. I, I've not been very well, you know. I've not been well at all. It's bitterly cold out. And I need fresh air. I, I don't like being cooped up. Hmm. Oh, I wonder if this coffee is still hot. Oh, yes. Oh, was that Mr. Curtis going out? Yes. He's braver than I am. <laughs> I'm just going to sit by your lovely fire. <laughs> I see old Huey's just outside. 
I bet he'd come in here if you gave him half a chance. Oh, then he'll stay there in the hopes of an apple. <laughs> Mr. Curtis always feeds him, so he's come to expect it. Well, Kate feeds him, too, when she's over. Kate Stewart, you know, from Etty's farm. Oh, but of course you met her mother on the train. I did, indeed. Oh, well, she's a bit of a talker, but the lassie's a nice, sweet thing. Though I do wish she wasn't so much under her mother's thumb. Uh, Mrs. Stewart was a great beauty in her day, you know, and poor Katie gets depressed because she thinks she's so plain. Oh, she's got magnificent red hair. Ah, uh, if she'd only do it properly. Uh, she's a capable lassie, anyway. It's a pity she's not in charge of the farm. I'm afraid they'll end by being evicted. Oh. They never got the hay in at all last year, and three of their cattle starved to death. Oh. Mr. Curtis was very upset about it. Ah, but I mustn't stand here blethering. You'll be wanting to get on with your book. Oh, what is the subject, or shouldn't I ask? Oh, I uh, just uh, write novels. Oh, I do so like a good tale. I must read one of them. Oh, if you want something to read, there are some magazines and papers over there. And perhaps Mr. MacDonald would lend you something. He's a good boy, but very highly strung. Mm. He lets the massacre prey on his mind, as if it wasn't bad enough to have this terrible murderer so near us. Of course, I bolt the doors and windows every night. <laughs> you better be careful you don't lock him in by mistake, <laughs> like Huey and the Oats. <laughs> oh, my goodness me. Don't say things like that, Mr. Shawfield. <laughs> <laughs> this isn't really important, but has it struck you that one of us almost certainly has met the murderer. Hmm? What do you mean? Our friend outside, Huey. Aye. Well, I must get on with my work. <laughs> <laughs> Old hopeful, aren't you, Huey? I've still nothing for you. What's the murderer like? Did he ever tell you why he murdered? So that's your considerable thing, is it? But I'll tell you something you don't know. I nearly killed my own wife once. Only somehow they didn't quite make it. But he did, Lionel Merritt. That's his name. Married to Violet Merritt. They seemed a happy couple. They even had a cat. But no children. We had no children either. Sylvia. Wood. Oh, am I boring you, Huey? This isn't really the stuff for a nice, respectable horse. You go for your walk. I think I'll do the same. Oh, I'm glad I've caught you. I want to apologize. Apologize for what? To think that I tried to shut the poor creature up. What on earth are you talking about? Tell me, how are you describing him? Who? The little man from Surbiton. <laughs> oh, I can just see it. And to think that I, a fellow writer, did my best to spoil it for you. What a good thing Mrs. Forbes told me you write novels. I don't know if I'm following all this, but I gather I'm supposed to be putting Mr. Curtis in a book. <laughs> Pass the condiments. Marvellous, marvellous. You seem to think my manners are worse than your own. Huh? Do you imagine I pull the strings to make a person dance for me? How dare you? You better get back to your thieving Highland Reavers. Though God knows they'd probably chuck you into Loch Etty for the lousy little Southern that you are. I'm a Scot! Oh, where were your cradles, Sandy? In the collies of the Charing Cross Road? Of course, with your name, you don't dare believe I'm descended from MacDonald of Artrioch. The only pity is you ever descended at all. Oh, I'm going out for a walk. And I warn you, if you make fun of Mr. Curtis again, I'll throw the condiments in your face. Hey, who's chucking away perfectly good apples? Why, it's Miss Stewart. Hello there. You're a long way from home, aren't you? Oh, hello, Mr. Shawfield. I was on my way to Tyndrum. Nice to see you again, Tibby Fowler. Well, uh, Tibby Fowler was rich. That's why the men came after her. We haven't got any money at all. We're going to be evicted. Oh, in that case, it seems a pity to waste good apples. Let me pick them up for you. <laughs> Mrs. Forbes promised me these. I biked up here with a message for her, then oh, I dropped my bag. I see. Well, I suppose I'd better be getting along. Oh, why? I should be glad to talk to a civilized person. Since I've been here, nobody mentions anything but murder and the devil. Oh, when I was a little girl, 
I had to read the Bible to my grandfather, and he'd never allow me to mention the devil. Huh. So I had to read out things like the world, the flesh, and the word I'm not supposed to say. <laughs> <laughs> I should imagine there are a great many words that you're not supposed to say. <laughs> well, I don't know why you should think that. Uh, uh, why don't you sit down? Oh, is it too cold? Uh, we could go back to the hotel if you'd rather and have a drink. Oh, no, no. Why not? Well, Mummy wouldn't like it. Oh, I hadn't realised I was making an immoral proposition. Well, in Scotland, ladies don't go into public houses. Of course, it's different in your part of the world. Ladies there can go wherever they like. They... So you too read your papers? Well, I... I must be getting along. <laughs> Mummy... I should never have come here. So you've read all about me, Miss Stewart. It must have greatly improved your knowledge of all the words you're not supposed to say. Why are you talking to me like this? Well, of course, I read the papers. And, of course, I recognized you. You were front page news, and you're very good looking. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I didn't mean to be impertinent. When you see, well, I, I'd read all your books, and I liked them. And they're not the kind to go with all that sort of beastliness. Your last one was wonderful. Oh, wouldn't you like an autograph copy? Straight, as it were, from Gehenna. Oh, no, thank you. I get them from the library, where you don't want to go squandering your royalties and me. Good heavens. And besides, you're so angry with me. I, oh, I'm afraid I'm a clumsy person. I biked out specially to meet you. You know, before my mummy arrived, I dropped the apples on purpose. I expect you were finding this funny. You could put it into a book sometime. Would you, uh, like a cigarette, Kate? No. Well, why not? After all, Mummy can't smell it from here. Oh, come on. Let me light it for you. I'm sorry I jumped down your throat like that. Of course you've read the newspapers. And I've an odd face and an odd name, too. It's a Campbell name. So everybody makes a point of telling me. Oh, never mind. What about our contemporary murderer? What's the latest news? Oh, he shot you off the front pages, Mr. Shaw. You impertinent baggage. If you're going to be so cheeky, you better call me John. Or even, as my friends do, Johnny. I'm beginning to feel pushed into the elderly gentleman class. Of course. John. It comes easier after the first ten years. Uh, so our murderer has replaced me, has he? Oh, Mr. Shawfield. Uh, uh, John, the poor creature, they're so certain he's here. Do you think he can really be hiding in these hills? God help him if he is. Oh, to be on the run like that, I don't know how he can endure it. The Pass of Glencoe is no place for a lonely, frightened man. Girl, I think you'd better come and have that drink with me. But what sort of a person can he be? A person like you and me, neither better nor worse, Kate. The human mind is like metal, you know. There's always a breaking point. Some of us murder, some of us mop and mow, some of us simply go to the devil. He chopped his wife up. That's just how it took him. You're being awfully nasty. Ah, uh, only because I'm afraid. Nothing makes people nastier. That's why I was so rude to you just now. Oh, well, let's walk back. We'll freeze if we don't. I'll wheel your bike for you. Oh, oh and you better give me your bag, too. I can't have you dropping it again. Oh, I can't. Oh, imagine. don't be silly. I wanted to talk to you, too. Why don't you have lunch with me? Oh, well, there's nothing even John Knox could say against that. You'll be superbly chaperoned, with Mr. Curtis passing the condiments on one side and Mr. MacDonald having a tantrum on the other. Oh, I can't. How cold it is. I'm sure it's going to snow. Why can't you? Mummy expects me to be back at the farm. Well, can't you ring somebody? Oh, there's no telephone around here. Mrs. Forbes has been trying to get one for ages. Oh, but it's so difficult to lay down the wires or whatever it is one does. Oh, that must be awkward when it snows. Oh, if it snows, you probably won't get out at all. Ah, oh, very jolly. What does one do about food? I hope we don't have to add an outbreak of cannibalism to everything else. You really have a horrid mind. Oh, don't worry. Mrs. Forbes talks up for emergencies. There'd be plenty to drink anyway. Well, that's all right, then. So you're definitely not lunching with me? No. You know, you're... How old are you? I'm, uh, 25. What, do you think your mother has the right to run your life for you? I'm not, after all... 
forgive my crudity, suggesting we go to bed together. All I want is for you to share with me the midday roast and two veg. Well, you're only asking me out of kindness. Oh. I hate people being kind to me. Oh, if you're going to talk like that, I've nothing more to say to you. Go back to Mummy, Kate, and tell her from me she's made a shocking mess of your upbringing. She was so lovely when she was young. Was she? I was engaged once. Congratulations. I brought him home. <laughs> there is an old song now, isn't there? Now I have to call him father. You mean to say she married him? Oh, no, no. But he fell in love with her. And that was that. Oh, there are other kinds of murder, you know, Mr. Shawfield's and chopping people up. <laughs> oh, I simply can't call you John. I don't know why. Mummy will be calling you by your first name in five minutes. Oh, call me what you like. There's the hotel. You might remember, Kate, that Mummy isn't as young as she was and that young men with Oedipus complexes don't make the best husbands. So I'll be meeting your mother again soon, will I? Yes. And she'll be turning on all her charm for me. Uh, before I go in, just tell me this. Has she read all my books? Oh, well, then, um, she borrowed them from the librarian last night. She was busy on them the whole evening. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know, I think there's hope for you yet, Kate. <laughs> I'm looking forward to meeting your mother again. And I don't mean that quite as you may imagine. Oh, there's Mrs. Stewart asking for you, Mr. Shawfield. Oh. I did say you were all at dinner, but... Uh... Oh, I'm just starving you, and Mr. Kurt is just about to carve to you, isn't it a shame? Katie said you'd be eating, didn't you, Kate, and I just didn't listen. Now, you're just to go on eating, you poor hungry creatures, as if I wasn't here. I'll be away in a minute. I want a wee word with Mr. Shawfield. I'm sure we're all delighted to see you. We hadn't really started. Uh, do sit down. Oh, the hell, there's the pepper. Oh. <laughs> Confound it. Hello, Kate. Damn. Well, you see, Mrs. Stewart, the effect you have on us all. <laughs> Hello, Kate. Hello, Mr. Schofield. Oh, so we're back in square one, are we? I don't know what you mean. I just came to ask you to tea tomorrow afternoon, Mr. Schofield. <laughs> and I'm not asking you, Ian. You've caught a cold, you poor boy. It's the pepper. Anyway, I'm not asking you because I know what you writers are. You'll be talking shop all the time and poor Katie and I'll not understand a word of it. As for you, Mr. Curtis, dear, I want you all to myself when you come. Oh, you've no idea how he helps us, Mr. Shawfield. He knows so much about animals. Oh, how kind of you. Uh, actually, I once studied to be a vet, but I fear my knowledge is sadly rusty. Of course it isn't, you silly man. But now, Mr. Shawfield, so fascinating our meeting like this. I don't think these things are coincidences, do you? I think they're meant. After all, I've been a fan of yours for ages. Indeed. I must say, it's interesting to meet people who've really read one's books. Uh, most of them just flip over the pages so that they can say the right things. Uh, you must have noticed this, Kate. I... Oh, no, I can't say I have. Haven't you? Once or twice I nearly wrote to you, but I, I didn't quite have the nerve. That second book of yours, A Lion Among the Ladies, haunted me for a long time. Do you remember, Kate? Oh, but I'm afraid my little daughter prefers thrillers. Oh, come, Kate. Surely you remember. Uh, I didn't realize I was saying anything funny, Kate. Oh, of course not, Mummy. Oh, well, never mind. If you want to laugh at your poor old mother, why not? But now, Mr. Shawfield, you'll come tomorrow, won't you? I will indeed. I shall look forward to it. Well, then, that settles. Oh, Mr. Curtis, dear, do go on with the carving. You all look so hungry. Well, if you're sure you don't mind. How clever of you to know how to carve. He's definitely here, you know. Oh, Mummy, please. The murderer. He's been seen in the Glen, actually seen. Please don't let me disturb your meal, only I thought you'd like to know. I'm not hungry. They have a description of him, you know. Apparently, he's got a scar. A scar? Yes. Oh, it's so terrible. A creature like that is no better than a wild beast. Oh, he's mad, of course. No sane person could carve a... Cut up his wife. Well, I've disturbed you more than enough. Come on, Kate, darling, we must tidy up our little home before the famous Mr. Shawfield sees it, mustn't we? Would you think me very forward if I called you John? It would be a privilege. I hope, Kate, you will do the same. It sounds so much more friendly. Oh, I don't think she'd dare. Kate is very shy, aren't you, darling? Well, we must go. Bye just now. Uh, tomorrow at four, Johnny. 
Goodbye. Bye. Oh, Mr. Curtis, anything wrong? I, I'm sorry. I, I'm afraid I'm not feeling very well. Oh, can I do anything? No, no. I, I, I'll go upstairs and rest a little. That woman's a damn show-off. Is she? Oh, you wait till tomorrow. You'll get a magnificent tea and you'll see your books in the case at the far end. Uh, not near enough to be obtrusive, but uh, where you can't miss them. She did the same to me. <laughs> Best of luck to her. Oh, you would say that. I'm going to tell you something. Every time you tell me something, you create an earthquake. What is it now? I've decided I'm going to marry her daughter. Oh, have you informed Kate of your decision? It's none of your business. I don't know why I'm telling you any of this. For all I know, you might be this murderer. I could say the same of you. You've got that kind of face. Is there a murderer's face? As it happens, my wife, my ex-wife, is very much alive. If you knew what you looked like when you said that, one day you will do a murder yourself. <laughs> Perhaps I will. You better be careful, MacDonald. There are other victims than wives. <laughs> what was this you were saying about marrying the girl? Oh, Kate. I think it's time she settled down. I need someone to look after me. She'll never have a name in lights, but she's a good girl. I fancy she'd marry anyone to get away from that mother of hers. I don't think she'd be any better off with you. What the hell do you mean by that? I'd give her my name and a home. She'd have married status. That's all women ever want. She'd be very well off with me. After all, let's face it, she's pretty plain. We can't all look like Sylvia Court, can we? I, I, I warn you, if you hit me, I I'll summons you. Oh, for pity's sake, I was merely going to light a cigarette. But I do find it a bit distasteful that you should speak like this of your prospective wife. After all, she's a person in her own right. I'll tell you something. I'll hold on to the tablecloth. We're all together, aren't we? Getting on each other's nerves like fun. And now it's going to snow. So your intended warned me. And when it does, anything might happen. Anything. How jolly. The murderer will have to come out for one thing. He'd freeze to death in Ossian's cave. And the Glen's a queer place, you know. Ghosts aren't the only kind of haunting. And you, being what you are... What the hell am I? <laughs> I'm going to show you something. Wait a minute. Oh, what now? Look. How do you like that, Mr. Shawfield? What's the point of all this drama? All right, it's a pistol. Am I to take this as a challenge to a duel or something? I see you handle it as to the manner born. It looks very old. 300 years old. A real Highland pistol. They call it over and under because one barrel is laid over the other. There's only one lock and hammer required because the second barrel can be turned round by hand. Here, after the first has been fired. It's a nice job. I should go easy with it if I were you. It's loaded. Both barrels. Do you mean to tell me that you leave a loaded weapon lying around like that in a drawer which isn't even locked? This thing would go off at the slightest pressure. You, you must be out of your mind. It's mine. I do what I like with it. I'm not being dictated to by you. For all your right bestsellers. Oh, damn my bestsellers. Anyone would think they were a crime. Uh, oh, uh, Mr. Curtis, uh, are you feeling better? What's that? Oh, it's all right. We've decided to use swords instead. This is something that has killed me. Mm, it has indeed. Ask Mr. Shawfield. Oh, do please put it away. I can't bear to look at it. It's wicked. It's done murder. Put it away, you imbecile. Oh, all right. Nowadays, they laugh at killing. I fear we've lost all sense of decency. We even sacrifice animals in the name of science. I don't like having a weapon lying about the house. Puts ideas into people's heads. It's all right, sir. Don't distress yourself. MacDonald isn't going to leave it here. I am? Why shouldn't I? I tell you what we're going to do, MacDonald. We're going to take a nice walk together. I think we both need some fresh air. I don't need any fresh air. Oh, yes, you do, before it snows. We're going to leave you in peace, Mr. Curtis. You can take a nice little nap. What is all this? I don't want to walk with you. Well, you are walking with me. Serves you right for baiting that poor little creature. It's a pity you don't mind your own business. Okay, okay. Oh, God, it's cold. Can't you smell the snow? Oh, that poor devil. This is no place for a murderer on the run. 
Tell me about the massacre, MacDonald. I'm in the mood. Wasn't it this kind of weather when it happened? Why, he has old McKeon himself to give local colour. Hey, boy! Ah, it appears he's not feeling sociable. A revolting slob of an animal. He ought to be sent to the knacker's yard. Would you murder your own clansman? What about my history lesson? I'm beginning to believe you know nothing about the massacre at all. I know it by heart. So should you, Mr. Shawfield. No wonder you can face the ghosts, you murderer. There are other ghosts. There's Violet, for instance. Don't forget Violet. And you call me mad. Who the blazes is Violet? Is she somebody here? She is a little dispersed, but she's here all right. She's here. Oh, I don't know what you're talking about. But I'll tell you of ghosts. The master of stare. You'll have heard of him. He ordered the massacre. I hope the soldiers will not trouble the government with prisoners. That's what he said. He wanted them killed. Women, children and all. A little dispersed. Her hands here, her feet there. I wonder if he sees her still on the slopes of Anachdub. It was down these slopes that they fled. Naked and screaming in a blizzard. The sky was red with her cottages going up in flames. They shot the old man from behind. They stripped his wife and tore the rings from her fingers with their teeth. It was bloody murder. This was bloody murder, too. When it was all over, the Campbells played a tune on the pipes from Loch Leven Shore. The Glen is mine. That's what the tune was called. The MacDonalds were dead. There was nothing left of them. There was nothing much left of Violet, either. Poor Violet. It might so easily have been poor Sylvia. I nearly throttled her once. Only... Ah, well, I didn't. If I had, it would be me in Ossian's cave. Perhaps it might be even now. Well, now you know all about it. And now you know why I call you a murderer, Mr. Campbell of Shawfield. What do you say? What? Oh, my God, you look it. What an ass you are. I'm no murderer. I saw you handle that pistol. It belonged to your ancestor. He murdered mine, John MacDonald of Atrilchen. When did all this take place? 1692 in the month of February. Well, it's now 1965, the month of January. And I'm going to chuck that pistol away the moment I'm back. Oh, let's stop this nonsense. Tell me about this precious book of yours. When's it coming out? I think you ought to dedicate it to me. You and your best sellers! I don't want to talk to you anymore. I wish you'd never come. Are we all mad? My best sellers. You couldn't even leave me that, Sylvia, could you? Well, now, I hope you had a nice walk, Mr. Shawfield. Oh, are you looking for something in that drawer? There's nothing there. It's empty. Yes, it's empty. Oh, is anything wrong? You look quite strange. No, nothing's wrong. Well, uh, you must give me some idea of my route. Tomorrow I go to Etive Farm. Kate! <laughs> What on earth are you doing here in the middle of the road? And what's all this furniture? Or do you have to move house in the snow? Oh, my dear girl, what has happened? We've, we've been evicted. Oh. It's all Mummy's fault. Oh, what am I to do? What am I to do? I don't know what the hell this is all about, but I do know it's pretty well a blizzard and cold as charity. You can't stay here. You'll freeze to death. You're coming straight back to the hotel with me so that you can get those sopping clothes off. And I shall give you a large brandy, whether you like it or not. Oh. You can pretend it's medicinal. Come along at once. Yes, but, but these things, they me ruined. Oh. And then that piano. A piano in the parts of Glencoe. <laughs> <laughs> Does it still play? Ah, oh, never mind. Clan Dermid's dead and Clan Donald, too. Girl, are you coming or aren't you? Well, I can't just leave everything here. You can and you will. Mummy won't be dreadfully upset. Well, I'm dreadfully upset too. <laughs> there was I dreaming of hot scones and a blazing fire. The next time you ask a poor London chap to tea, you might plan the weather better. <laughs> oh, Kate, come on, for pity's sake. You're the most idiotic, pig-headed girl I've ever met. I trouble you not to speak to me like that, Mr. Shawfield. Bah! Oh, really, <laughs> Mr. Shawfield! Mr. Shawfield! Put me down this instant! I won't be casted around like a baby! In a moment, I'll sling you over my shoulders like a sack of potatoes. Oh, In fact, if you go on like this, Miss Stewart, I shall smack you, which will be very undignified, and create a certain amount of tension at our future meeting. There is not the least need to shout at me, Mr. Shawfield. I do not like it. I am quite prepared to go to the hotel. If you kindly put me down like 
It's a pleasure, Miss Jewel. Do ask me again, won't you? You must both have tea with me sometime in Ossian's cave. <laughs> oh, that's better. Here, I'll take that case. Now, for God's sake, walk as fast as you can. This is as bad as the night of the massacre. <laughs> oh, it was worse than this. Uh, anyway, the massacre is something I should prefer to forget. It's nothing to do with me. Only I must admit, MacDonald has quite a gift for evoking the past. His book should be really impressive. Oh, he doesn't really write at all, you know. What? Oh. Now, look, I'm not being familiar. I'm only holding you to warm you a little. Oh, I don't mind. My poor lamb, you're frozen. Oh, perhaps I, I should have slapped you after all as a remedial measure. Oh, well, I don't think that you should speak to me like that. I, I am 25, you know. Oh, I'm sorry. What were you saying about MacDonald? Oh, well, I thought you knew. He means to write the book, of course, but he'll never really get down to it. He's a failure, you know, like me. Like you? Oh, yes. He's always making a mess of things, even as a school teacher. That's what he is, you know. Oh, he's really quite nice under all the nonsense. He... Uh, he wants to marry me. <laughs> he thinks I'd look after him while he writes. And are you going to marry him? Mm, I don't think so. Oh, it would be such a responsibility. I'm not sure if you should let yourself be so devoured by passion, Kate. Why are you laughing at me? Have I said something funny? No, of course not. Well, I did consider it, of course. I, I've always been scared of not marrying. There's no earthly reason why you shouldn't get married. Now, marriage isn't all it's cracked up to be. But if you're so frightened about it, you could always take up a cause. You'd do it very well, red hair, flying and all. In fact, I think you'd be quite terrifying. Oh, do you think so? Then what cause would you suggest, Mr. Shawfield? Oh, I wouldn't dare commit myself. Oh, we're nearly home. Shall I pick you up and run for it? My legs are much longer than yours. No, thank you. I do hope you won't catch cold, Mr. Shawfield. You must take a good tot of whiskey when you go to bed and get Mrs. Forbes to give you a hot water bottle. You are the most extraordinary girl. You know, you haven't told me what all this is about yet. And where's your mother? Did she forget she'd asked me round? Well, you see, we knew they were going to evict us. They said we didn't manage the farm properly. Mummy's never taken it seriously, but when the final note came, she got frightened and went out, thinking that they couldn't do anything if she wasn't there. Only, it didn't make any difference. They just took everything out and dumped it by the roadside. And what about your mother? Oh, I expect she's gone to Edinburgh. What the blazes do you mean? We have cousins there. I don't find that an adequate answer. Well, what was there for her to do? She doesn't get on very well with Mrs. Forbes, you know. She probably parked her bicycle somewhere and got a lift to Oban. Oh, I'll hear from her in a day or so. You tell me your mother leaves you to cope and waltzes off to Edinburgh? I hope she sinks in a ten-foot drift and freezes stiff. She should be shot. Really, Mr. Shawfield? I am quite capable of coping with the situation. Oh, sure. When I saw you this afternoon, I was amazed by the way you had everything under control, down to the bottom C of the piano. Oh, sir. Uh, oh. Oh, there was such a lovely tea for you, too. Beautiful cake. I made it by sense, uh, Mr. Shawfield. Uh, oh, oh, Mr. Shawfield, put me down. Put me, I, I won't have I'm it. not putting you down. I'm uh, getting you back oh, as soon as I can. Uh, Look, we're home. <laughs> Stop crying, my darling silly girl. Ian is watching you from the doorway. Huh? He looks like a new massacre. <laughs> You should speak more respectfully of the Glen. Shouldn't she, MacDonald? Shouldn't she, boy? Shouldn't she what? What's happened? Why are you carrying her? Is she hurt? Hurt? Oh, Kate? Never. Here, take her. No, 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 I 
not be tossed about between the pair of you. What do you think I am, a tennis ball? <laughs> Don't put me down. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Close the door, MacDonald. By the way, what happened to your precious pistol? I don't know what you're talking about. The pistol, MacDonald. The pistol I shot you with 300 years ago. The pistol I may be shooting you with any moment now. Look, all I want to know is, did you take that pistol away yesterday? I don't see what business is it of yours. <sighs> but I took it up to my room half an hour ago. What were you carrying Kate in your arms for? Oh, having just sacked the farm, I thought I might as well do things properly, so I ravished her as well. Will you let me pass, please? You may enjoy chatting in an icy hallway, but I want to go into the sitting room and warm up a bit. Oh, may I join you, Mr. Curtis? Mrs. Forbes says we won't be able to get out at all. Oh, you don't think the snow's as bad as that, do you? Gosh, I'm cold. Oh, bless Mrs. Forbes for this glorious fire. What? Oh, I don't know. It's really coming down with a vengeance now. But I must get out tomorrow. I simply can't stay in all day. It's bad for me. I've not been well, you know. The doctor said it was essential I should have fresh air. Oh, Lord knows it's fresh enough. My dear chap, I don't like being cooped up any more than you do. In any case, I want to get down to Balahulish tomorrow to see about Kate's belongings. She's been evicted into the snow, you know. And frankly, I don't think any of us will get out if it goes on like this. But I must... Mind you, I do understand I... how you feel. We're not exactly a coordinated group. If you feel you simply can't stand us, why don't you stay in your room? I'm sure Mrs. Forbes wouldn't mind. I know what the need for privacy is, God knows. Do you? Oh, yes, I had a wife once, you know. And wouldn't she leave you alone? Not for a minute. Not even to write. <laughs> I don't know why I'm telling you all this. You stay in your room, Mr. Curtis. Walls are good, 18th century workmanship. You won't hear us brawling downstairs. It might thaw tomorrow. It might. I must get out. You don't understand. I must. That, that pistol. Oh, now, don't worry about that. McDonald's taking it away. And high time, too. Well, I'm going to get myself a drink. I think I've earned it. Would you like something? Oh, no, thank you. It's very kind of you, but alcohol doesn't suit my constitution. Suits mine. Yeah, no. Oh, thank you, Mrs. Forbes. I needed that. Oh, how's our Kate? Oh, she's all right. She's had a hot bath and a good drop of brandy. I lent her my dressing gown and put her by my sitting room fire. Oh. Fancy Mrs. Stewart leaving the poor lassie in the snow and going to Edinburgh. Yeah. I could wring that woman's neck. Oh, things were different before Mr. Stewart left her. Oh, of course. Her husband. Oh, he couldn't take it. He's married someone else now. The poor lass has never been the same since. Not that Mrs. Stewart would care. She always used her as a kind of servant and keeps on telling her how plain she is. If she was lying dead in the snow this very minute, I'd not care. <laughs> Perhaps she is. No, you'll have a refill. Oh, Mrs. Forbes, you're making a lash out of me. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> well, no. why not? It's one hell of a night. Um, Mr. Shawfield. Hmm? Oh, cheers. <laughs> I was thinking maybe you'd go up and have a word with Kate. I know she'd like to see you. She wants to thank you. Oh, there's nothing to thank me for. Of course I'll go. Oh. And you won't uh, mind the dressing gown? <laughs> I think I could survive it. <laughs> I was warned about your dressing gown, Kate. <laughs> you look rather sweet in it, actually. Well, just a bit on the large size. How are you feeling? I made a horrid scene, didn't I? Oh, poor Mr. Shawfield. <laughs> Have you had a drink? Uh, I have indeed. I believe I'm a little drunk. It'll do you good. Oh, Kate, I don't think you should look after everyone like this. Simply means that people take advantage of you. I take advantage of you myself. Yes, you ravish me, don't you? I, I heard you say that. Oh, Kate, I, I'm most sincerely sorry. I think MacDonald brings out the worst in me. Well, it doesn't make it any better. Please, try to forgive me. Oh, I don't really mind. I was a little surprised, that's all. Oh, what a nice girl you are. Thank God you're here. Looks as if we're going to be snowbound. It's just as well there'll be one civilized person among us. No, I'm not as civilized as all that. What do you mean? It doesn't matter. <laughs> You'd better go. Oh. You should have a good hot meal. Oh, well, there you go again. Only I wonder... I wonder if you would kiss me goodnight before you go. 
Yeah, of course. Well, I, I know I, I shouldn't ask you. Oh, I was going to do it in any case, whether you asked me or not. Oh, no, you weren't. It's nice of you to say so, though. But... Oh, I know I'm embarrassing you. Oh, for God's sake, come here. Come here, you idiotic girl. Mr. Shawfield. Mr. Shawfield. Kate. Silly, nice little Kate. Why don't you relax now? You're hurting relax. me. Well, you asked for it, didn't you? Yes. Yes, I did, didn't I? Well, you better get down to your dinner now. And don't forget your aspirin. No. Good night, Mr. Shawfield. <laughs> well, well, you'll not be going far this morning, gentlemen. There are six foot drifts outside. <sighs> Huey has just sunk in one up to his ears, the daft creature. <laughs> well, I do hope it clears by tomorrow, because if it does, there's a little treat for you. Oh, and what's that, Mrs. Forbes? Oh, there's the cinema at Kinloch Leven. It comes round to all the villages once a fortnight. Oh, perhaps you could drive them down, Mr. Curtis. Oh, I fear I'm not one for the films. Oh. But, of course, my car is entirely at the disposal of anyone who wants to go. Ah, well, then. Mr. Shawfield and Mr. MacDonald can take Miss Stewart down. Oh, Kate, we were just talking about you. I was saying you must all go to the cinema tomorrow. Eh? Good morning. Well, yes, I should like that. No, I've no time for such things. I have my book to get on with. Besides, I don't want to be intruding. Oh? And what makes you say that, Ian? Yes, what makes you say that, Ian? It's a very interesting remark. We should all be delighted to hear your explanation. It's uh, falling very heavily. It's really quite but, uh, blinding. one can only hope, can't one? Well, um... Just to clear away the breakfast things. I'll help you, Mrs. No, Fox. no, no, dear. No, you just rest a while. Well, one can only hope, can't one? I wouldn't want to spoil your fun. It's a case of two's company, no doubt. I don't like playing gooseberry. Perhaps you would care to enlarge on these odd statements. Uh, I believe, I really believe it's not quite so heavy. I oh, think I know I, your uh, kind. If you I've read the newspapers, me, too. I know all about really you and your precious your wife. And now you honour us with your walk. presence, the dashing Mr. Shawfield. And naturally, you make a pass at any girl you see. Your sword will seduce your own grandmother, given half an opportunity. Right. Please, Mr. Shawfield. I'll deal with this. Now, what is the matter with you, Ian? Mr. Shawfield never made a pass at me. Uh, he was going to hit me. Well, I'm not surprised. I think you ought to apologise. You better hold your hand out, MacDonald. Or should I call you Ian? You are being silly too, Mr. Shawfield. Really, I've no patience with either of you. Oh, I can see when I'm not wanted. Oh, looks as if you and I will be going to the cinema alone. Well, that'll be very nice. Ian uh, is very highly strung. He'll be strung a good deal higher if he goes on like this. Oh, surely you're big enough not to mind what he says. He's so unhappy and mixed up and... Anyway, knocking people down doesn't do any good. Thanks for the sermon. I, I didn't mean to. Well, I, I must go and help Mrs. Ford. She said she didn't need it. Talk to me instead. Well, I don't see what there is to talk about. Kate. What is it? Don't look so frightened. I'm not. I'm not going to say anything rude or unpleasant. I know I've been both to you. I'm sorry. And MacDonald was perfectly right. I'm just the mess he said I am. I'm not sure if I'll ever be anything else. Not as long as my wife sticks in my memory. And then I meet someone like you. And you're sweet, Kate. Ooh. But you are. Only I'm not the sort of person for you. When I kissed you last night... I asked you to kiss me. Don't you remember, Mr. Shaw? Oh, damn your eyes for an exact and pedantic little prig. All right, then. Now, I am asking you to kiss me. No. Have it your own way. I'm just nothing now. You mustn't bother about me anymore. Shall I tell you what I think? If you must. I think you're lying. Oh, you do, do you? Yes. Oh, I knew exactly why you walked out on me like that last night. You thought... Oh, dear. 
Now she's going to hang her over my neck. She seems such a nice, sensible girl, and now she's just going to be a nuisance. You didn't find me really attractive, you see. Men never have scruples about attractive women. But I knew you'd say something dramatic like this. All writers like drama. That would serve you damn well right if I took hold of you this very instant and gave you a practical demonstration of the facts of life. I suppose it would. But it would be rather awkward for you, now wouldn't it, if I fell into your arms? Would you care to try? Anyway, I'm not as ignorant as you always seem to think. Would you like to come here a moment? No, no, I, I, I wouldn't. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I've spoiled all your grand scene. <laughs> Only... Oh, I wish I hadn't come here. I wish I'd never met you. Never mind, Kate. Tomorrow evening we'll go to the cinema and behave like civilized human beings. I think it'll do us both a lot of good. I suppose it will take our mind off things. What things? Well, Kate. Do you um, play cards, Mr. Shawfield? <laughs> Why? Are you suggesting we settle down to a nice quiet game of cutthroat? And perhaps it's not a very good idea. No, I don't think it is, really. But it's no reason for me to go on cutting your throat. I apologize, Kate, for being an absolute so and so. Why are you frightened? I keep thinking of the murderer. So do I. It's as if he's forcing his thoughts on us, making us all think of dreadful things. Yes, yes. We're all ordinary people, aren't we? Ian's really quite sensible when you get him on his own, and, well, Mr. Curtis is just a nice, respectable little man who probably goes to work every day in a bowler hat with a rolled umbrella. Well, that should certainly liven up the city. Ah, you laughing at me again. You should be glad. It means you're exercising my demons for me. But of course, you're perfectly right, as you always are. It is frightening, my darling. And we are all behaving like lunatics. Well, where are you going? Are you leaving me? Don't go. Oh, I must go and help Mrs. Forbes with the dinner. There, now I'm afraid it's just you and Mr. MacDonald today. Kate is eating with me, and poor Mr. Curtis is having his meal upstairs. He doesn't look at all well. Oh, I hope he's not sickening for something. Uh, it's very worrying. However, I must leave you two gentlemen to your meal. I'll thank you to lay off that girl. Did you hear what I said? I did. Look, I've known Kate for some time. She's a good girl. I'm going to marry her. So you've already notified and me. And you come along. Of course, you've all the tricks of the trade. You turn on the charm, no oh, doubt. Oh, don't you think this is all a little unnecessary? What is the matter with you, man? You always assume that I'm hell-bent on seducing your Kate when I assure you nothing is further from my mind. She thinks she's in love with you. Nonsense. You're insulting her. She's not the kind to make flirty eyes at everything in trousers. If you want to marry her, that's okay with me. But do some courting instead of shrieking abuse at me. Talk some sense for once. Why don't you tell me about your book? What a filthy, abominable swine you are. You talk of courting. You weren't so successful in your own, were you? Wasn't I? I suppose it just doesn't matter to you. That little chap outside is more guts than you. He killed her. He chopped her up. But I don't suppose you even mind all that muck in the papers. It's just more material for your cheap Jack novels. I suppose it is. Well, I'm going for a walk. I'll leave you to do your courting. I must admit that the thought of you as a wooer seems rather like Huey in tights doing a tap dance. But Kate is a very compassionate girl. Pretentious swine. Kate! Kate! Uh, come here a moment. I, I want to talk to you. I thought you were up in your room, Mr. Curtis. I really don't think you ought to be out in this weather. I know it stopped snowing, but it's bitterly cold. Yes, I'm well wrapped up. Are you looking for something, sir? Why should I be? Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you were ferreting around with your stick. <laughs> but of course, it's a damn silly question. You couldn't find a house in all this snow. I'm just taking a little constitution. Hardly the weather for it. I wonder if they've caught the murderer yet. Well, of course not. Of course? With half the Shire looking for him? Actually... I've developed a theory about him. 
And what is that? I don't think he's shut out at all. I think he's shut in. And the best of luck to him, poor devil. Oh, was that Huey over there? No. You looked over your shoulder? I saw him wandering about a few minutes ago. I wish you wouldn't keep on asking me questions. I beg your pardon. I didn't mean to... Uh... Well, it's really very irritating. It worries me. I don't like silly questions. I do hope it's a nice, jolly film tomorrow. I'm sure Miss Stewart will enjoy it. She's such a charming lady, I always think. Yes, she is, isn't she? She's kind. It's a quality one doesn't often meet in the modern generation. I've often watched her with Huey. I always feel the way people behave with animals is very revealing. I can't abide cruelty to animals. Shouldn't you come in now, sir? I'm sure Mrs. Forbes has a good fire waiting for oh, us. Do stop bothering me. I like the fresh air, I tell you. All right, all right. I don't. Not when it's as fresh as this. I'm going back to the lounge. Ian, do stop pawing me about like this. I don't want to kiss you. I've already said a dozen times that I'm not going to marry you. Thank you very much. I and suppose I... you want to remain an old oh, maid. I do wish you'd be sensible. Why don't you listen? You just go on from where you left off without paying the faintest attention to what I've been saying. I've said no, and I mean no, and... Oh. Oh, I'm so sorry. Am I intruding? <gasps> this is too much. You did this on purpose. You're spying on us. Oh, dear. I didn't mean to gate crash a crisis. I'm honestly sorry. I'm afraid I ruined his kiss. Oh, do you think I'd let a great big Jesse like that kiss me? <clears throat> let me help you pick up those magazines. MacDonald seems to do his courting as he does everything else. Like a car with a steering gone. Why are you always so beastly about him? He said you'd been terribly rude to him. Ah, we all come to you for comfort, you see. I'm here for comfort myself. Comfort? A shoulder to weep on, I know. No, oh, it always makes me laugh when I read those magazine stories about strong, silent heroes taking the little woman into their manly arms. <laughs> the poor creature ought to know that in a wee while she'll be reeling under the full sixteen stone of him, patting his shoulder and drying his tears. I don't know why you're complaining. Before you know where you are, Mr. Curtis will be asking you to partake of his couch and condiments. I don't find that in the least bit funny. Oh, I don't seem to be very popular this evening. Come and have a drink with me. Let's go to pieces. Well, Tippy, see you drink your whiskey like a good Scots girl. After all, Mr. Shawfield, I am precisely that. I want to talk to you. And I should like to listen. With shoulders a weep on. Though I don't weigh 16 stone. I want to kiss you. No. Why not? Just no. Tell me about it instead. Oh, I suspect you're well used to people telling you things. Oh, I always give excellent advice. But only for others, not for myself. It's your wife, isn't it? You're really still in love with her. In love? Girl, I hate her. I want to murder her. I want to cut her into tiny pieces so that nothing remains. Do you think that would lay her ghost? Huh? You're a clever girl. I don't know. Only Lionel could answer that. Lionel? Murderer. Oh. Oh, I forgot that that was his name. I've been thinking about him so much. I don't know him, but I do know that by destroying her, he's destroyed himself. Do you mean that? Well, I'm sure of it. I think murder leaves a shadow. It's like this glen where murder has sunk deep into the soil. Ah, that's the voice of whiskey, my love. Perhaps it's the voice of Lionel. <laughs> Don't add yours to it. Was your wife so terrible? She had to destroy, too. Even my part to write. And if I can't write, Kate, I'm lost and damned. But you, my darling, you'd never understand this. I don't suppose you've ever hated in your kind little life. Oh, yes, I have. Hmm? I love my father very much, Mr. Shawfield. She drove him away. No man could ignore the life she led him. I think if he'd stayed, I should be different. I shouldn't be such a thrawn, crabbed old mate. Uh. Oh, 
I'm talking too much. I'm being silly again. You're all right, girl. Oh, don't go away. Let me hold you. I, I really must go up to bed. Uh, I do believe I'm a little tipsy. <laughs> Whatever will Mrs. Forbes think? Kate. Oh, I've bothered you quite enough for one night. You needn't worry. I won't hang about your neck, I promise. Good night, Mr. Shawfield. Kate. I want someone to talk to. I must have someone to talk to. Huey! My boy, Huey! Where are you, huh? Ah, oh, damn the horse. He's never there when he's wanted. My God, what's that? Lionel! It's all right, man. She's dead, isn't she? Come in and talk to me. After all, we're all of us murderers. Lionel! 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 Mrs. Ford! Oh, I can't hear a thing through this. Here, now. What did you say, Mr. Shawfield? I just wondered, uh, did you uh, hear anything last night? What do you mean? Like, like someone crying. Oh, I sleep very heavily. He's still in the papers, but they don't think he's hiding out now. They think he's in a hotel. Someone saw him at Balahulish. It's that scar, you know. It's on his wrist. They think it may be where the knife slipped. Uh, they never found the weapon, you know. <laughs> London has a deep and wide river, Mrs. Forbes. Oh, well, it's nothing to do with us, is it? Oh, I hear Mr. Curtis is lending you his car. Mm. Oh, what a blessing it is, it's thawing. You'll need to start about six tonight. How pretty you look, Kate. You should always use lipstick. Mrs. Forbes lent it to me. I hope I've not put on too much. Mummy would be very cross with me. No comment. Let the old lady enjoy herself in Edinburgh. We're going to enjoy our cinema. Ah, you look really nice. I like the hairstyle, too. Oh, thank you, Mr. Shawfield. Kate. <laughs> yes, Mr. Shawfield. <laughs> I thought as much. <laughs> this is deliberate impertinence. All right, my girl. Either you call me by my proper name or I turn this car around, go back to the hotel, carry you up to bed, oh. and go to the pictures on my own. Oh. Well, would you like to put it to the test? No, John. I should think so. What's happened? I just want to celebrate this unprecedented occasion. Oh, John, please, please. Okay. You're not being fair. Now, why oh. must you spoil a nice evening? For pity's sake, I was only going to give you a nice, friendly kiss. Oh. Kate. Oh! Damn! Oh. oh, now, what is it? Oh, you've hurt yourself. Your wrist's bleeding. What the hell does he keep down the car seat? Looks like a razor blade. Oh, now, I I'll bind it for you. It's, it's not a deep cut. It'll, it'll stop bleeding in a moment. No, it, it's nothing. Uh, don't fuss me. I, I'm sorry I made such an ass of myself. Will you just try to forget it? Your guardian angel is obviously trained in commando tactics. Accept my apologies, please. Are you sure you feel all right? I'm fine. Why not? After all, I now share the same distinguishing mark as the murderer. Well, where do we go from here? I don't know the way to Kidlock, do you? Straight on. And then to the right. I didn't think we'd get that close. Oh, I think Sylvia, of course, it's so lovely. Oh, Can you get it? Quite a coincidence, wasn't it? That it should have been one of Sylvia's films. Did you enjoy it, darling? It was very nice. Should we drive somewhere and get a drink? Uh, no, thank you. You sure? Yes, thank you. Oh, all right, then I'll drive you home. What did you think of my wife? Oh, she's very lovely. <laughs> it's all rather amusing, actually. Well, it is funny, don't you think so? 
Oh, for God's sake, I must say you're not the most enlivening of companions. You better have the radio on, perhaps it'll wake you up a bit. What the hell do you think you're doing? Did Money never tell you not to grab at a driver's arm, especially on a slippery mountain road? You might have killed the pair of us. Johnny, Johnny. I know you hated her. I know she's hurt you dreadfully, but leave her be now. She doesn't matter. She can't touch you anymore. She'll get what she deserves in the end. She will indeed. Oh, please, Johnny, Johnny. Listen. Please, you must listen. It was wicked that it should be that, Phil. And I, I wish I'd known, but does it really matter so much to you? That part of your life is over and done with. You need never see her again. I have to see her again. No, 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 please. Let her go to the devil any way she pleases. I'm surprised at you, Kate. What would your grandfather say? Oh, are you going to ruin your life for her? You fool. Can't you see that is what she wants you to do? What do you mean by that, Kate? I should like an answer. We're not moving till I get one. All right. I'll answer. I think you're planning to kill her. You're going tonight, Johnny. I know you are. <laughs> All right. If you have to know, I am going tonight. I had a letter this morning from my solicitors. Oh, there's been no post for two days. I put a call through this morning. <laughs> there is no telephone. And you said it was a letter. Oh, you're driving me mad with all this insanity. <laughs> Serve you right if I put you out of the car and made you walk home. You are going to kill her. I know it. You win. I'm going to see her anyway. <laughs> Only I don't know if I'm going to kill her. Oh. Oh, don't be frightened, Kate. There's no need. I'll try not to do anything silly. Oh, Johnny. Johnny, you're not to go. I have to. <laughs> I'll go for you. I'll give her any message you want. Oh, my darling idiot, she'd eat you alive. Oh, I'm not afraid of her. I can sort her, all right? You don't know me, Johnny. You don't know me at all. I'm beginning to see that. But I have to go, Kate. I can't explain exactly why, even to myself. It's as if there's something in this confounded glen that's pushing me on. It's your novels, Johnny. I know you're right again. I'll make you right again. Oh, Johnny, if it would help you, I'll, I'll do anything you want, Johnny. Anything. I love you. I'd give up the whole wide world to stop you going. I'm not as silly as I used to be. If you want me to... What? Oh, Kate. Oh, my... Dear, dear girl. Thank you, Kate. I'll, I'll never forget that. But I wouldn't want it to be like that for you. You deserve better. Uh, dear Kate, I'll be honest with you. I have to go to London. But what will happen when I get there, I don't know. I don't know anything anymore. Come, darling. We must go. Long after midnight, we'll have the elders of the Kirk talking. <laughs> what a good thing Hugh is here to chaperone you. Oh, he's away to the village. Goodbye, Kate. I'll leave Mr. Curtis's car out for the night. Snow's melting fast. It won't come to any harm. <laughs> Johnny! Johnny! There must be an end to hate. Even here in Glencoe. I could do far more for you than she could. She can only destroy. She was why won't you trust me? Oh, not that. I do trust you. And it's not that. <laughs> Goodbye, Kate. I'll be waiting for you when you come back. Damnation, what's that? Oh, this is just about the last straw. What the hell are you doing out of this hour in the morning, MacDonald? And is this confounded bicycle yours? 
left, presumably to trip me up. I've been waiting for oh, you. Oh, go back to bed, you confounded idiot, and take your bike with you. Oh, no, you don't get away with it like that, you murderous Campbell. Look here, MacDonald. I've had just as much as I can take. Let me tell you once and for all that I am not a Campbell. I never was a Campbell. And I'm never, thank God, likely to be a Campbell. Of course. Seducing a nice girl like that means nothing to you. And what do you mean by that? The cinema ended at half past ten. It didn't take you two hours to drive back, did it? Oh, will you get out of my road? I've got to get to Balakulish. You neurotic little moonshiner, you're mad. You've got Campbells on the brain. You're not going to get away with this. I heard her go to her room and cry her heart out for what you'd done to her. She was still crying when I left. Oh, but you wouldn't care. You just take what you want on the hell with it. You're muddling up your times a bit, aren't you? I am not one of your wenching gallants of three centuries. What's that in your pocket? Put that away, you idiot. You want to commit a murder? It's a hair trigger. Oh, for God's sake, you are mad. Don't you like my pistol, Shawfield? Perhaps you prefer to be at the other end of it. Put that down! Oh. Get up, you damn fool. Well, you don't expect me to help you, do you? I must say, I never thought I, I'd owe my life to a bicycle. I'll take that pistol from you, thank you very much. So both barrels have been fired. Oh, stop that stupid noise, you infernal lunatic. Whose bicycle is this? Mrs. Stewart's. I might have guessed. So the murderer was locked in after all. Come on. Get up, you nutcase. You're going to help me. I want to shove away some of this snow. I can't. If you don't, I'll bury you in it. So help me. Oh, come on, man. Pull yourself together. Not to leave lethal weapons about. Come along, we better get back. We've made enough asses of ourselves to create a new massacre. You, you, you can't leave that poor lady lying there. Can you imagine either of us is in any state to carry her? Besides, the police will have to be notified. She is dead. I can't feel any more for the dead. It's time I concentrated on the living. Only, I want to tell you this, MacDonald. You keep on calling me Campbell of Shawfield. Well, as it happens, my grandfather was a Jew. He came from Hamburg, and his name was Schoenfeld. He changed it to Shawfield. He thought it sounded prettier. We've never shouted Kruachen. Our war chant is, oi vai, oi vai. Oh, all right, all right. Oh, stop dragging at me. This is the hotel, isn't it? Oh, I want to go to bed. Leave me alone. I have every intention of leaving you alone. Ah, oh, just one more thing. You are not to say a word of this to Kate. She'll know in the morning, soon enough. There's something I've got to do. But when I've finished, I'm going in to say good night to Kate. Any objection? Oh, have it your own way. What are you rummaging in Curtis's car for? Death. I suppose you think that makes sense. Where are you going? I'm going to see Mr. Curtis. What do you want? I have two things to show you, Mr. Curtis. One, a 17th century pistol. And this. That's my surgical knife. Yes. I, I don't like lethal weapons. Why do you bring these horrid things into my room? Take them away at once. One is lethal no longer. Both barrels have been fired. Why did you have to kill Mrs. Stewart? I suppose you couldn't find her body in the snow. I wondered what you were looking for all the time. She was well buried. You wouldn't have found her till the thaw. But it's all up, you know. And what do you mean by that? Oh, for pity's sake, man, of course it's all up. The police will be here tomorrow. They have your description. Even if this hadn't happened, it would only have been a question of time. They got your scar wrong, sir, didn't they? I see it's on the pad of your thumb. Not on your wrist at all. I suppose the knife slipped. I don't care for these personal remarks. You talk as if nothing had happened. Even if I were prepared to connive at your escape, how on earth do you think you could get away? I fear you underestimate my intelligence. You haven't answered me. 
Why did you kill her? Why? Didn't you see it took away your last chance of escape? And of course I killed her. She knew about my scar. I couldn't possibly let her live. She was cycling down the road and I shot her. She was cruel. She let her cattle die of starvation. I've no patience with people who ill use dumb animals. It's wicked, vile. We had such a lovely cat. He was called Ricky. After Kipling's mongoose, you know, he was the dearest little fellow. Don't you ever think of humans? Humans? Oh, humans. No, Mr. Shawfield. Why should I? They've never thought of me. Give me Huey any day. But he's only an animal. That's what Violet said. He was such a dear little fellow. He used to run and meet me when I came back from work. He talked to me, you know. I've always loved animals. I believe I told you that I trained to be a vet. Oh, of course. That's why you have a surgical knife. Why didn't you throw it away? It wasn't very clever of you to keep it in the car. I still keep my instruments. I wish you'd seen little Ricky. He understood everything I said. And she waited until my back was turned. And then had him destroyed. My lovely cat! Oh, she must have had her reasons. Reasons? What possible reasons could there be for such a dreadful thing? She said he was dirty. After all, he was an old gentleman, 15 years old. It wasn't his fault if he occasionally made a mistake. But she couldn't bear anything dirty in her home. She took him round to the vet while I was at work and had him put to sleep. So I killed her. I suppose you are going to repeat all this to the police? What else can I do? You litter the place with corpses like a battlefield... Mr. Curtis, I want you to tell me something. Pardon? You killed your wife. I don't know why you keep on asking me that. I've never attempted to deny it. Of course I did. I was very clever about it. All right, you were clever. But tell me this. Why do you always look over your shoulder? What on earth do you mean? Why are you always turning as if there's someone behind you? I, I, She's I still there, isn't she, Lionel? Violet is always there. Maybe there's a jigsaw pattern across her, but she's still there. No! I'm sorry, dear. I won't keep you waiting long. I just have to speak to this gentleman. Well, don't be angry, dear. I'm just coming. Mr. Curtis, you're not well. Oh, yes, I am. And I'm clever, too. I'm clever than you. They'll never catch someone as clever as me. You're not going to the police. I shall make my getaway as I always have. I suppose you're going to see Kate now. Yes. The only person I could bear to talk to. I don't really mind. I'm leaving here. I'm going back to teaching. That sounds about the most sensible thing I've ever heard you say. I can do my book in my spare time. Yeah, I expect you can. What's the matter with Curtis? I saw him tearing down the stairs just now, as if all the devils in hell were after him. I imagine they were. I'm not driving fast, dear. Yes, dear, I did signal I was going right. Of course, dear. Just as you say, dear. Well, after all, dear, we have to get away, don't we? Huey! Oh, do go away! There's a good old chap! Huey! I can't stop you! What am I going to do? Huey! Huey! I just thought you might like to know I'm back. I'm not going out again. You needn't worry anymore, Kate. <laughs> 
Oh, Oh, my darling, my poor darling. You've been crying yourself sick. Oh, don't cry anymore. Go to sleep now. Oh, so terribly white. What's happened? Are you really not going back to Sylvia? Sylvia? Oh, she's in the past, Kate. She's nothing to do with me anymore. I should have had the sense to know it a long time ago. Oh, my dear darling, you're worth a dozen of her. And I'm sorry I frightened you so. Listen to me, Kate. The shadow of murder is gone. And we're alive. We're going to stay alive and be happy. And, oh, my darling Kate, I love you very much. That was David March as John Shawfield, Rena Anderson as Mrs. Stewart, and Gudrun Yeo as Kate Stewart in Shadow of Murder by Charity Blackstock. With Eric Anderson as Curtis, Fraser Carr as MacDonald, Molly Rankin as Mrs. Forbes, Arthur Lawrence as the taxi driver. The production, which was recorded, was by Audrey Cameron. After the 11 o'clock news summary, Music at Night is a program of British chamber music, a piano recital given by Alan Rowlands. And he'll be playing works by E.J. Moran and Arnold Bax. And the main work is the Sonata by John Ireland. That's Music at Night at approximately two minutes past 11 in the home service. Now, in just a few seconds, the chimes of Big Ben and the 10 o'clock news. This is the BBC Home Service. Here is the news read by Michael Murray. India has accused Pakistan of using tanks in a new border clash. Mr George Brown has said he's going to issue a shop steward's guide very soon on his prices and incomes policy. Chelsea, watched by the eight players suspended from training, were beaten 6-2 at Burnley and are now out of the running for the league championship. In one of tonight's matches, Portsmouth escaped relegation from the second division by drawing away to one of the promoted clubs, Northampton. The P&O liner Arcadia has been refloated after going aground in the Suez Canal. Lord Hives, former chairman of Rolls-Royce, has died at the age of 79. Indian and Pakistan troops engaged each other today in a new border clash, and judging by Indian accounts, it seems to have been a particularly vicious one, with the Pakistanis using tanks. The scene was the boggy wilderness known as the Ran of Kutch, where fighting has been going on intermittently for the past fortnight. It's in this area that the Indian border runs closest to Karachi, West Pakistan's biggest city. Most of the details of the fighting have come so far from the Indian side. According to their spokesman, Pakistan troops, numbering about 3,000, attacked a post held by a small Indian force. The Indians fought back, destroying three Pakistan tanks. The latest reports indicated that fighting was still going on. The Indian spokesman said Pakistan had brought up a substantial force, including, as well as tanks, medium artillery and two squadrons of fighter bombers. The scale of these preparations, he said, suggested that Pakistan was taking an increasingly threatening attitude. When you start using tanks, he added, it is very near war. 
A Pakistan spokesman has said that Pakistan forces retaliated after repeated firing from Indian positions in the Ran of Kutch. He claimed that the Indians suffered considerable casualties. It's not clear whether the Pakistan statement refers to the same engagement as described by the Indians or to another incident in the area. Our Commonwealth correspondent says the tone of the Indian spokesman's remarks is unusually tough, and if indeed Pakistan has been using tanks, then the situation will undoubtedly cause international concern. The British government is keeping a close watch on developments. Mr George Brown has said he hopes to get out very soon a layman's guide, or shop steward's guide, to his new prices and incomes policy. At a union conference in Manchester, he said there would be a temptation to applaud the policy, but then to act as though it applied to the other fellow. There would be battles to fight within the unions over this. The policy was not one of restraint. It was a policy for more rapid expansion of income in real terms than we'd ever achieved before. It could mean that a man earning £16 a week last year would be able to earn £20 a week in 1970. Not simply a paper increase, but a rise of 25% in his real spending power. Mr Brown referred to groups such as teachers and nurses whose pay had fallen seriously out of line with the level for similar work and added, I could mention others much in the public eye at the moment. He'd seen people interviewed on television who still thought that so long as you cracked down on teachers or nurses or railwaymen, you were running an incomes policy. This was absolute rubbish and it was time we stood out for a sensible and intelligent approach to this problem. Before the meeting, Mr Brown said he was feeling much better after his ten days rest. The former Conservative Minister of Labour, Mr Godber, speaking at Newcastle on Tyne, said that Mr Brown's incomes policy was already beginning to look more than a little meaningless. Over the last six months, wages had been rising at an average rate of more than 8% a year. This, said Mr Godber, would be good if everyone didn't know that it must mean a big rise in the cost of living. The eight Chelsea players who were suspended from training earlier this week were spectators today when a makeshift side, which included four 18-year-olds, lost their game at Burnley 6-2, and with it, Chelsea's remaining chance of the league championship. Lockhead scored five times for Burnley. Afterwards, in an interview in the BBC's Sports Report, the Chelsea manager, Tommy Doherty, said the eight players hadn't been banned, they'd merely been sent home for staying out late. They would definitely go on to the club's coming tour of Australia. The league championship now rests between Leeds and Manchester United, who both won. Portsmouth, by drawing their match this evening at Northampton, escaped relegation to the third division by one point. They were helped by Jimmy Dickinson playing his last game for the club on his 40th birthday. Swindon and Swansea go down. In this afternoon's soccer, the Scottish Cup was won by Celtic, who beat Dunfermline 3-2 at Hampden Park, equalling Rangers' record of 18 wins. The Scottish First Division champions are Kilmarnock, after winning 2-0 away to Hearts, who are runners-up. At Wembley, Hendon won the FA Amateur Cup, beating Whitby Town 3-1. In the Third Division, Bristol City won promotion with Carlisle, and Luton, beaten 8-1 at Scunthorpe, will go down. The 30,000-ton P&O liner Arcadia went aground today in the Suez Canal, but has since been refloated and has anchored in Port Said. It's not thought that the ship has been damaged. The Arcadia, on a voyage from Britain to Australia, is carrying nearly 1,200 passengers. Southern region electric train crews have called off their threat to go slow from Monday. This was decided at a meeting in London today of representatives from about 30 depots in the southeastern division. After an appeal by Mr Griffiths, General Secretary of the Drivers' Union, Aslef, the men agreed to wait next week's meeting of the Union Executive. Some 600 motormen had said they'd work to rule because of continued delay in settling their claim for a productivity bonus. Lord Hives, a former chairman of Rolls-Royce, died today in the National Hospital for Nervous Diseases in London. He was 79 and had been in a coma since he went there more than two years ago after a stroke. Lord Hives joined the staff of Rolls-Royce as a mechanic at the age of 22 and became managing director in 1946. He was made a Companion of Honour in 1943. The Minister of Land and Natural Resources, Mr Fred Willey, today attended the official opening of the Pennine Way, Britain's first statutory long-distance footpath 
that stretches 250 miles from Edale in Derbyshire to just over the Scottish border at Kirkietham. At the ceremony at Malham Lings in Yorkshire, he said he was making an urgent and comprehensive review of a policy for the countryside. This would have the backing of all the necessary powers to ensure that people could enjoy the countryside in all its aspects. The American government has published the results of a six months experiment to find out how people and property react to the bangs made by the supersonic aircraft over a long period. Oklahoma, Oklahoma City was chosen for the test and American Air Force planes made over 1,200 bangs at the rate of about seven or eight a day. Our Washington correspondent says it was found that damage to property was fairly slight. Windows seemed to have broken only where they were damaged or badly installed in the first place, and much the same was the case with plaster. More interesting was the reaction of people. At first, over 90% of those questions, questioned said they thought they could learn to accept the bangs. But halfway through the test, only 80% thought they could get used to it, and by the end of six months, a quarter of those asked said no. They thought they could never learn to live with the bangs. Socialist leaders from 13 countries have been entertained at Chequers today at a meeting of the Socialist International. Informal talks, which went on throughout the day and into the evening, were concentrated on the problems of European economic cooperation, Southeast Asia and Africa. After the full conference, a special after-dinner session between the Prime Ministers of Norway and Sweden, the Vice-Chancellor of Austria and Mr Harold Wilson, discussed means of bringing the countries of EFTA and the common market closer together. The expenses of the conference, it is said, are being met by Mr Wilson, as this was not a government but a party occasion. 74 of the 77 riders in the Vintage Motorcycling Club's Coventry to Brighton run arrived in Brighton tonight. The other three broke down on the way. The six oldest machines, all built more than 50 years ago, completed the 150-mile run. So did the only woman competitor, Mrs Margaret McMahon of Coventry, who rode a 35-year-old machine. The Soviet Foreign Minister, Mr Gromyko, according to the New York Times, is to have an executive type of American limousine costing about £6,000. It is equipped with a bar and a television, and the report says it is already being shipped to Russia. The car, a Lincoln, will take eight people. The weather, tomorrow is expected to be dry for much of the day with some sunshine in eastern areas. Rain will later spread from the west. That's the end of the news. G. Marshall. You've come to the right place. Here we present a unique kind of drama. Drama that uses your ears to stimulate your fears. The story you are about to hear concerns another part of the human anatomy. It's a tale about a very frightening pair of hands. Not because they're ugly or mutilated or because they do evil things. On the contrary, the hands of our heroine do nothing at all. And therein lies her terror. But there's one other subject our story deals with. And it's the most mysterious of all. The human mind. Our mystery drama, The Hands of Mrs. Mallory, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Henry Slesser and stars Celeste Holm. It is sponsored in part by Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser, and Buick Motor Division. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Some research experts say you can't taste the difference between beers. Well, if they're right, then Anheuser-Busch wastes a barrel of time beechwood aging Budweiser. Only they don't think so. Brewing beer right does make a difference. And they're betting a bundle that you can taste the difference in Bud. When it comes to brewing Budweiser, the Anheuser-Busch choice is to go all the way because they still care about quality. Look at it this way. 
if the Bud people have a choice between what some experts say and what beer drinkers say, well, you'd better believe they'll go with you beer drinkers every time. When you say Budweiser, you've said it all. Anheuser-Busch, St. Louis. Hey, ma'am, what's for dinner? Hey, ma'am, what you got? What's for dinner? ShopRite suggests lean, savory smoked ham. Shank portion, just 69 cents a pound. Butt portion, 79 a pound. Choice grade first cut chuck steak, 69 cents a pound. Pen Dutch noodles pound package, 49 cents. Crown top white bread, just 39 cents for a 22 ounce loaf. For a quick meal, serve banquet frozen 10 ounce dinners. All varieties except beef or ham are just 39 cents. Check the store wide values at ShopRite. You'll find a lot more for a little less. She loves the family. She wants the best. She does all that she can do. She lets shop right do the rest. Hey, Ma, what's for dinner? Shop right has the answer. Think of the most beautiful day you can imagine. A day so perfect that the birds are singing its praises. And even the people who line the park benches, those roosting creatures who seem to exist in a vacuum without emotion, seem happy and contented today. But there's one exception. A lady of middle years who sits alone on a bench. Is it her glum expression that has driven away other people? Or well, perhaps it's the obvious elegance of her mink stole and the glistening perfection of the diamond on her finger. Hey, lady, is this seat taken? No. It's okay if I sit here and wait for my brother? He's playing in the ball game. How nice. He plays first base. Hey, you want to see my baseball? Uh, not especially. It's got Reggie Jackson's autograph on it. Here, look at it. No, please, I, I, I really don't know. What? Uh, what's the matter with your hands? Nothing. It's... They're just a little stiff, that's all. Now, why don't you go watch your brother play? Well, he says I jinx them. Gee, your hands look funny. I mean, can't you move them at all? No. As a matter of fact, I can't. Gee, that's funny. I never saw anything like that. How come you can't move your hands? It's a kind of a sickness. You wouldn't understand. But maybe if you explained it to me, I would. Yes. If I could explain it to you, son, I would be very happy to do so. You don't know how happy. Come in, Ida. Have a seat. I always feel so guilty when I take your time. Each examination seems to produce exactly the same result. Well, that's no reason not to keep examining you. Then there isn't any change. No, Ida... No change. Well, what have you been doing lately? Well, I've been sitting in the park a lot. <laughs> I see. It's a bit ridiculous, isn't it? I have this glamorous terrace. I could sit there like a queen and view the whole park and all the people in it. But I prefer to sit on a bench and watch the squirrels and listen to the children. Well, I think that's a good thing, frankly, to be on the ground... In touch with things. Herbert never believed in that. Herbert liked to get away from the smell of the crowd. Yes, that was the phrase he always used. The smell of the crowd. My husband knew a great number of unkind phrases. Well, I never knew him, of course. No. Oh. Neither did I, I suppose. Even when he was lying in his coffin. I felt as though I were saying goodbye to a stranger. And after Mr. Mallory died... How soon after that did the paralysis set in? Oh, it was about a month. Yes, a month after, I suppose. That soon? Yes. And now it's been how long since you haven't been able to move your hands? Five years. Can you believe it, Doctor? Hmm. I can't. After the first six months of this terrible paralysis, I thought I, well, I couldn't go on living with these stone fingers of mine. I thought it would be preferable to be dead. But you never lost hope of a cure. No. I mean, that's what's kept me going. The hope of a cure. Oh, and 
something else. I suppose one must say a kind word for money. If there was one thing Herbert did in his life, he managed to leave a very rich widow behind him. Ida, I hope you won't misunderstand what I'm going to say. Doctor, you don't have to say it. I know what comes next. You're going to advise me to get out of myself, to stop thinking about my poor hands and think about other people. Charity work. Well, Ida, that's one suggestion. Oh, if you knew how many charity committees use my name, or how many thousands of dollars I give to every foundation with an impressive name. Ida, I was going to talk about going back to that psychiatrist. Oh, that. I honestly think you gave up too soon. If you'd given the man a chance... Dr. Merritt, my hands are paralyzed. I'm not imagining it. They're paralyzed, frozen, insensitive. You've made all the tests yourself. Do you think I've been faking? No, 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 of course not. The illness is genuine, but... But sometimes the origin of an illness of this nature can... It's all in the mind, yes, of course. All in the mind. So easy to say that, isn't it? So many doctors have told me the same thing. It's so much easier to blame my mind than their own failure. Ida, please. Doctor, excuse me. It's time for me to go. You've got lots of patients waiting for you. Some of them you might even help. Hey, hi. Oh, it's you again. Waiting for your brother? Nah, he's not playing today. Oh, that's too bad. It's a lovely day. He broke his leg. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Hey, is that what happened to your hands? I mean, did they get broken? Mm, something like that. Well, do you feel anything at all? I mean, like your fingers? You're a very curious boy. Did anyone ever tell you that? Can I just catch him, lady? Please? No, please don't. Hey, hey, you kid, now cut that uh -huh. out. Well, Stop I... bothering this lady, you hear me? I wasn't bothering her. All right, was... now go on, get out of here, leave her alone. Okay, okay. I just wanted to touch her hand. I'm sorry, ma'am. I just couldn't help overhearing. Uh, thank you. He was getting a little too bothersome, although I'm sure he didn't mean any harm. Well, I could see that you were getting annoyed. Ted? Ted? Oh, yes, I'm over here, Melinda. Lend me a hand, huh? I can't manage two hot dogs and a bag of peanuts and two crutches at the same time. Oh, sure, honey. I'm sorry. Uh, excuse me, ma'am. Oh, this one's yours, with the mustard. Thanks. Do you think I could sit down? Of course. Ted, would you grab that crutch? Yeah, I got it. Listen, I told you that I'd get the hot dogs. I mean, you didn't have to be quite so independent. <laughs> That's funny. You're always complaining that I'm not independent enough. Oh, am I crowding you, ma'am? Oh, no, no. Plenty of room. Ted, who, who was that boy I saw running off? Oh, I drove him off. He was uh, bothering this woman. Oh, dear. Oh, are you all right? Oh, yes, I'm fine. As a matter of fact, he was telling me about his brother's accident and he hurt his foot. I guess this must be the season for accident. You mean these crutches? I'm afraid that was another season. Hey, you know, gee, it's warm, isn't it? Huh? For this time of year? <laughs> of course, you're warm. Saving fair damsels and all that stuff. I didn't know you were a regular St. George, Ted. Yeah, sure I am, with kid dragons. <laughs> uh, would you like some peanuts, ma'am? We've been trying to give them away to the squirrels all day, but we haven't seen any. <laughs> no, thank you. I, I don't like peanuts very much. I can't imagine what squirrels see in them. <laughs> don't worry. My brother will happily eat them all by himself. Your brother? Uh, oh, I'm Melinda West. This is my brother, Ted. And my name is Mrs. Mallory. How do you do? Uh, haven't I seen you two here before? Oh, you probably have. We live close to the park. Are you from around here, Mrs. Mallory? Oh, yes. I live in that building right there. Oh. What a view you must have. Can you see the park from your window? Oh, yeah. Oh, if I had a window like that, I'd never come down to the park. Well, of course, these crutches sort of discourage you walking around very much. Do you both live in the city? No, no, we're from Ohio. We've only been here about two months, but uh, I guess we'll be going back soon. Don't say that. Don't even think that, Ted, please. I'm sorry, Melinda. I, I didn't I mean to... I gather that uh, you don't want to leave. Well, not if it means that... Well, the truth is we came here to see a doctor, a, a surgeon who specializes in cases like mine. You... See, I was in an automobile accident two years ago. I haven't walked since. Oh. Oh, I'm so sorry. I know exactly how you must feel. Well, people always think they do, but they really can't... Ah, uh, Melinda. What? I think your brother is trying to signal you, Melinda, about me. What do you mean? He means... 
Please. My hand. Oh, I'm so sorry. I, I, I didn't even realize. No, some people don't realize that I can't move them. See, as long as I sit here very quietly, my whole body is as immobilized as my hand. Yes. Now I know what you mean. I know how tempting it is to just want to sit, be a statue, so that for a little while you can forget that part of you is dead. Oh, come on, Melinda, please. Let's cut this out, huh? Please. Tell me more about this surgeon. I can tell you what he said in one word. One two-letter word. Oh, dear. He won't operate, then. He said it wouldn't do any good. Now, he turned us down flat. That's why I want Melinda to let me take her back home. Oh, well, do you have parents there? No. No, no, we have no one. Uh, but I don't want to go back. I, I don't. I want to see... What were you going to say? Never mind, Mrs. Mallory. Now, come on, Melinda. You finished your hot dog. Let's, let's go home. Ted, let me tell her... Let me ask her. For Pete's sake, what kind of nonsense is this? What do you want to bother the woman for? Because there's no one else I can talk to about Dr. Griff. I I can't talk to you about him. You just get red in the face and stomp away from me. There's nothing to talk about, and I'm sure Mrs. Mallory isn't interested in fairy stories. I really don't know what either one of you is talking about. Who is Dr. Griff? Oh, he's a quack, a phony. Well, that's all he is. A two-bit faith healer who robs every cripple he can get his hands on. You don't know anything about him. You only met him once. Yeah, well, that was enough. I could tell in one second that the man is a fake. He can't cure a broken spine. But why not let him try? Somebody has to try. I don't want to be the way I am. Oh, Mrs. Mallory, I don't want to be this way. Help me. Help me, please. <laughs> Mrs. Mallory's physician would be very pleased right now. At last, his patient seems to be taking his advice to interest herself in the outside world, in problems other than her own. But how involved will those problems become? We'll wait to find out until I return shortly with Act Two. Excuse me, madam. Oh, I'm in an awful hurry. I, I just wonder if you could answer a simple question so for do me. I. The question is this. What? what happens this time of year? Oh, huh? that's easy. The kids get home from camp. Goodbye. Nope. What do you mean, nope? Nope. I mean, I should know when my kids get home from camp. Well, the answer I had in mind was a tad more general in scope. Well, I gave my answer. Let's hear yours. You know, I'm glad you asked. Are you? You see, what happens this time of year is that Buick dealers are giving particularly great deals on all their 74 Buicks. For a family woman such as yourself... I think a neat little Apollo would be just the ticket. It's small, economical, but surprisingly roomy. And it's a Buick, so it's really quite elegant. You don't say. Uh Now, isn't that good news? Yes. I mean, that you can get such a nifty deal on such a nifty small car. To be sure it is, yes. To be sure. By the way, uh, where do your kids go to camp? Guam. It's a small island in the South Pacific. Guam. There's a very special deal going on at all offices of Suburban Savings throughout North Jersey. It's called Suburban Special Interest Deal. And you'll be especially interested in the savings you get. A top 7.90% effective annual yield on Suburban's limited issue 7.50% savings certificate. And Suburban guarantees it from 4 to 10 years. Minimum deposit $2,500. Early withdrawal prior to maturity is subject to a substantial penalty. Suburban compounds interest continuously from day of deposit paid quarterly. So you not only get interest on your savings, you get interest on the interest. And Suburban offers you the highest interest rate allowed by law. Here's your chance to get a great savings deal. A top 7.90% effective annual yield on Suburban's limited issue 7.50% savings certificate. Why not deal yourself into Suburban Savings special interest deal at any Suburban Savings office in northern New Jersey? Located in Bayonne, Edgewater, Elmwood Park, Emerson, Hackettstown, Morris Plains, Nutley, Paramus, Sparta, and Wayne. The good weather is holding in the city, and Mrs. Ida Mallory has returned day after day to her bench in the park. A bench which seems to have become her property by right of eminent domain. But even Mrs. Mallory would have to admit that her interest in these daily visits is no longer restricted to sunshine and green grass. 
Each day, she hopes for another glimpse of the young couple, the scowling brother and his pretty, pathetic sister. And then, on the fourth day, there they were. Excuse me. I don't know if you'll remember me. Why, of course. You're Mrs. Mallory, the lady with the view. <laughs> yes, that's right. How are you both? Oh, we're okay. Well, I really didn't mean to interrupt your conversation. Oh, don't be concerned about the way Ted looks. His face always is like a thundercloud. Especially when we discuss the forbidden topic. I suppose you mean that doctor. Yeah, she talked me into seeing him again. You know something? Every feeling I had about him the first time was confirmed. That's really impossible, Mrs. Mallory. Tell me something. Is he a real doctor? Well, I'm not sure he's a medical doctor, Mrs. Mallory, but I'm sure he's entitled to the degree. Maybe a, a doctor of psychology or something like that. I'll tell you what he's entitled to. A good swift kick in the... I'll tell you one thing about Dr. Griff. He's the only one, the only one who said he could help me. He didn't promise. He just said he was hopeful. Well, that's something anyway. Yeah, I'll tell you what he's hopeful about, getting your 500 bucks. He says he's very hopeful I can be cured. And that's worth a great deal more than $500. All right, go on. Tell her the rest. Tell her the real clincher. Are you afraid to? What do you mean? Mrs. Mallory, you're an intelligent woman. So listen to how Dr. Griff plans to cure my sister. I know it sounds sort of melodramatic. Oh, it's but... idiotic. That's what it is. Please. Please, I'd still like to know. Well, he says he uses something called the water of faith. See what I mean? The water of faith? Yeah. Sounds sort of, um, hmm, religious. Like, um... The holy water at Lourdes. It's it's related to that, yes. Oh, now do you see why I say the guy is an out-and-out fraud? The water of faith. Where are we? Back in the Middle Ages? Well, I must admit it does sound sort of odd. Just the same. He said that it works. That it's worked for dozens of people. He wants $500 for the treatment. With but... no guarantees, you understand. Hmm. Oh, Mrs. Mallory, will you help me, please? Will you talk some sense to this woman? Oh, my dear. I mean, I have to admit, it really doesn't sound reasonable. You mean the $500? Oh, but it's a very special treatment, Dr. Griff said. Well, I meant it's not reasonable to assume that such things can do any good. I see. So I'll never know. Is that it? I'll just turn around and take a plane back to Ohio and live out the rest of my life as a cripple. And for $500, at least I might have had a chance to yes. live. Yes, I see what you mean. Ted. Oh, I hope you don't mind my calling you Ted. Oh, no, no, of course not. Your sister, well, she may have a point there. I mean, even if it is a waste of money, perhaps she'll never be happy unless you let this man try. If not, she'll always wonder about it. Always. Yes. Yes, I know that. That's what his whole bag is, making you wonder if it just might work. And, well, about the money, I don't know how to say this, but you see, $500 may seem like a lot to you, but it isn't to me. So if I can help you... Oh, no, no. Oh, no, please. Absolutely not. It's not really a problem, Mrs. Mallory. We've got the money. Besides, it's not the money so much as, well... Seeing Melinda disappointed again. I've had so many disappointments, you see. Yes. Yes, I know all about such things. Oh, dear. Yes, of, of course you do. Oh, you see what a selfish person I've become. I keep forgetting that you have your own affliction. I'm not sure that it isn't even worse than mine. To lose the use of your hands. Well, never mind about me. What, what are you two going to do? Oh, I don't... It looks like I'm outnumbered on this thing. Dad! Does that mean you... You'll let me do it? You'll let me? Well, if you go back without trying this dumb water of faith, you'll always regret it, so... Okay, let's get it over with. Oh, Mrs. Mallory! Oh, thank you, thank you. You're the one who did it. Oh, my dear. I just hope your miracle happened. All my life, I wanted to believe that miracles happen. Melinda? Melinda? Wait a minute. Oh, oh Mrs. Mallory. Well, you move faster on those crutches than I do on my two feet. 
you're, you're not here alone, are you? No. Ted's with me. I just wanted to take a little stroll by myself. No, that isn't true. We just had another fight, and I had to get away from him. Oh, dear. Now, that doesn't sound too good. Well, you know how Ted is. Well, see, I haven't seen you for two days. How are you? The truth is, I don't really know. But I've I started treatments, Mrs. Mallory. With Dr. Griff? Yes. I started about five days ago. And it's... It's nothing at all like what I expected. Well, tell me about it. Well, do you remember how silly it all sounded, this water of faith business? Well, it sounded a little theatrical. But it isn't. It's scientific, Mrs. Mallory. That's the most wonderful part of it. Dr. Griff only used that phrase as a, as a convenient description of, of the, the drug. What drug is that? Well, maybe I shouldn't tell you this. Why not? Oh, I don't know. I I have the feeling that, that there might be something slightly illegal about it, the, the drug oh. he uses. A psychedelic suggestion. Psychedelic suggestion? Now, what on earth is that? Uh, it's the technique Dr. Griff uses. He, he uses it to, to liberate the mind from its control over the body... Whenever that control is negative. I'm sorry. You know, I really don't understand that kind of talk. Well, I'm not saying I understand it myself. Completely. But it does sound to me as if he believes that your illness is psychosomatic. I don't know, Mrs. Mallory. All I know is that I have to go through with it. Kill or cure. It isn't a dangerous treatment, is it? No, no, I, I'm sure it isn't. It, it's, well, it's more like a sort of... A hypnosis. I go to his office, he administers the drug, and then he talks to me. And that's all there is to it. And? Has it helped? I I think I'd better go back to Teddy. He, he, he's probably getting worried about me. Melinda, please tell me if... Melinda, look out! Oh, that bicycle! Oh! Melinda! Melinda. Melinda, oh. are you all right? Oh, you let, let me help you, Miss. Oh, you idiot. I mean, can't you what? see that that girl is crippled? Quick, give me that crutch. Oh, yes, sure. Wait, wait, wait. I, I, I think I, I can manage to pick myself up this way. Now, just, just take it easy. Mrs. Mallory. What is it? Are you hurt? No, no. No, it, it's my leg. D did you see that? My leg... Bain slightly at the knee. No, no, I didn't see Look, it. Miss, if you're sure you're okay. Oh, get out of here. Go away and be more careful next yes, time. Yes, oh, Miss Ma Mrs. Mallory, I'm sure it happened. I, I saw it happen. My leg moved. For the first time in two years, it moved. <laughs> Sorry, I can't find any reference to this Dr. Griff in any medical directory. But that doesn't prove he's a fraud, though, does it? Oh, no, of course not. And as you say, the man may not be a medical doctor. I certainly hope he isn't. Well, why do you say that? Pride of profession, my dear. We don't like to have faith healers bearing the same credentials. And that's what you think he is, a faith healer? Well, of course. Oh, I'm not knocking the power of faith far from it. Very often, it's simply another way of getting at psychosomatic difficulties. Oh, I hate that word. I know you do. Oh, I've been through all that psychosomatic nonsense. All those doctors who tried to tell me that my paralyzed hands weren't, well, what they are. But there's something in me, some emotional problem. You didn't give them much chance to prove or disprove it, either. I did. I submitted to their therapy, even if I didn't believe in it. And it didn't do the slightest bit of good. Well, maybe if you had believed them, it would have. Flesh is flesh, Doctor. Bone is bone. That kind of therapy can't make my hands move any more than it can make that poor girl walk. And I have a good mind to tell him so. Please come in, Mrs. Mallory. Thank you. Won't you have a chair? 
All right. Well, do you mind if I ask who referred you to me? Well, actually, it was one of your patients, Melinda West. Yes, yes, of course. A very charming young woman. Have you known her long? Just a few weeks. See, I haven't seen her for the last ten days or so. How is she coming along? Well, actually, you'll get a chance to see her soon. She has a three o'clock appointment with me, which is only a few minutes from now. So, if you wouldn't mind telling me what's on your mind, Mrs. Mallory. Well, I just thought it would be um, worthwhile talking to you, Doctor. About yourself? Well, as you can see, I am afflicted. Uh, Do you mind if I look at your hands? Yes, frankly, I'd rather you wouldn't. Not just now. I'd I'd rather hear something about yourself, about this uh, treatment of yours. Melinda said something about a technique you used called uh, psychedelic suggestion. Now, just what is that? It's a medical principle. As old as mesmerism, as new as chemotherapy. The power of mind over body. Uh, Psychosomatic. Well, who knows what afflictions is psychosomatic. Some illnesses start with the emotions... Some with the body. And more often, it's a combination of both. Really? Germs aren't imaginary. Viruses are very real little creatures. Yet the mind has strange powers over them. To make them hurt us or to render them harmless. All right, then. What about a broken leg? Can the mind cause that? Of course. If you use your head, you wouldn't break your leg in the first place. Oh. (laughs) You're thinking of Miss West. Of the fact that she suffered a spine injury. That's right. I hardly see how you can correct something like that. You've seen her x-rays then? Mm, No. You believe the damage is neurological? Well, I know nothing about it. That's strange, Mrs. Mallory. You certainly seem to have an opinion. (laughs) Be careful, though. You don't have a medical degree. Someone might call you a quack. Listen, doctor. I came here... Oh, uh, excuse me, Mrs. Mallory. Ah, Melinda. I'll be with you in just a minute. No. No, come to think of it. Why don't you come in now? There's a friend of yours here. A friend? Oh, it's I, Melinda, Mrs. Mallory. Oh, Mrs. Mallory, how nice to see you. Come in, Melinda, please. Melinda? Your crutches. Where are your crutches? Look at me, Mrs. Mallory. I can walk without crutches now. I'm not very steady, but I can walk. Well, there goes at least one of Mrs. Ida Mallory's cherished notions that the mind can't cure the body. But she sees the evidence of her own eyes. And something tells me that this is one prejudice she's willing to give up. After all, she wants to believe in miracles. And don't we all? Mrs. Ida Mallory has spent a sleepless night, dreaming of things she never thought possible. But when the sun streamed in her windows, her first thought was to get out into the park and with only one hope, of seeing Melinda West again and seeing her miracle confirmed. It's true. It's really true, Mrs. Mallory. Even Ted has to admit it. Well, I guess there's something to it, all right. I haven't seen my sister off those crutches in two years. But how did it all happen? I don't really know. As I told you, he he used this drug. He made me go to sleep. And then he simply talked to me. At first, there was nothing. And then I started feeling life in my legs again. Well, you saw me that day in the park when I fell down. Oh, Melinda, Melinda. I, well, I just can't tell you how happy I am for you. Well, and what are your plans now? Oh, go home, I guess. I've got to get back to my job if it's still there. The treatment costs much more than we thought it would. Yes, the 500 went in no time at all. Then he asked for another 1,000. He said it couldn't be helped. The drug he uses is so horribly expensive. Now, listen. I told you once that if there were any way I could help you out financially... Uh-uh. No, no. No, that's out, Mrs. Mallory. We'll we'll manage okay. Of course we will. Well. <laughs> and I can go back to work now. I can do anything I want now. Oh, yes. <laughs> yes, that must be a wonderful feeling. To be able to do anything you want. <laughs> Mrs. Mallory, 
Please come in. Thank you, Doctor. You know, it was really very good of you to see me on such short notice. That's quite all right. Please sit down. Thank you. Well, I don't quite know where to begin. Well, suppose I begin for you. You've been thinking about Melinda West. Yes, I saw her only this morning. She really is cured, isn't she? Yes, Mrs. Mallory. In my opinion, the young woman was cured. But you realize that all I really cured by psychedelic suggestion was the illness that existed in her mind, not her body. But I still don't fully comprehend it. I'm sure there was no real neurological damage to the girl. Oh. I think her bones and muscles and nerves were all in the proper place and functioning normally. Only her mind wasn't. But she seemed so sensible. Mrs. Mallory, do you know the story of that accident? I beg your pardon? Did Melinda ever tell you exactly what occurred that caused her injuries? No. No, as a matter of fact, she didn't. She simply said it was an automobile accident. That's correct. And she was the driver. Oh. There were two other passengers, her mother and her father. Both of them were killed. Oh, dear Lord. She did sustain some injuries in the crash. But it was apparent to me that they were not sufficiently grave to cause her the total paralysis she suffered. Ah, uh, you mean she felt that guilty about what had happened? Mm. Guilty enough to seek punishment for herself. And she did. She punished herself by losing the use of her legs. And, and so, your treatment was able to cure her. Yes, I'm happy to say. But, of course, it couldn't cure someone like me. What was that? I said it couldn't cure me. See, I didn't lose that use of my hands for any kind of reason like that. I mean, it's just some sort of nerve damage. Doctors could never explain it. Well, if that's the diagnosis of your physician, that it's purely physical and incurable... Oh, but I didn't say that. See, I mean, my doctor has never used the word incurable. I have been hoping for years that it would just heal itself. I can't go on living like this. So helpless and so useless. Uh, Mrs. Mallory... Have you come here to talk about Melinda West or yourself? Myself. Hmm. I want my hands back. Oh, dear God, I want my hands. Yes, I was afraid that's what you had in mind. Afraid? Why? Because if you had any idea of becoming my patient, I... I regret to say that it's not possible. But why not? I mean, you accepted her as a patient... And, and you cured her. I mean, you really did. Unfortunately, Miss West is the last patient I can accept. At least in this part of the world. Doctor, I, I don't understand. Are you... Do you have to go somewhere? That's correct. But where are you going? Abroad. And my plans will keep me abroad for at least a year. Oh, no. I mean, listen, if you're going to Europe, I, I mean, I was thinking of taking a trip no, there myself. No, no, Mrs. Mallory, my destination isn't Europe. I'm going to North Africa, a case of some importance. Well, since when is one patient more important than another? Oh, no, no, I didn't mean it that way. Oh. It's simply that this is a prior commitment. But maybe then, maybe I could go with you. I mean, I could take up residence there. I'm afraid that's impossible, too. Why? Well, the country I'm going to is a Muslim country. My patient is the son of, well, a, uh, a notable Arab leader. Oh, why would that make any difference? What does it matter? I'll be living within the bachelor section of the official residence. It's an area restricted by Muslim law. You wouldn't be allowed near the place, my dear lady, even if I were free to treat you. And I'm not. But I have money. I'll pay you. I'll pay you anything you want to stay and treat me. I mean, I'll, I'll meet this Arab leader's offer. Mrs. Mallory, the fee I'm about to receive, I wouldn't ask of any individual... I've been asked to remain with him for a period not to exceed one year. A year? For that year, in a Swiss bank, there will be deposited for me $150,000 in Swiss francs. One hundred 
50,000? I'm very sorry that you made me reveal that confidence. Now, I, I trust that it goes no farther. I'll pay you the same. What? You heard me. I'll pay you the same. I mean, not in a year's time, but as soon as you've cured me. I'm sorry. Your offer is very generous. But it's also conditional. What do you mean, conditional? You'll pay only for a cure. That's something I'd never guaranteed a patient. Not Miss West, not my Arab friend. No one at all. All right, then. Suppose it isn't conditional. Suppose I agree to pay you in advance. Well, that, of course, would be something worth consideration. Well, hello, Dr. Merritt. This is certainly a surprise. I think it must be the first time that a doctor ever made a voluntary house call. Well, I, I didn't come here to see you as a patient, Ida. Only as a friend. Well, that's very kind of you. Ever since I saw you last, I've been thinking over what you told me about this Dr. Griff. Oh, yes. Well, what about him? I thought it would be worthwhile just to ask around about the gentleman. And last week I was attending a joint conference of my medical association and psychological group. Mm -hmm. Well, anyway, I did learn something that I thought you might be interested in. There is no Dr. Griff. Oh, what was that? Oh, maybe he has a Ph.D. and tacked that in front of his name, but I'm quite sure that the man is not a medical doctor. All right. Be that as it may, he's still not necessarily a fraud. Well, I... I didn't say he was anything. But I suspect that your original judgment was correct. But... That he's not someone to be trusted. But you don't know the whole story. Well, what I do know is... You're more impressed with a man than you were willing to admit. Isn't that right? Dr. Merritt, he cured that girl. What? You know that girl I told you about, the crippled girl? She's walking again. I saw her walk. Well, I suppose that could be true. Faith healing does have its successes. Well, I'm sorry, Doctor, but I'd rather not discuss this any further. Oh, wait a minute. I don't like the way you sound. Ida, have you made any sort of arrangement with this charlatan? Dr. Merritt, I appreciate your interest, but I refuse to say another word about this matter. I mean, do you understand? Not another word. That's right, Mrs. Mallory. Just relax. Close your eyes. And let the water of faith flow through your bloodstream. You can feel it tingling through your body, bringing you peace and tranquility, total peace and happiness. Do you feel it? Yes. Yes, I feel it. And now, I'm reaching out for your hand. You see me reaching out for you. Yes. Yes, I see you. And now... Oh, of all times. Who's that now? Yes, what do you want? Are you Dr. Helmut Griff? Yes, who are you? The name's Barry, Doctor. Lieutenant Barry, Racket and Bunko Squad, Police Department. May I come in? No, you can't. I happen to have a patient with me right now. Would her name be Ida Mallory? And who are you? I'm her physician. You might say her accredited physician. I demand to know what this intrusion is all it's about. It's not an intrusion, Dr. Griff. It's an arrest. What? Doctor? Well, Dr. Griff? So, uh, may we come in now? Ida. Ida, are you all right? Yes. Oh, what's, what is it? Oh, I mean, what's It's all right, happening? Ida. Everything's going to be fine. They've got them all now. All of them. Well, what are you talking about? Uh, is this a lady, Doc? Yes, this is Mrs. Mallory. 
I don't think she's in any condition to talk. He's obviously given her some kind of drug. It's a, a legitimate drug, a, a perfectly legitimate sedative. Yes, yes, of course. Doctor, I'm sure it's nothing very unusual, second all or something of that nature. No mysterious water of faith. Please, please, won't someone tell me what's going on? No, I'll tell you, Ida. But it may hurt just a little. You see... I told the police your story, and they investigated. He is a fraud, Ida. How dare you Be say quiet, that? mister. You're no more a doctor than I'm police commissioner. His real name is Michael Lanning. Alias Dr. George Watkins, alias Dr. John Wilson, and that's his modus operandi, Mrs. Mallory, posing as a fake doctor, offering miracle cures, usually for sick widows with lots of money. Oh... But he cured her. I mean, he cured Melinda. This is the part that may hurt most, Ida. He did not cure Melinda West. Because Melinda West was never crippled to begin with. I know. It was just psychosomatic. Oh, no. No, no. No, Ida. Just crooked. What? She I... was in on the racket with him, Mrs. Mallory. Her real name is Anna Fraser. Oh. Her so-called brother is Tony Fraser. And I'm sorry, they're not brother and sister at all. They're man and wife. No. And I believed them. I believed them. Well, we haven't caught up with those two yet, Mrs. Mallory, but we will. Oh, I uh, brought some pictures for you to identify. No, no. I don't want to look at them. I can't bear to look at them. Please, Ida, you must. But I don't want to prosecute them. I don't. Why really? not? They're crooks, plain and simple crooks, all three of them. I don't care. You have to help us now, Ida. You have to identify these parasites. Now, please, look at the photographs. You know something, Doctor? Sometimes people set out to do good and end up doing harm. And sometimes it works the other way around. What do you mean? Hey, now. Hey, now, stop that. Now, don't rip up those photos. Ida, 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 what are you... What? For the love of heaven, you're tearing up the pictures. You're tearing them up. With my hands, Doctor. With my own hands. Well, they say that it's an ill wind that doesn't blow someone some good. And in this case, it looks like three evil people have managed to be very good to Mrs. Ida Mallory in spite of themselves. If there's a moral to this tale, I'd frankly hate to be the one to say it. No, we're not recommending that the best way to cure your ills is to fall into the hands of confidence men. Myth included Celeste Holm, Patricia Elliott, William Redfield, E.V. Juster, Arnold Moss and Leon Janney. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division and Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Bud. Bit suspicious, okay? Our cast included Celeste Holm, Patricia Elliott, William Redfield, E.V. Juster, Arnold Moss, and Leon Janney. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division and Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams... From New York, where the American stage begins, NBC presents Best Plays with John Chapman.
Best Plays, the series of hour-length dramas selected from the outstanding successes of the New York stage. Now John Chapman, editor of the theatrical yearbook Best Plays and drama critic of the New York Daily News, is here to introduce Herd Hatfield and Victor Jory in Patrick Hamilton's Rope. Mr. Chapman. Good evening. Patrick Hamilton of London is one of the best men at the business of scaring innocent audiences like yourselves. He has a fondness for writing about characters who are somewhat on the lunatic side. Previously on this program, you may have heard Angel Street. But anyhow, you must know it. And you'll remember the sinister Mr. Manningham who tried to make his wife as crazy as he was. This evening's best play is Mr. Hamilton's Rope, which was a Broadway success some years back under the title Rope's End. In Rope, we shall meet some rather weird characters and hear some strange events. The two principal characters in this cat-and-mouse drama about a murder in the usually calm precincts of Oxford University will be played by Herd Hatfield and Victor Jory. Are you ready? All right, we'll begin. It is dark in the room. The light from the street lamp outside throws shadows against the ceiling. And even in the half-light, these moving figures seem to be dancing, circling in some primitive rite about the chest. The lock. It won't. Give it to me. That's it. There it is. Closed tight. Stop there. No. Don't put on the light. Steady, Grano. You all right? Grano. Give me a match. (laughs) You all right? It's time you pulled yourself together. Brandon, you understand what we've done? Yes. I know what I've done. I've committed murder. Passionless, faultless, and clueless murder. Yes, Brandon. An immaculate murder. I have killed. I have killed for the sake of danger and for the sake of killing. Yet I am alive. May I put on the light now? No. Brandon, when he... When Ronald came in, you were standing at the door. Yes, yes. Did you see anyone standing there, up the street? No. There was someone. There was a man. I saw him. I remember. Well? Nothing. Brandon? Yes? When I met Ronald coming out of the Coliseum... When I met him, why shouldn't someone have seen us? Did we think of that, Brandon? I did. Do you think we'll get away with it? You mean later this evening? Do you think some psychic force emanating from that chest there is going to advise Sir Johnston Kentley that within is the lifeless entire... Stop it! ...of his only son and heir? Listen. Now, what is it, Grenillo? What is... I thought it was Sabo. Sabo will not be here until five minutes to nine. Mathematics is important, Grana. At two o'clock, Ronald Kentley leaves his father's house. After tea, in this room, precisely at 6.45, 
He is done to death by strangulation and rope. And then... Let it alone! Tonight at nine, his father and several well-chosen friends of our own will be here for a light entertainment. And then after... This party isn't a slip, is it, Brent? My dear Grano, have we not agreed that the entire beauty and piquancy of the evening is in the party itself? At eleven, you and I leave by car for Oxford. And our fellow undergraduate here present is never heard from again. That is the perfection of criminality. I am quite lucid, am I not? Yes. The party itself, so far from being our most vulnerable point, is the very apex and consummation of our feat. Consider its ingredients. First, Sir Johnston Kentley, his father. He lends the macabre quality to the evening. And then I... Brent! Answer it. Hello? What? This is Mayfair 6143. What? Brandon, put out that light! Put out that light! put down the telephone. You're telling London you're afraid. Put it down. That's better. Now, the party. Perfect. Perfect. The father, Kenneth Ragland. I don't like that, Brendan. Ronald's best friend. But that's precisely the pleasure of it. The same youth. The same lack of intelligence. The one dead in the chest, the other alive, unknowing. And Lila. Lila. So much in love with him. Brendan, don't touch it. And now we come to Rupert. A very intriguing proposition. A man who might see this thing from our angle. The artistic one. You know, I even toyed with the idea of inviting him to share our dangers. Rupert is a poet. Brilliant. Capable of comprehending the beauty and the enchantment of this. What time is it? But Rupert remains in as blissful ignorance as the others. The crowning touch, the one man who could appreciate it, is kept in ignorance. We choose not to share with him. May I put on the light now? Go on. I'm all right. I'm better now. I thought you were going to lose your nerve for a moment, Grano. So did I. But I haven't. Easy. Well, let me alone. Just remember that. You idiot! I told you to clean up in here. What's the matter? Ronald's ticket to the Coliseum. It's caught under this chest here. Help me get it out. It's Terry! Now, yeah, wait, wait. I'll lift the chest. All right. How in heaven's name? Grinello, do you realize we could hang on that? Brendan, listen. That's Sabo. Now quiet yourself and sit down. The ticket! In your pocket. There. In here, Sabo. The evening paper, sir. Thank you. Yes, sir. Grano, you don't want to drink before dinner, do you? But I... Was that... Do you? All right. Excuse me, sir. The table in the dining room, it's covered with books. Yes, you may lay the table here. Here? On the chest. Oh, but I could bring the table from upstairs, sir. Oh, no, set it here. On the chest. Very good, sir. Ah, here we are. Early, whoever it is. In here, sir? Yes, in here. Very good, sir. Hello. This way, sir. Hello, Raglan. Hello there. Oh, I I say, I'm terribly sorry. I've come dressed. My fault entirely. Do sit down. I should have explained. We're going up to Oxford tonight. Oh, no. Are you? Drink with gin and Italian. We leave tonight about 12. The place is simply covered with books. Uh, I see. Here you are. Thanks. You see, I've, I've come into a library. Of course, books aren't entirely your line, are they, Kenneth? Uh, no, not really. Only P.G. Woodhouse. An uncle of mine died just lately, and I have his library. It was bestowed on me. It broke up Sir Johnston Kentley. He had his eye on the collection for himself. He'll be here directly. You mean old Kendley lives in Grosvenor Square? Ronnie's father? Yes, Ronnie's father. 
Of course, you know Ronnie. Oh, rather. You mean you're having Sir Johnson here just to have him grind his teeth with envy over your books? On the contrary. I'm going to let him have exactly what he wants, provided I don't want it. That explains the mess that we're in. Mess? Well, you'll observe we're having our meal off a chest. Oh, yes, yes. I thought it looked odd. Your man laying a cloth on it. Here we are. Mm, I wonder if that's Rupert. Did you ever meet Rupert, Kenneth? Rupert Cadell? Uh, no, I can't say I have. Not your set, I imagine. This way, madam. Thank you. Ah, the ravishing Lila. <laughs> you know Grano, don't you? Hello. Hello, Kenneth. Missed you at tennis this morning. Uh, bad night, you know. Kenneth's having gin and Italian. I'd adore one. You'll have to excuse our mess. I've just been telling Kenneth. I've come into a library. Come into a library? My dear, how weird. And I hope you don't think you'll get much to eat, because we're off to Oxford tonight, and so we're being very humble. Well, I had a simply gluttonous tea. Just gorged, my dear. Here you are. Oh, thank you. You know, I feel most ghastly dressed. Boiled shirt and all. Why? I'm sure you couldn't tell. I guessed myself. It's not proper cocktail time. Too early for dinner. The whole thing is weird and mysterious. What do you mean, weird and mysterious? Well, what? Don't you think it is? I mean, well, I just feel it is. Here we are. I'll bet that's old Kentley. I didn't know you were having Ronnie's father. Oh, yes. He's to look at the books. Ah, how do you do, Grinello? Brandon? How do you do, sir? How do you do? Uh, ah, Lila, uh, where's my son? I'm sure I haven't the faintest, Sir Johnston. Is he coming here? I don't think so. I couldn't get in touch with him. Gin and Italian, Sir Johnston. What? Oh, oh, certainly not. Won't you sit down, Sir Johnston, this armchair? We're going to feed from the chest, as it were. You'll be quite close to it here. The chest? It's, uh, it's not a cassoni, is it? Uh, perhaps if I look more closely... No, sir, it's not genuine. It's a reproduction, but it's rather a nice piece. Do you like it? Eh? Oh, yeah, I suppose so. And uh, Now, uh, those books I'm to see, where are they? They're in the other room, the dining room. There's more space in there. I, I shall be interested to see them. Wickham had a remarkable lot of Shakespeareana. Well, I'm afraid the folios were sold off before he died. Oh, pity. There's a deal of Baconian stuff. I'm told it's very fine. Hello, Brandon. Am I late? Rupert, the last as usual. Do come in. I'll keep my sticks, Abel. Oh, of course. I'm sorry, sir. Mr. Cadell, Sir Johnston Kentley. How do you do? Kenneth Ragland. How do you do? Miss Arden. How do you do? Tell me, have I come dressed or undressed? <laughs> oh, I see there's several shades of opinion. I wasn't able to inquire. Well, what's this? A chest. We're having supper off a chest, Rupert. Oh, are we? Yes. Why? Because it's a very nice chest. And because the table in the dining room is covered with books. Rupert, aren't you going to have a cocktail? No, thank you. I've I've had four already. Sabo, I'll ring when we're through and you make clear. Very good, sir. When do we begin the meal, Brandon? Personally, I'm I'm famished. And we've been waiting for you, Rupert. Now, there are lots of plates and knives and sandwiches, caviar and whatnot. Now gather round and help yourselves. Oh, I suppose good. I could manage a little. Thank you. 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 Thank and what do you know about me? I've read your poems, some of them. No, I, I knew a Cadell once. Uh, Louisa Cadell. Horrible old hag she was, too. Dear heaven, the young man is alluding to my aunt. Oh, I say, I'm terribly sorry. Uh, have I dropped a brick? No, you have said a mouthful. Frankly, I could cheerfully murder her. Murder? Mm. With glee. A horrible old woman. The world would be well rid of her. You wouldn't, Mr. Cadell. Mm, why not? You'd be hauled into Old Bailey and brought to justice. I've heard of people being brought to Old Bailey, but seldom to justice, sir. I hope you're not confusing the two. But I say you're not one of those people who doesn't approve of capital punishment. Possibly. I approve of murder too much to approve of capital punishment. You approve of murder, Rupert? Of course. There are so many people I would so willingly murder, mostly members of my own family... Furthermore, I have already committed murder myself. How do you get that? You, my friends, have paradoxically a horror of murder on a small scale and a veneration for it on a large. One gentleman murders another in a back alleyway in London for, oh, let us say, the gold fillings in his teeth, and all society shrieks for revenge upon the miscreant. 
But when the entire manhood of one nation rises up to go slaughter another, lacking even the excuse of the gold fillings, that society condones and applauds and calls it war. Really, Mr. Goodell? I... I carry my cane as a souvenir of my career of murder. Why, you'd be the first to be horrified by real murder if it appeared under your nose. I wonder. You must have some moral standards. Really? I can't recall any. <laughs> you wouldn't hurt a fly. Wouldn't I? I've hurt thousands of my time. Tell me, Miss... Miss Arden, have you moral standards? Lila? Oh, she believes in the Ten Commandments. Oh, surely not. Why? What's wrong with the Ten Commandments? Nothing whatever. I have no doubt they were of profound significance to the nomadic needs of the tribe to which they were delivered. Their inadequacy for a day must be sufficient to condemn them. I don't believe it's possible to observe a one of them. The only one I'm sincerely capable of adhering to is that little stricture concerning my neighbor's ox and my neighbor's ass. And I don't believe I've got a neighbor so equipped. <laughs> oh, <dear. laughs> Although it might be different if I lived in a rural area. <laughs> oh, oh, no, I'm afraid I approve of murder most heartily. And, oh, 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 oh. Spilled the wine. Look, must we eat on this chest? I'm afraid so, Rupert. Let me pour you another glass. Well, thank you. Lady Kentley any better, Sir Johnston? Yes, I'm afraid she's still in bed. And how's Ronald getting on? Merely idling, just like you and Grinello here. Does he like it, or does he want to get back to Oxford? Oh, Grinello, he doesn't want to get back. He has a great time. Do... Do I remember seeing Ronald's portrait in the papers recently? Something something about uh, winning the high jump or some other form of violent exercise. That's right. Oh, yes, 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 I do remember. I remember quite well. There was a picture of me right next to it. Was there? I didn't know you were athletic, Mr. Cadell. Oh, no, no. There had been someone pleasant with, with my publisher, and he was suing me for breach of contract. Ronald looked quite the healthier of the two photographs. So I remember he was some six feet off the ground, hovering over the bar. <laughs> yes, he's a sprightly lad, is Ronald. Lively, full of life. <coughs> All right, Grana. <laughs> Yes, yes. Went down the wrong way. Ronald's rather like Kenneth here, don't you think so? Good heavens, no. But he is. Oh, uh, in what way? Well, he's a sort of general youthfulness. Ronald's rather like Kenneth here, don't you think so? Good heavens, no. But he is. Oh, uh, in what way? Well, he's a sort of general youthfulness, too. I'm, I'm afraid they won't feel like that for long. Though. No, they won't. Poor chap. Now, look here, Ben. Oh, don't quarrel with him, Ragland. The rest of us envy your clear-eyed youth and certain physical well-being. I, uh, I had not realized the pleasure of mere walking until I found it necessary to hobble. But I, I say, uh, you, you really don't... Uh, 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 I mean, you, you'd hardly notice the... Uh... I mean, oh, sir... Don't concern yourself, Ragland. In artistic circles, a limp is considered an asset. It um, sets one off. But really, I didn't mean to... You see what I mean. The same youthful clumsiness. Puppies gambling amidst the porcelain. You share that quality with Ronald, Kenneth. Youth. Youth? <laughs> I'd say they were infantile. Ronald's only passion in holiday time is the movies. When I saw him at lunch, he was off to the Coliseum. Oh? But that's not the movies. That's a music hall, isn't it? I've heard. I've never been there in my life. I thought everyone had been to the Coliseum. Well, I haven't. Neither have I. Is that the place in the Haymarket? Do you mean to tell me, Granillo, that you have never been to the Coliseum? No, I haven't. Oh. Oh, dear, dear. <laughs> Why should he have? Oh, I really don't know. It just strikes me as, um, odd. Oh. Oh. You know, I'm coming to the conclusion that there's some ulterior motive about this chest picnic. What do you mean, ulterior motive? You mean it's done purely to make you spill things over your trousers? Hmm. Something like that. Oh, I suspect much worse than that. I think they've committed a murder, and that chest is simply chock full of rotting bones. It's just the sort of thing for rotting bones, isn't it? Uh, it is, isn't it? My dear, you're right. 
I wouldn't let you see the inside of that chest for worlds. And don't you try to bluff me out and pretend you're willing to let me see what... But, my dear, that's just what I said I wouldn't do. Yes, but uh, surely a murderer, having chopped up and concealed his victim in a chest, uh, wouldn't invite all his friends to come round and eat off it. Not unless he were a very stupid and conceited murderer. Very stupid and very conceited. Which, of course, he might be. In fact, it's exactly what all criminals are. Oh, no. I don't think so. Well, now how about the books? We can all go in and browse about for a bit. Excellent. Uh, uh, Brandon, you say there's a good deal of Baconian material. Come on, Kenneth. Let's pretend we both can read. Well, books aren't exactly in my line, but I say the last P.G. Woodhouse was actually written. <laughs> well, Rupert, not interested in books? Only my own. You... You look fagged out, Grano. Do I? I don't feel it. No? Look, what have you been doing with yourself? Doing with myself? Nothing. Nothing. Oh, touchy, Grano. I was sleeping most of the afternoon. Always puts me out for the rest of the day. Writing anything lately? Yes. A little thing about doves and a little thing about rain. Both good. Very good, in fact. Then, of course, I'm getting ahead with the big work. Is that going well? Oh, yes, very. Indeed, it promises to be not only the very best thing I have ever written, but the best thing I have ever read. Uh, may, may I have that ashtray, if you don't mind? I'll just reach across you. Oh! oh! Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry to have bumped into you. Yeah, yeah. So, you and Brandon leave tonight for Oxford. That's right. Arriving about three in the morning. Peculiar form of enjoyment. Why? Lovely moonlight night. Moonlight, it's raining. It's not. Open the window and see. It is coming down. It's quite a dismal night, in fact. On such a night as this, there should be portents. Blood in the streets, you know. What do you mean, blood? Classical illusion. Oh. Uh, would you want another, Rupert? No, you go ahead. A night like this demands a stiff bracer, eh, Grano? Yeah. <sighs> yes. Grano. Hello? Grano, you're wanted. In here. I'm coming. Uh, c come along, Rupert. I'm all right in here. But won't you join us? Grano. No. All right. Excuse me, Rupert. Not at all. Hmm. Beg pardon, sir. Uh, oh, yes, Sabo. I must clear, sir. I'll go right ahead. Thank you, sir. Oh, it's going to be a dirty night, eh, Sabo? Yes, sir. I suppose Mr. Brandon's still going. I suppose so, sir. Uh, can I pour you some more coffee, Mr. Cadell? No, no, sir, no, thank you. Have you been getting into trouble lately, Sabo? Yes. Trouble, sir? Yeah. Trouble. What kind of trouble, sir? Why? Have you a selection? Indeed, sir. Life is full of trouble. I mean with your employers. Me, sir? <laughs> no, sir. Why should you think so, sir? Well, I telephoned this house at a quarter to eight, and I heard most hysterical noises. Noises, sir? I was wondering whether you were the cause of it. No, sir. I was not here till five to nine. Oh. You were perhaps at the Colosseum. Uh, pardon, sir, the Colosseum, uh, the music hall? Yes. Yeah. No, sir, I haven't been there for many years. No. Not lately? No, sir. Uh, tell me, Sabo. Mr. Brandon, has he... Mr. Brandon, sir? Yes. Mr. Brandon. What's all this about Mr. Brandon. I was asking the good Sabo whether Mr. Brandon would still travel to Oxford in all this rain. Wasn't I, Sabo? Uh, uh, yes, sir. I hope he told you we were. Sabo, is a sherry in here? In the cabinet, sir. I'll get it. What's a little rain anyway? You'll take this inside, Sabo. That'll be all for the evening. Oh, very good, sir. Good evening, Mr. Cadell. Good evening, Sabo. 
Do sit down, Rupert. Your stalking about like that always makes me nervous. All right, I'll just uh, perch here on the chest. Do. It makes an admirable dais, does it not? Brandon, I just thought of something rather queer. Queer? What's that? All this talk of rotting bones in chests. What about them? Do you remember when you were an infant, Brandon? No. We used to sit about your father's fire and you would tell precocious stories to uh, astound your elders. Yes, I remember. Do you remember your chest complex, Brandon? My chest complex? Yes. Whatever the story was, piratical, detective, murder, adventure, or ghost, it always contained a marvelous denouement with a bloody chest containing corpses. Uh, oh, well, just such a one as this one. You had a perfect mania for it. Don't you remember? Yes. I'd forgotten that. What about it, though? Oh, nothing, nothing, nothing. Just queer, that's all. You were a morbid child. I suppose so. Have one, Rupert? No. No, thank you. Why did you say queer? No, just queer. Us all talking tonight about rotting bones in chests. It just came back to me, that's all. Oh, I see. Well, happy days, Rupert. How... How's the old man getting on with his books? Going to take the entire library away with him, as far as I can see. I didn't know you were a book collector. What exactly is your line? Well, I've... I've theories about some of the Victorians. Everything comes round, you know, in time. For example... Well, Carlyle, for example. Theories of men who are willing to well, rise above others, you know. History is the story of remarkable men. My dear Brandon, Carlyle is an unspeakable person. He's got guts, anyway. And a kind of angry righteousness which you don't get nowadays. Thank heaven. <laughs> well, I must get back to my guess. Aren't you coming, Rupert? No. Oh, right. right. I'll get the light. Ah. Oh, I've left the cigarettes. Uh, go along in, Rupert, and I'll be in in a moment. All right. First door on the passage, right? Right. Uh, Reno! Uh, Reno, what the devil are you doing in here? Tell, tell all the life, Ben. What's the matter? Tell me what's the matter. I, I thought it was him. I thought it was him. Here. Drink this. Why? Why were you sitting here? Why were you trying to frighten me? I wasn't trying to frighten you. I wasn't even sure it was you. Why did you want to sneak in like that? You got what you deserved. Hang you, you've upset me. I wanted to see if everything was all right. Oh, I'm sorry. I'll be all right. Give me some more of it. Get hold of yourself. Don't get drunk on that. What's the matter? Pull yourself together. Come on, come on. You can stop it if you want to. Brando, come on. It went down the wrong way. Oh. Let's go back. Ronald's Coliseum ticket. Not so loud. I haven't got it. Don't be a fool, Grano. I gave it to you. You didn't give it to me. Grano. Oh, wait, wait. Uh, my pocket. A whiskered pocket? No. Trousers. No. Uh, it must be. Which pocket was it, Brent? Look again. No. Look in your wallet. You didn't give it to me. I never had it. I gave it into your hand. You didn't. I never had it. I gave it into your hand. Well, see if you got it. I haven't. Look, look in every pocket. Remember, we lifted the chest. It was right here, and I gave it to you. Bruno, where is it? Where is it? Here us. I put it in your waistcoat pocket. Where is it now? Where is it now? Here, Brandon. <laughs> what have you lost? My temper, Rupert. That's all. I should think so. I heard you pounding on the chest out in the passage. I'm sorry, Grano. That's all right. That's all right. We often have outbursts, eh, Grano? About trifles. Yes. 
On this occasion, it was a question of a volume of Baconian research which poor old Grano couldn't produce. Odd thing to quarrel about. Yes, but we do quarrel about odd things nowadays, don't we, Grano? We do. Uh, will you join me in another, Rupert? No, thank you. As a matter of fact, I came in here on an errand. An errand? Yes, I wanted some rope. Rope? Yes, luckily I found a piece in the hall in a vase. Just the right length, isn't it? Hello. Here we are. I thought it was coming. In a moment, Act Two of Rope, starring Victor Jory and Herd Hatfield. This is NBC, the National Broadcasting Company. You're listening to Victor Jory and Herd Hatfield. And here is your host, drama critic John Chapman. It's time to return to our sinister room and the even more sinister chest. An unseasonable thunderstorm has increased the already heavy tension that pervades this room as Rupert continues his offhand cross-examination of Brandon. Well, quite a storm, eh, Brandon? What? What did you want that rope for, Rupert? Well, the young people are busy, oh, doing up the old man's books, and they need a bit of rope to tie up the... Well, a bit nervous, Grano. Don't like the thunder. Where's Sebo? You'd, uh, you'd better mop it up with your handkerchief. Whiskey and varnish are not the best of friends. Did you hear that, Ken? I'm coming. I'm just terrified of thunder, aren't you? Well, I, I wouldn't exactly say that. Be careful with the books, Kenneth. Oh, dear, it's simply coming down in sheets, isn't it? Surely you two aren't going up to Oxford tonight. Certainly we are. But you can't. You'll be flooded. Uh, did you locate a piece of rope, Cadell? Yes, sir, I did. Most conveniently tucked away in a vase in the passage. A place, huh? Uh, uh, very odd. <laughs> Not really. Sherlock Holmes kept his tobacco in a Persian slipper. Oh, so he did. All right, Kenneth. You hold the books while I manage the room. Uh, if you'll excuse me, Brandon, I'll go back to the rest of the books. Of course. Don't clean me out, sir. What? Oh, oh no, 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 of course not. Grano. What? Do tear yourself away from the sideboard and see to Sir Johnston inside. In a moment. Will you go in? Now. Just stop for a spot, that's all. He's feeling no pain, eh? Came on quickly. Grano never could hold it. Oh. Oh. Listen to that one. Are you afraid of storms, Lila? It's hereditary. My mother hides in cupboards. Oh, really? If it comes on again, you shall probably all see me take a violent plunge into this chest. Can you get in or is it locked? Brandon, I said, is the chest locked? Sorry, I was looking for a match. Uh, you can get into it if you want to. Isn't there a lock on it, though? Yes, there is. But we've forgotten, Rupert. He's got a murdered man in there. <laughs> That's right. Put your finger on this rope, Kenneth. The purse won't hold still. Right. Now, he's been committing murder. <laughs> there. Now the rope's right. Isn't that right, Brandon? Ah, Lila, you don't know how near the mark you are. Oh, but I know exactly what's inside that chest. What? A body. A dead body. What sort? An old, old man. You did him in for the gold fillings in his teeth. <laughs> <laughs> I see you've been following me. Hmm, let's see. Oh, it is locked, isn't it? A padlock at that. What have you got in it, Brandon? You've told us. Now I'm just dying. Where's the key? Uh, in my waistcoat pocket. Well, I shan't rest till I look inside. <laughs> Hand it over. I'm hanged if I do. But why not? If you're really innocent, my dear. But I'm not. My hands are red with a crime committed less than three hours ago. If I had a strong man here, he'd force the key from you. But, um, I'll be your strong man, Lila. Now then, Brandon, hand it over, or it'll be the worse for you. <laughs> uh, 
Come and come and get it, Kenneth. Um, but I'll uh, and I'll give him ten seconds, eh, Nyla? Afraid, Kenneth? Oh, of course not. Um, one, two, three, four. Brandon. Five, six. Do surrender. Seven, eight. No. Nine. Ten. Oh. <laughs> oh, give it here, Brandon. No. What no. men will do for me? Come away from me, Kenneth. There. Oh, my, my, my arm. Oh. 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 I, 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 I say, Brandon, you could have broken my arm, you know. Gave it an absolutely foul tug. Kenneth, I'm so sorry. Really. Uh, sorry, Lila. I tried. I think he's a beast. Only a desperate criminal. How fearfully interested in crime we all seem tonight. Why, we can't even let Brandon commit this in peace. Rupert, did you mean it before when you said you approved of murder? Yes, I suppose so. Oh, but you couldn't. Your conscience wouldn't let you. Ah, but have I a conscience? He's quite right. And for one who hasn't a conscience... I can understand murder being an entirely engrossing adventure. You mean a motiveless murder? Yes. Doing someone in for fun. What a peculiar notion of fun. The only trouble with that sort of thing is you're bound to be found out. Why should you be found out? Because, my dear Brandon, it would not be motiveless at all. It would have a quite clear motive, vanity. Such a criminal would be quite unable to keep from talking about it. He can't. He won't hide. He wants to boast. To give himself away, they always do. But suppose your murderer, I mean a really clever, brilliant and competent murderer, knew that and went out of his way not to be caught. I'm talking of a genius at it. You are. But then he couldn't help talking about the fact that he was so brilliantly clever. He'd give himself away just the same. But suppose that he was so very... Beg your pardon, Brandon. Of course, Sir Johnston. I must be off, and I should like to use your phone, if I may. Of course. On the table, sir. Thank you. Grosvenor 8432. Yes. It's about time I'm off, Brandon. Uh, can I drop you somewhere? Uh, hello? Oh, no, thank you. Oh, oh is that you, my dear? I'll get a cab. Well, it's no trouble. No, he's not here. But uh, I, I, I thought he, he, he was home. Yes, yes, I, I, I'll be along soon. Bye. Uh, Lila. Yes, Sir Johnston? Uh, Ronald uh, hasn't come back. You said he'd been to the Coliseum tonight, sir? Mm, uh, that's right. The bill was over two hours ago. Mm, he was expected back for tea. Uh, uh, my wife is worried. Well, he probably had trouble getting a cab in the rain. He'll be there when you get home. Yes, yes, I, I expect so. I have your hats and coats in the hall. I... I've never known Ronald to fail an appointment. Very odd. Well, thank you for a charming evening. I shall always remember it when I read the books you so kindly gave me. No pleasure, sir. I'll help you on with your things. Good night, Mr. Cadell. Oh, but I'm leaving now as well. Night, Brandon. Good night. Good night, good night, good night, my good boy. Night. Good night. They're gone. Gone. Grano, I think I'll sit down. Well, well, I've got to have another, Brandon. I thought he'd got onto it. Who? Rupert. So did I. For a few moments. But that's what gave spice to the evening. <laughs> he hadn't. You sure he hadn't? Quite sure. I sometimes rather wish he had. If he had been in on this, you wouldn't have gotten drunk, Grana. I'm not drunk. A little blurred, that's all. That's all. What's it? What? 
Thought I heard something. Oh, be yourself, Gran. I thought it was the bell. Well, what of it? I'll go. Pour me a drink, will you, Grana? Oh. Oh, Rupert. I left my cigarette case, Brandon. I don't suppose you've seen it? No. No, I haven't. May I come in and look about? Of course. Grano, Rupert's forgotten his cigarette case. As a matter of fact, I... <laughs> I thought you might give me another drink. Mind if I sit down? No. Soda, Rupert? Uh, a splash. Cigarette, Brandon. Oh, 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 fancy. I had the case in my pocket all the time. Oh, here's your drink. Ah. Well, would you mind turning off the big light, eh? What's wrong with the light? You see, I'm a creature of half-lights. They make me more comfortable. I hope you're, you're not going to make yourself too comfortable, Rupert. You know we've got to be off before long. Oh, yes. What's the time? Um, 25 to 11. Oh. Well, I expect you're wanting to get rid of me. Not at all, Rupert. I hope not. I'm full of melancholy. And I don't want to go home. You must bear with me. It's been a strange evening. Strange evening? Why? Why strange? I can't tell you that's my trouble. I suppose it's the thunder and one thing and another... Thunder always upsets me. Besides, I'm always melancholy at this hour. Five and twenty to eleven. It's a curious hour. Did you ever read Goldsmith's Night Piece? No. I can't actually recall it. No. You should. It's about the city at night. I shall do his night piece up to date one of these days and... I shall make it five and twenty to eleven. That's a wonderful hour. I'm particularly susceptible to it. Why so wonderful? Oh, because it is. I think the hour when London asks why, when it wants to know what it's all about, when the tedium... And activity and the folly of pleasure are equally transparent. It is the hour of winking advertisement signs and taxis and buses, traffic blocks. It is the hour when jaded London theater audiences are settling down in the darkness to the last acts of plays, of which they know they knew more only too well. They know that when the curtain's down, it'll be just a question of... God save the queen, and they'll be bundled out into the chilly and possibly rainy night where they'll have to fight for taxis or rush for trains or somehow transport themselves home to a cold supper. And the prospect of another day tomorrow, exactly similar to that which has passed. For others, further horrors are waiting the nightclubs and cabarets have not yet begun, but they will do so very soon. I could enlarge upon the idea indefinitely. Five and twenty to eleven. A horrible hour. A macabre hour. For it is not only the hour of pleasure ended. It is the hour when pleasure has been found wanting. There. That's what this hour means to me. And it has, moreover, been thundery. Five and twenty to eleven. Yes, Rupert. But by the time you have finished making your speech, it will be eleven o'clock. In brief, my dear Rupert, you see no earthly object in living. I fear not. Do you? I? Yes. Of course I do. But then I'm interested in things. Why don't you take up exploring or cricket 
or making love, or golf, or finance, or lecturing. Or as you suggested this evening, murder. Or as you say, murder. And now, Rupert, if you've finished your drink, we've really got a bit of packing oh, to do. You can't be so cruel. It's raining out. Can't I have another drink? Certainly, Rupert, but Grano and I really must pack. Oh, well, can't I stay and watch you? You know, I believe you're a bit blotto tonight, too. I wouldn't be a bit surprised. I'll tell you what, I'll stay and see you off. Pour me another drink, Brendan. You've had enough. Mind your own business. Well, Rupert, it doesn't look as if we'll get off with Grano in this state at all. I'm perfectly sober. Grano. Why does he want to stay and see us off? That's what I want to know. My dear Grano, Rupert has no earthly reason for staying. Come along, Rupert. Finish up now and let me take care of him. Oh, I've got to go then. What do you mean, Rupert? You've got to go. <laughs> I don't want you to go. You don't? No. All right, then. I'll stay. Don't bother. I'll mix myself another drink. You're in a queer mood tonight, Rupert. One has inspirations, you know. Well, cheers. I shan't be long now. No hurry. Mind if I clear... You know, I don't feel like driving tonight after all. No, there's something in the air tonight. Did you notice Sir Johnson's exit? No. What about it? Rather subdued, I thought. And pathetic. Oh, uh, Grano, I believe this is yours. What? This, this little blue ticket to the Coliseum, I fancy. He's got it. Brendan, he's got it. Hold your tongue, Grano. I believe it came from your waistcoat pocket, Grano. No. It was sticking out, you know, and I... Uh, no. I acquired it uh, from you shortly after... Some... He's got it. He's got it. Quiet, Grano. No. Quiet. Hold your tongue. <laughs> Rupert, Grano is obviously upset. Would you oblige me by leaving us? Why don't you tell me your trouble, Brandon? I might be able to help. Are you going or are you not? No, Brandon. I'm not. You see, I'm rather awkwardly situated... You are something more than that, my friend. Oh? How is that? You are very dangerously situated. Uh, perhaps not. I have a revolver, Brandon. It's loaded. Oh? With the safety off, you observe. I see and it. Besides, I have a far greater weapon here. What's that? A whistle. A policeman gave it to me. I think we need a bit of air. And when did he give it to you? Right after I left here, before I came back for my, uh, cigarette case. He's waiting at the corner within, within earshot. What do you want from me, Rupert? The truth about this blue ticket and about that chest. The truth? What do you mean, Rupert? You're hopeless, hopelessly drunk. You, you'd better go home. I mean, it's more than suspicion. Brandon, I phoned this house at a quarter of nine and heard Grano crying there, crying for the dark. <laughs> Good heavens, what do you suspect? Murder. The murder of Ronald Kentley. <laughs> Rupert, hear that, Grano. He suspects us of murder. It's too rich. Are you trying to bluff me? Bluff you, you drunken sot. Get on out of here. Blow your little whistle. Bring in your policeman. Get out. Do what you like. What I like... I should like to see inside of that chest. See the inside of that chest. You can see the inside of 50 chests. Now get on out. You're drunk. Possibly. Nevertheless, may I look inside that chest? Yes. Very well. I will. Go on. What are you waiting Keep for? back. Sit down. Sit down in that chair. Sit down. Now the chest. It's uh, locked, padlocked. What of it? Where's the key? I don't know. Why should I know? Upstairs, I think. Upstairs? Shall I go get it? Stay seated, Brandon. Pray. I can shoot the lock off. Must I? Must I? Here's your key. Here. Thank you. Now look and get what's coming to you. Thank you. Get back in that chair. 
You'll be sorry, Rupert. You'll be sorry. Sit down. Listen. Listen to me. I want to explain. Explain. I'm at your mercy now. I can explain. Judge me, but listen. Well, Rupert, you're an enlightened man, aren't you? Yes. It's in your power to have me hang. Yes. Remember our talk tonight about the old Bailey and justice? Well. You said it yourself. You wouldn't be giving us up to justice. And something else. You're not a man of morals, are you? No, I'm not. Now listen, Rupert, listen. We have done this thing. Grano and I, for adventure and danger. You read Nietzsche, don't you, Rupert? Yes. He tells us to live dangerously. You know he has no more respect for individual life than you. He tells us to live dangerously, and we have. We've done this thing. Others only talk. Do you understand? Listen, Rupert, you're the one man to understand. You can't give us up. Two lives can't recall one. Our lives are in your hands. You can't kill us. You can't kill. You're not a murderer, Rupert. What are you? You're not a slave to your time. In the days of the Borgias, you'd have thought nothing of this. You're an emancipated man. You can't give us up. Rupert, you can't. You've brought up my own words to my face. And a man should stand by his words. I'll never trust in logic again, ever. You imply I hold life cheap. You're right. Your own included. What do you mean? I mean... I mean you've taken by strangulation a very harmless and helpless fellow creature of 20 years. I mean that in that chest now lie the staring and futile remains of something that four hours ago lived and laughed and ran and found it good. Laughed as you could never laugh. And ran as you could never run. I mean that for your cruel and scheming pleasure, you have committed a sin and bla blasphemy against that very life which you now find so precious. And you have done more than this. You have not only killed him, you have rotted the lives of all those to whom he was dear. You've dragged here his father, an equally harmless old man, and a girl who loved him, and a friend, and played on him tonight an infamous lewd jest, and a bad jest of that. And if you think, as your type of philosopher generally does, that all life is nothing but a bad jest, then you will now have the pleasure of seeing it played upon yourselves. What are you saying? What are you doing? It's not what I'm doing, Brandon. It's what society is going to do. And what will happen to you at the hands of society, I cannot say. But I can give you a pretty shrewd guess. Rupert! Rupert, no! You are going to hang, you swine. Hang, both of you! Hang! You have just heard the best plays production of Rope by Patrick Hamilton, starring Herd Hatfield and Victor Jory. And here again is your host, drama critic John Chapman. I suppose there are two morals to this excellent melodrama. It's been very well played by Mr. Hatfield and Mr. Jory and their company. I'd say that one of the morals is that Murder is nasty business. And the other one is that very often it makes for good theater, as it has this evening, I think. And now, let's think about next week. We like to mix our plays up on this program. So the next one will be a comedy. Samson Raffleson's Skylark, which was a great success for the late Gertrude Lawrence and Donald Cook. Mr. Cook will be playing his original role for us. And Miss Lawrence's part will be played by June Havoc. This is Chapman saying goodbye until next Friday.
And again, may we call your attention to next week's program on Best Plays, the comedy, the gay comedy of Samson Rachelson Skylark. The parts will be played by Donald Cook, who appeared in the original role, and Miss Lawrence's part will be played by June Happen. You're most cordially invited to attend next week at the same time for Best Plays. Rope by Patrick Hamilton was adapted for radio by Ernest Canoy. In the cast were heard Hatfield as Brandon, Victor Jory as Rupert, Lloyd Bachner as Grenolo, William Podmore as Sabot, Ivor Francis as Raglan, Deirdre Owens as Lila, and Guy Spall as Sir Johnston. Best Plays is an NBC production supervised by William Welch and directed by Fred Way. This is Robert Denton speaking. Well, that's just about... This is the story. (laughs) Stories of people, of nations, of the world, of yesterday and today, and the meaning they hold for tomorrow. Let me introduce myself. Walt Whitman's the name, a reporter by trade, a loafer by inclination, and a poet by accident. In my day, during the middle 1800s, America was growing so fast it bust out of its britches every six months. And the only reason men wore their hair so long was because nobody had time for a shave and a haircut. It was like being on an express train where people would say, this is a nice town we're coming to, wasn't it? But, There's only one trouble with people in a hurry. They usually forget something. And this time, people forgot America. Hear it, Walt? Hear it? I told you it would work. Now we can get our news direct to the editorial office. What good is a telegraph key, Jeff, if you can't decipher the babbling instrument? Oh, that's easy. G... G, behold, the instrument is spoken. G, O, L, D. Gold, that's a fine start, Jeff. V, E, R, E, D. Discovered, gold discovered. Who says the days of miracles are past? Wait, gold discovered in C, A, L, I... In California. Mexicans out, Americans in, and pronto, old discovered. Hey, Jeff, where do you think you're going? Up to tell the boys. The boys will have to wait. If they want news, they'll have to read it in our paper. Um, Hello, uh, Walt. Interrupting? Not at all, Colston. Just toss those books on the floor and sit down. No matter, I'll stand. Walt, I want to talk to you. Well, say something. Thought you said you wanted to do that, Colton. Walt, when I bought part ownership of this paper, I thought you were the best editor in Brooklyn. And I still do, believe it or not. Are you telling me or challenging me, Colton? All I'm trying to tell you, Walt, is... What's the idea behind an editorial like this one here in today's paper? On the gold rush? Yes. The rush for California gold is as ignoble a scramble for pennies as it is indicative of a weakness and a greed in our national character. You wrote that, didn't you? Uh, Did I? Who else around this office has a vocabulary of more than six words? Webster. I'm not asking for sarcasm. I'm asking for an explanation. Here's another item. Yesterday, our country was excited over a tremendous moral issue, slavery. And with so much attention and thought, it seemed the issue might at last be solved. Today, all this is forgotten. Honest citizens have dropped their honest jobs and rushed pell-mell to seek for pots of gold at the end of rainbows. <laughs> Didn't know you could read so well, Colston. You know this paper's policy, Walt. Sure. And I know my own policy, too. What's that, may I ask? Don't write what you don't believe. You can at least be more polite. I can't be polite to slavery. Walt, I'm completely dissatisfied. Well, so am I. It so happens this country's sitting on a powder keg labeled slave question. That's more important than you or me or your piddling newspaper. Whitman, I've tried to be open-minded Just about... Just a minute. Jeff, bring over that envelope I left on Mr. Colson's desk. Sure, Walt. I'm not interested in envelopes, Whitman. Hey, honest, Colson. I pay you to edit the paper and you spend your time writing me I'll letters. I'll save you the trouble of reading it, Colson. It can all be boiled down to half a dozen immortal American words. You can't fire me. I quit. <laughs> Try. 
Why? That was a fine supper, Ma. <laughs> Well, the man with your appetite say that to anything, Walt. Uh, you made your mind up about helping me build that house, Walt? He's had enough time lying on the beach and just gazing at the ocean. Hi, shop, George. <laughs> well, what do you say, Walt? Sure, I'll help you, Pa, but only part-time. Huh? Part-time? Why, got another job? Yep. Well, you're the silent one. Why don't you tell us? What's the job? Writing some poems. For who? You. Me. Everybody. America. <laughs> George! <laughs> I wish you'd think a bit before you open that big mouth. Poetry for you, me, and America. Pass me those toothpicks, Ma. How come, Walt? Well, Pa, there's two reasons. First of all, America doesn't have much poetry of her own. Just fancy imported European stuff full of fuss and highfalutin talk. And uh, what's the second reason? Well, that's harder to explain, Pa. You see, America's sort of like a big kid, all brawn and brag. Well, that's important because we're growing. But I think somebody has to holler out every so often. Just remember, America, you can't eat gold and timber and railroads. You can't preserve a free government with just brag. Take it easy. Remember, you've gotten yourself hitched up to a star called Liberty. But if you don't watch out, you're going to trip over the Milky Way. Maybe you have the guts. But don't forget, it takes a heart and spirit to make a complete man. You, you want to say all that, Walt? <laughs> Pretty much all of it, Ma. You don't need a poem, Walt. You need a rooftop. My mother was only half right. I needed more than a poem or a rooftop. I needed readers. I set up the print and published the first book of my poems, Leaves of Grass, myself. And people bought copies the way they might buy 50-cent pieces on sale for a dollar. Poetry is like a musical concert. You need a good audience to complete the job. But one day, while I was at home... Pardon me, that's... Why, you're Walt Whitman, aren't you? Yes, I am. I recognize the beard. Let me introduce myself. Oh, wait, wait. Your face. Why, you're... That's right. Emerson, Ralph Waldo Emerson. First time I've ever heard my name used as a battle cry. Why, your name's been like a flag to me. I marched behind it. I see your hat's on. Were you going marching? <laughs> no, just an ordinary walk this time. May I join you? Sure. I have a lecture in New York tonight, but I thought I'd stop and see you first. Huh? I got that copy of Leaves of Grass you sent Sent me. you the first copy off the press. Uh, what did you think of it? Hello there, Walt. Oh, hello, Jack. How's Helen? Oh, Doc says another week in bed, and she'll be fit as a fiddle and skipping rope. Again. Good. I'll be up to see her later. Bye. Bye now. You know, Whitman, you look like your poetry reads. How's that? You're big, powerful. You're a walking in barn door. <laughs> With the accompanying odor? Oh. Hello, Walt! Hello, Horace! Why don't you come over Manhattan more often? Walt, we got whiskey there that burns all the way down. I'll take you up on that, Horace! Horse! horse. <laughs> That's little Horace. We call his older brother Big Horace. You know, a man's nickname is more important than his given name. It labels his character, describes him to the world. You know these people, these everyday people, very well, don't you? Well, they're the only kind I do know. That's why you write about them so well. I will sing the song of companionship. And who but I should be the poet of comrade? Hey, Mr. Emerson, if you're going to quote my poetry, you'll need a drink. What do you say to a beer in here? Uh, I'll say yes. Just one, though. Hey, I forgot to ask. Uh, how'd you like my book? Mr. Whitman, your book is the most extraordinary piece of wit and wisdom America has yet contributed. It not only encourages, it fortifies. You... you mean that? Sincerely. One beer? Why, that calls for a whole round of beer! If Ralph Waldo Emerson, one of America's most eminent literary men, liked my book, I knew that a door I thought closed was really open. And I could walk forth into the sun. And so between jobs of writing newspaper articles, I kept writing poems about people, about Manhattan, and most of all, about America. 
But then, in 1860... Fort Sumter fired on by southern troops. Hey, Pa, we're going to go to war! You've enlisted, George? A man with a Quaker upbringing? Sure, I've enlisted. You're 42, you wouldn't understand. I always thought you hated slavery. I do. But do you think we'll solve everything by killing our own people in the South? What other way is there? Fellow citizens, I stand before you tonight, not as President of the United States, but as a man humbled before the great sorrow of carrying through unnecessary, though terrible task. The battle has begun, and our nation is embarked upon days which yet may be. Telegraph message for Mrs. Louisa Whitman. I'll take it, son. Any answer? His son, George Hendricks. Is there any answer? What? You want to send an answer? I'll write it down. Yeah, sure. Arriving Washington Hospital Friday. Courage. All our love. Walt. I thought that as soon as I reached the capital, I would go directly to the hospital. But when I got there, I found that every other building was a hospital. I learned that my brother's regiment was only about 12 miles away at the Virginia front. And I got a pass to visit him there because the line was temporarily quiet. And then a new nightmare began. Pardon me, soldier. Huh? Which way to the 51st New York Volunteers? Down around the next band. Thanks. Thanks very much. What's the matter, soldier? Hit? Yes. Yeah. My leg. Uh, here, I'll help you through it. No, no. Plenty worse than me. He's over there. Shot for the stomach. I'll see. Here he is. Soldier. Soldier. Oh. Can't help him anymore. Poor fellow. Dead? Afraid so. He was my brother. My youngest brother. There had been a skirmish that afternoon. And all that terrible night, I kept stumbling across more wounded men. It wasn't until dawn... Walt! Hey, Walt! George! I thought I recognized the beard. Where the devil did you come from? Your face, the, the bandit. Ah, that's nothing. Hey, Osmond. And I, and I kept seeing you dying. Ah, they haven't got my number yet. Gosh, it's good to see you. Come on over my tent. You're still writing poetry? No. More important things to do now. Good morning, my nurse. Oh, good morning, Mr. Whitman. Got to play your melodeon for us again this morning? Yep, the boys have asked me to. Uh, who's going to this morning? That's new boy. Bed nine. Both legs amputated. Gangrene set in. Bed nine, I'll see him. Hello, Jim. Orange is getting scarce. I brought you only one today. Here. Catch. Got it. Dave. Hello, Walt. Hello, yourself. Hey, can't see you later about that letter. I'll be there with bells on. Hey, good morning, Walt. Good morning, Jonathan. Here's your hometown newspaper, I promise. Oh, gee, thanks, Walt. And how are you today, you bandy-legged horse thief? Don't you growl at me, you con-con grizzly bar. <laughs> <laughs> hey, how you, Walt? Hey, hey look. My, yeah. my wife finally had the baby. Uh, honest, fellas, look at you. A baby? Here in the paper I just got. You want to see it? Who says I'm a grizzly bear? I'm a blamed 200-pound store. <laughs> Bad nine. What's your name, son? Roger Sloan, sir. Mind if I sit down here? Oh, I'd be pleased to have you, sir. <sighs> and drop that, sir. Everybody and his brother calls me Walt. All right. <laughs> Call me Slim. 
It's because I was always so darn thin. Thanks for stopping here. Why? Didn't you expect me to? I'm a Confederate soldier. Your own side comes first. Both sides are my side, Slim. Uh, drink of water? No, thanks. I'm chilly now. It's crazy. First I get hot, and then I'm chilly. That's the fever, I guess. That melodeon plays pretty nice, doesn't it? Yeah. Uh, how old are you, Slim? Twenty-one. And when's your 17th birthday? August 3rd. <laughs> Don't go on. I fall into that trap every time. You know why I'm asking all these questions? Sure. I heard the other men say you wrote letters to the folks so they wouldn't be listed as just missing. Oh? What shall I write to your folks? Oh, that I'm being treated well and think of them all, especially Sarah Ann. Better not mention my legs. Oh, I won't. <laughs> oh, don't. I'm not. Man isn't any less a man because he can't walk, you know? Can, can I have a glass of cold water now? I feel feverish all of a sudden. Sure. Here. I'll hold it for you. Wait. Wait. Bring in that folding white screen down the aisle. They put that around a man's bed. That means the end, doesn't it? Not always. Not always, Slim. They're bringing the screen this way, Walt. Walt, they're bringing it this way. Pardon us, please. We, uh, we just want to stand this around the bed. Steady, Slim. When you write them, tell them. Here. Let me wipe your head. Melodian. My sister used to play one back home. Oh, you, you'll see them again, Slim. You can't lose a battle until you surrender. Under my pillow, you'll find a little Bible with gill edges. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. To carry my boy through till he comes home again, Mother. She has nice handwriting. She wrote that just before I left. What? Well, I don't want to die. You won't. You won't. You'll be all right. Remember this part. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside still waters. He restoreth my soul. He guided me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. I opened my notebook again, and on the last page I wrote, My songs cease. I abandoned them. From behind the screen where I hid, I advance personally to you. Camarado, this is no book. Who touches this touches a man. After Slim came thousands more like him. Every year, the boys in new uniforms were getting younger. Bull Run. Chancellorsville. Gettysburg. That this nation, under God, shall have a new birth of freedom. And that government of the people, by the people, for the people. Why, hello, Walt. Hello, Mrs. O'Connor. Well, well, we haven't seen you in such a long time, Walt. Uh, I've been pretty sick. 
infected hand. Oh, yes, I heard about that. As I was saying to uh, Mrs. Mrs. Akarna, will you forgive me if I rush off? But what's the hurry, Walt? I've got to keep my daily appointment with the president. Uh, hey, here comes Dave now. Look, he fire. Yeah, there he is. Good morning, Mr. President. Good morning, sir. John, who is that big fellow with a beard who says hello every morning? A fellow named Walt Whitman, sir. Who radiates vitality the way a stove radiates warmth. He's helped lots of wounded men think about living again instead of dying. Mm, I can see how, too. Well, you know, John, his hello every morning sort of makes me feel I'm shaking hands with the American people. Each day, I walk past the White House when Abe... I called him Abe in my mind like everyone else. When Abe went for his daily ride, I watched the carved lines of his face grow deeper month by month as though the war were an acid that ate away even his iron courage. And then suddenly, Grant and Lee were meeting at Appomattox. Before we knew it, the war was over. The great brass tongues of church bells sang out the joy that swept the nation. The bayonets could gather dust the cannonballs turned to rust. The war was over. Oh, Captain. My Captain. Our fearful trip is done. The ship has weathered every rack. The prize we sought is won. The port is near. The bells I hear. The people all exulting. While follow eyes the steady keel. The vessel grim and daring. But oh heart, heart, heart. Oh the bleeding drops of red. Where on the deck my captain lies, fallen, cold, and dead. Oh, Papa Fab! Walt, Scott, and Himmel, it's Walt. Sure, it's Walt. <laughs> Stop polishing those glasses no, and no. shake hands. Wait, wait, Scott, it's good to see you again. Here, sit down, sit down, sit down here. Oh, you're looking fine, Walt. <laughs> I see your business looks fine, too, Papa Pop. Full house tonight. Business? Sir, say, let's talk about you, Walt. Uh, any of the old gang around? I'd like to see him. Sure, we're over there. Henry, Henry, Ada, Charlie, look who's here. Stand up, Walt, stand up, stand up. <laughs> see, Walt Whitman is back in Manhattan. <laughs> Hello, folks! <laughs> me with one at a time. This calls for beer, Papa Flav. Beer? Yeah. Beer, you insult me. Champagne at this. This calls for bubbles, not for foam. I get it myself. <laughs> Same old Papa Flav, all right. So the prodigal son is back in his native town. Back to Manhattan, sadder and wiser, as the old folks say. How long, Walt? Don't know myself, Charlie. All right, gang, let's ask him all together. Ready? Still, still writing, writing poetry? <laughs> yeah, still writing. But a different kind this time. Yeah, the war changed your tune, eh? More than that, Harry. I learned what it felt like to lose all your faith, all your hope, and worst of all, all your courage. Yeah, four years of war did that to all of us, Walt, all over the country. I know. We were swaggering toward the 20th century with plenty of elbow room and jeans full of silver dollars. We had no tolerance and no compassion. I guess the war taught us both. We can still taste the blood and tears. And that's what you're going to write? No, that's past. Coming over on the ferry boat from Brooklyn, I saw the towers of Manhattan outlined against the sky. Fingers pointing toward God. We're older now and wiser, I hope. And we've got to learn a new faith in ourselves. A new belief that what we're doing is important. Not only to us right here and now, 
but to the whole world for generations to come. Well, here we are. Give it first to set out the glasses. Well, we made it, by gosh. Real champagne. Let's go. Wait, 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 wait now. Now we drink to Walt. Walt? Oh, Salim. Oh, Salim. May you live high with love and happiness. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute, folks. Thanks, but I'd like to change that. Let's drink to America and her future. One song, America, before I go, I'd sing or all the rest with trumpet sound for thee, the future. Oh, I see flashing that this America is only you and me. Its Congress is you and me. The officers, capitals, armies, ships are you and me. Past, present, and future are you and me. What whispers are these, O oh, lands, running ahead of you, passing under the seas? Are all the nations communing? Is there going to be but one heart to the globe? Turn your undying face to where the future, greater than all the past, is swiftly, surely preparing for you. Thunder on. Stride on. Democracy. You have been listening to This is the Story, one of a series of radio dramas selected and rebroadcast for the men and women of the American Armed Forces in every overseas theater of operation. Stories of the free people, of the free nations of the world.
This is the Armed Forces Radio Service. 